And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? Yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 444 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Folks, we are down to the conference finals after two wild rounds. The Sun Belt, very well represented in the final four. Meanwhile, Canada's Cup Trout celebrates its 30th anniversary right now. Also have an epic interview on tap for you guys today. But first, say hi to the fellas, Mr. Murley over in Sweden. What's going on, our friend? Uh, not much. Not only Sunbelt teams, but some of these tax-free teams that is like sir, are, are alive. Good point. Good point. So I put my tinfoil hat on already, Merles, or what? Yeah. yeah, yeah you want I me to so. wait? Can I, can, I, can I wear my big deal one for a few minutes here? <laughs> You've never taken yeah. it off, but never <laughs> taken it off. <laughs> Oh yeah! Wait till we get going in this podcast. I'm you've gonna have two of them on. I'm gonna have more times than you've worn a dome in your career. So let's <laughs> not get out of. <laughs> oh man, that's Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette back of the homestead. I see. How we doing, buddy? Oh, buddy, got to come home for a couple days. Got to see my dog. It's been great. Couple hikes, getting some sun in. Uh, games have been great. Uh, disappointed about my Leafs, but really happy to dive into this one. There's a lot to dissect. Uh, no Canadian teams left, as you just mentioned, RA kind of sucks, but uh, hey, new blood, new blood yeah. in this NHL, and there's some fun teams that are still alive and some unpredictable matchups. Biz, you are noticeably like your glow different yeah. being home. I can just oh. tell just looking at you through the screen right now, like just must. I mean, living in a hotel for that long, oh. working so late, like, and you ain't digging ditches, buddy, but it's a grind. And just to mm. see you at home, I can tell you're just. It must feel great to get back there. You said it, buddy. It ain't digging ditches. It was just more of the sleeping patterns. You're yeah. going to bed. It's hard to come down off of those shows. Like, you know, you you, you probably get home probably around 132. And by the time you're sleeping, it's around 334. So, yeah, I was fucking with the mentals a little bit. You can only uh, sauna and steam so much. But getting a couple hikes in and seeing the dog, buddy, my love tank is filled up. Filled up, all right. Johnny says you can only drink so much. You can only screw so much. That was the voice of the wit dog. I wasn't Mr. doing Mom. any of that either. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Whitney, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> Not much. Um, God, did I did I just want a game seven Edmonton Vegas solely oh. for the reason that we could bury biz this whole podcast and his shitbag Leafs. But I got nothing to say. I got one more game than him in the second round. Or am I really going to be the guy that hangs on to one more game in the second round? Maybe, but I really can't. So we're both dead. It's both of our funerals. Our teams are crap. Our teams are done. They had a chance to go on a run. All these teams were out. And yet we're sitting here like a pack of losers once more. Hey, it was meant to be the last win for each team came on the exact same day. Exactly. That was wow. it. Exactly yeah. busy. I know. Single, single tier. We're a bunch of losers, and we're going to break down how we got in this situation, R.A. How, how did you feel about that hockey that went down? How shocked are you what, uh, with the Oilers being out? You know, I, I'm, I can't say I'm that shocked. Just the uh, Aiden Hill stepped up. He was unreal. I know we're going to get to a little later. And again, the Edmonton goaltender, I just, Connor McDavid deserves more than that. It's just, it's frustrating. We want to see the best guy in the finals, and we can't get there yet. And it, we keep pointing to goaltender, and the defense was better this year with Ekholm, but frustrating from a hockey fan perspective but like you said there's new blood and that's not a bad thing new fan base can experience this which is always a good thing so uh let's go to our producer real quick say hi to mikey granelli wherever he's he he's hiding where are you g hello, hello. gentlemen what's going on boys i don't, don't want to leave you hanging buddy don't want to leave you out who yeah, gi I jane I, I was hiding. I do I do have seattle Shut tonight so i didn't want to show my what? face in front of wow. Wit. yeah you I, picked I, I seattle wait. know it for people who don't know I Deep bet Seattle before the series. I bet him after they lost game one. I bet him after they lost game no, you three. Bet Dallas. And I you bet, bet Dallas. After Dallas. And I bet him after they lost game six. And so I have my entire bankroll riding. I'm done gambling. I no. literally am quitting gambling if Dallas loses tonight and you pick Seattle. Wait, I didn't show my face once on game notes while you were on there for a reason. And that was because I was deathly afraid of saying that. Why don't you log I know, off right now? Merles, I not only had Seattle. Off, it's, it's Merles, what's to be every, Everybody rides. What it's a supposed rat. to be. <laughs> what a rat. 
I hope. Uh, oh my God, you motherfucker! How much are we talking here, G? Like we talking a future? We talking just one, for the one series? One one millionth of what I have on them. <laughs> one one millionth of what Wade has. Which on is it, which say. is even worse because like at least if I remember being with guys at the casino, if they're hammering, it's like just root. For, I'm root for them. Yep. They got more money. Yeah, nope. but 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 can wait, you, here's can the you thing. buy his head? But, 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 but why I don't you sprinkle forgot, on the hedge? I completely forgot how big of a future you had on because before the show, and Merle's can Merle's can attest. I was like, dude, I don't know what it is. Everything in me says Dallas, but I just got this weird inkling every, about, about Seattle. Every person I've talked to with like a, a strong hockey opinion has said leads towards Dallas. And Merles, I don't know if you guys talked about it on game notes. Isn't DeBoer 6-0 in game sevens? Yeah, that's that little nugget we used. And also Ottinger is 22-4 after a loss this year. Strong Diego hockey Bulls. opinions is not what I have, Biz. So that makes sense why Let I have Let me tell you Seattle. something. Let what, me tell you something. Else? My, my, my last slap in the face of Grinelli because I'm so mad at him. They're on game notes. I came on 12 to 12.30. Then I had to get in the car. I'm in the car. So I put, you know, the, put the end of the show on. They're like... We haven't had a Game 7 OT this year. Man, can't believe there's no Game 7 OTs. Huh? What? <laughs> Your freaking team Panthers lost in the Game the Bruins, 7 OT you, at home. Yeah. Was, All the Bruins, Bruins fans, fans aren't going. Bruins fans anymore. I was they called, really it's called erasing it from your memory, no. boys. I erased it from my memory. Okay, no, no. Hey, we actually got to put Grinnell on pause and go back to R.A. R.A. went to the barber shop and ran into Charlie McAvoy, and he had... All of his decked out Florida Panthers gear on. The fact he's yes. wearing Panthers gear That everywhere. is fucking what is this insane. Show? Did he sucker you in the face? You think I'm wearing he, Calgary Flame stuffs around? He did not give a fuck. Like, the fans care about it way more than the players. Like, I, I walked Bro. in the shop to see my buddy. I wasn't even getting trimmed down to say hi to my boy, Pat the Baba. And I didn't even see Charlie there. And then he was getting in the chair. I was like, hey, what's up? And uh, my my friend Pat points out that I have the Panther shirt on. Charlie, he didn't give a shit. I, you know, we've had a, like a little dap up, talked to him for a bit. Oh, hey, it's a, oh, no, it's a t-shirt. We had we a said, oh, by the way, he was like the meme. He was like the meme of the smile, but you see the real face behind and the guy's like full of rage. <laughs> yeah, Matt I was mean, like, fuck this bald asshole. I, I think he knew what they with the gambling deal, like players know the deal. They don't. They don't get fucking prissy about that shit. Fans get mad about it more than I players. Need I need to talk to McAvoy in person. Yeah, he's to, also to not going to tell you to fuck off in your face at the barber shop, though. Too. Yeah, you know he's what just going to go to his burner I account. I mean, and just I, honestly, Charlie's. A, I don't think Charlie would tell too many people to fuck off anyway because he's pretty much a gentleman. But having said that, I really don't. What if What if the shit. Bruins took away your media pass because of this? I'd be shocked because if they don't do it after he was yelling cocksucker at the arena oh. during game seven, they'll never do it. <laughs> hey, right, you know, you, we have our hey, moments. Hey, you in the, in the laneway, did we talk about this on the podcast? Oh no, you did on game notes and RA was not there to defend himself. Yeah, but about, then we brought it up on the next show, I think. Oh, did we? Okay, yeah. fine. Wait, which, we already talked about is? this. I didn't hear that. No, just how you were you were, you were, were almost kicked out of Game 7. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got, it's funny. Like, you don't think, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to go nuts. And then Game 7 OT, couple pups. You get a little fucking crazy once again. Uh, do you think and, RA and has the who, worst? Do you think RA has the worst social conduct of any of us five right here? That's a tough one. We've all had our moments. Yeah, I'm good with swearing though. I wouldn't swear in public. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, like, Merle's my, my actually. Merle's has given it to me before. He's like, hey, hey, wait, yeah. wait, wait. My Merle, autopilot's pretty good with that kind of stuff. Honestly, Merle, same here. It was but, just again game seven OT. The wires crossed a bit. I, I'm, I'm very strict about that. Not swearing in front of women and uh, children and. Oh, it turns out the, the kid Damn, I was wearing next to the file like didn't asshole. give a shit either way, but yeah, whatever, um, it, it happens. We, we, we didn't mention, um, we're filming right now prior to game seven, uh, or recording, excuse me, and we'll be back. So Seattle-Dallas discussion, we'll, we'll be back after game seven um, later on tonight to, to be able to finish that off. My last thing going into the game is I am, I am confident, which scares the hell out of me, uh, because of the board, because of the Ottinger and, and the bounce back stat. It's just that Seattle winning game seven on the road against the cup champs. Like they, they don't care. They're on the road. That's the one thing that does scare me. Like, Oh, well, Dallas is at home. All right. Well, they just beat Colorado in game seven in, in Colorado. So it's not like, like they're looking at that as a total confidence builder in terms of, we already did it in their barn. We could do it here. So we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll talk about that series after the game. All right, a couple more uh, notes here before we do get to the game action. Uh, game notes daily will be live on game days this week. Correct, Merles? You guys, yeah. you and I be crushing it. Absolutely crushing it. It's great. Got to be giving out winners to everybody. You don't want them going in blind to these games. So we got the winners for them. Give them a little nice. nuggets of info that Biz loves too. I, I hey. saw you guys had Zach Boychuk on and he was telling Russian gas stories. 
Yeah, I made sure to get a, at least one Russian story for you. I know you like to hear those from the KHL. Yeah, we had him on. Um, we're going to have to get Eric Cole back on. He's been our Carolina Hurricanes expert as well. We got Migs in Vegas. He moves on, so we'll get more from him. And uh, yeah, we've, we've done well. Uh, I think you just mentioned it. Uh, Wednesday, we have a sandbagger once again with versus Dave Portnoy and Josh Richards. This is supposed to be an epic one. I haven't seen it yet. Wednesday, 6 o'clock on our YouTube channel. Can't wait to check it out. And I mentioned the interview uh, in the intro. Charles Barkley is going to be coming to you a little bit later. We said it last week. It's unreal stuff. And uh, it is a, a bit of an evergreen interview. So, like, you know, if you want to listen to the hockey, you feel free to jump around. But it's outstanding. Do not miss it. It's like uh, just under two hours. One of our best ever. So, you know what I'm here to talk about. You know what I'm here to talk about. New Amsterdam's own Pink Whitney. It's the drink of the summer. It's the drink of the season. It's the drink of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And just thinking now, we're going to the, the Eastern Conference site of the Stanley Cup final. It might be Raleigh. It might be the tailgates. It might be the shots. It might be the golf courses. Or we're going down to Lauderdale. Liquordale, as they call it, where Pink Whitney, mind you, North Carolina and Florida, two enormous selling Pink Whitney states. We'll be in one of them, depending on who wins. We'll be drinking the Pink Whit on the beach, or we'll be drinking Pink Whit at the legendary Hurricanes tailgates. Where, Merles, you already got to pound some for the outdoor game. It was an amazing tailgate down there. There was Pink Whitney flowing everywhere, but it's going to be hot down there. So I'll be drinking my Pink Whitney with a ton of ice and then probably with a little soda water on the top just to make sure I don't get too buckled. But Pink Whitney, warm weather, there's nothing better. And you know what I'm going with? I'm not going to give any free ads to anyone, but I'm going Pink Whitney on the rocks in the finals with an energy drink. I'm not going to say what energy drink, but talk about getting you up for a Stanley Cup final game. Some Pink Whit action. Throw a little energy drink on the top of that thing, and you'll be buzzing around, winning bets, winning the golf matches, surfing, swimming, fishing. It doesn't matter. Pink Whitney's here, and it's here to stay. And thank you so much to you guys for buying it. Moving on to the games. Canada's last hope for its first Stanley Cup in 30 years was extinguished Sunday in Edmonton after Vegas beat the Oilers 5-2 to in Game 6 to move on to the Western Conference Finals for the fourth time in their six years of existence. The Golden Knights will play the winner of Seattle-Dallas, which we're going to get to later. Three of the original Vegas Golden Knights did all the scoring. Riley Smith, Jonathan Mastrichot with the second period natural hat trick. William Carlson, Aiden Hill, like I just mentioned, he's been stellar for Vegas. They got, got him for, I think, a fourth round of last summer. He's been tremendous as a third-string goalie coming in. Um, the Oilers went. I mean, they had 2-1 lead after an action pack first, and they just I just felt they never got to that desperation, desperation level only because Vegas was just all fucking over them. But, so I, I think in the third, they did have that. I, I, the effort in the third was great. I mean, how could it not be? You're down two. You, you have to get something going. Aiden Hill. I mean, the fact that they're on their fourth goalie, and Jonathan Marshall Show said it on the ESPN Fuck ESPN, by the way. We'll get into that later. On the ESPN broadcast interview after, and he said, yeah, like, somehow we're doing this with our fourth goalie. Like, like a lot of teams can't even find one guy. They've, they're on four. And he came in, and Biz had called it when he was traded. Biz has been saying it about him for, I think, a year or two. Six five, six six. They said on the broadcast, he's 250 pounds. That guy came in, and to give up goals on your first two shots against... In the in Edmonton's arena and to bounce back and just make 39 straight saves, I mean, you got to just tip your cap. And, and I sent out a tweet right after the game. I, I tip my cap, no doubt, to Vegas. That That is a better hockey team. They are so built to win the Stanley Cup, dude. When you're that good down the middle, they're throwing out Eichel, they're throwing out Stevenson, they're throwing out Carlson, and then Bluger was the fourth line center. Then you got these defensemen. They're all big. They're all physical. Oh, they yeah. can all move the puck. And then you get this goaltending. It's like I don't, it's going to be really hard, whoever beats them, to get it done because they play such a sound system. They, they, they play hard in their own zone especially. They're good on the forecheck. They're great at getting out of their zone. They're getting goaltending. And Edmonton just could not match them five on five. It, it, like the power play merchants of death. You can call them power play merchants um, with a power play that good. I mean, I, I don't really know what else you're supposed to do. You got to play better five on five, but they're that good on the PP. It is what it is. But you deal with a team that's that big and strong and they didn't have anything. Now, the, the issue for me is the big guns. A lot of the big guns, they didn't show up. And, and we'll, go, we'll go through the Maple Leafs later on. And it's so similar in the sense that you have your top guys. You have 190-point guys in the regular season. 
that aren't doing anything in the second round, you have no chance. You have no chance. doesn't matter how good McDavid is. And unfortunately, Leon, while putting on maybe one of the biggest clinics I've ever seen throughout the first eight games of the playoffs, he kind of disappeared, fellas. I, well, yeah, because he's gassed, man. He's ga- ah, I, I think he, wit, looked, wit, he looked banged up. Wit, show me a team that's ever won the Stanley Cup where their two top forwards are playing 25 minutes a night. Show me a team who's ever won the Stanley Cup with one guy making 10 million bucks. No, and and, 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 and right. I'm, agree- I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying. Right. But, 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 but also in the same breath is like they, those guys never really learn how to play consistently like 12 minutes or, or 11 minutes on the fourth line where you see other teams that are having success right now. It's teams that are four lines deep and where the ice time discrepancy isn't as great as it is in Edmonton where it's like, yeah, you can keep leading with that ace all year, but then all of a sudden when you get into the better teams and, and you're your two, top two guys have been playing 20 minutes, 25 minutes all year. And then especially in the first round, having to even bring it up an extra notch to even get out of the first fucking round, you just eventually hit a wall. And th- that now that's probably been the case for what the last at least three years, if not four, where it's like, they need to, they need to try it different where I don't know what the relationship is between Woodcroft and McDavid and Dreisaitl, but you have to imagine at some point if a coach has championship pedigree and his coach teams who have won it would say, yeah, I know you want to play 25 minutes, but we're not going to win a Stanley Cup if you do that all season and in the playoffs because it's proven to not be the right formula. Like, uh, Okay, but, but, but the, the minutes per game are a little fugazi in a sense that they play two minutes power play and I, I don't think that where like I don't like getting the extra minute every power play, right? A lot of teams you see minute on, second unit comes on, or minute 15, second unit gets 45 seconds. They play the whole two minutes. I don't necessarily think so so that so that say that brings them from 21 to 24 minutes. That isn't exhausting, and I understand when you're that good. I, I actually agree. Play the whole two minutes. But I, I do think the main issue is with the lack of production from the other guys. They kept having to put them together on the same line. They have absolutely no chance when they're on the same line. They get out there. They control the pace of the play. They play in the other team's zone the entire time. A lot of times they draw penalties. But then the rest of the three lines, they have nothing. So the the only way they were ever going to win is if they weren't playing together, in my mind. And with the way Nugent Hopkins was going, yeah, and the I, way I, Kane but also, was going. But it's not, even, it's not even just the forwards, though. It's also their top four defense. Like their number five and six defense didn't play nearly as much as the five and six for 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 Vegas. So the more yeah, they're time they're deep. out there, they're making errors that are based on fatigue that other teams aren't necessarily making because they're just playing the right way and not just going off of a whim in, in, in a sense. Yeah, they, where it's like, do you, do you not agree? Do you not agree? Like what Carlson did this year was amazing. But I think that if anyone watched Eric Carlson play, although he had 100 points, you would see there's flaws to his game where plays are coming back the other way and they're being hung out to dry in certain areas. But the the risk to reward, I guess, in that situation is worth it, where it's just obviously not in in a case of where like Edmonton's trying to win a championship. Yeah, like, Edmonton's team right now... It- like they're, for not inst- built, they're not built to win at Stanley Cup. Like it, there's one defenseman, there's or there's probably maybe two or three defensemen I would be okay with playing 25 minutes a night, night that are still in playoffs. Haskinen, probably Montour, and then I would argue maybe Slavin and Burns. Like to, to get... So it's just like Bouchard's playing 25 minutes. Like, yeah, he, he they were unreal on the power play and they were snapping around, but I just don't... I don't think that... I don't think you're winning a Stanley Cup when Bouchard's playing 25 minutes a night. You need like look at look at White Cloud and look at Hag compared to like uh, who who, who is the, and they, um, and uh, who's he playing with? And may, and maybe they need a little bit more time to develop and be able to be responsible enough to to be played that much, right? I I don't know, but I think that the formula has to change of being so top heavy. Like I know that. 25 minutes is nothing to those guys in the regular season and even in some cases playoffs. But the problem is, is the rest of the team isn't understanding what the, the role is and can't get emotionally invested enough because six, seven minutes is scraps. You're talking to a guy who played three and four, right? It's hard to, it's hard on everybody. You want less of a, less of a gap in my opinion. And I think that unless that changes, Edmonton's still going to be in trouble. 
yeah, they when you get no shows from the other guys, and Leon included the last four games, he was very hard on himself in the post game pre- press conference. Like he's like, I have to be better. Like, yeah, maybe he was worn out, maybe he was battling injury. He just looked completely different games three through six. And but I I go back, I go and we'll get to the goaltending, but I go back like Nugent Hopkins, Hyman, and Kane. I think in this series they had two goals combined. Right, and one of them was Hyman's. It was what do you smell? It was off his thumb or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, off his thumb, right next to the post. Yeah, in the blue paint. Nugent Hopkins had a hundred points. Hyman had ninety. It's like, there's, what are you gonna do? And and I actually loved McLeod, uh, Fogel, and Derek Ryan. They were like a yeah. solid third line. They played good. But you're right, not nothing from the fourth line. Where you look at Vegas's fourth line with Carrier, oh, right? Like that, I was that, so happy they put uh, Kolasar back in the lineup, even though that hit from behind was, I mean, 200 feet from your net didn't make any sense. 23 seconds left in the in the period. I said on the broadcast, I'm like, as a as a fourth liner, if I'm out there in that situation. I'm not even worrying about finishing my hit. I'm worrying about skating back because you never know if somebody blows a tire that you could cover in time where the hit at that point is is useless. Like who cares, right? It was yep. it was a bone. But as far as a fourth liner, he always seems to like extend plays. Like gets he always gets the stick on it. He's physical in for the most part at the right times. Uh, he can, you know, he, he just, that fourth line works and they contribute and they create scoring chances. They're not dull by any means. Look at, look at their third, their third line on paper is Riley Smith, who really picked it up after a tough first round. Carlson, who's just a gamer, dude. That's a gamer. guy like he's your third line center. Are you kidding me? You're laughing. And Nicholas Wa is way more skilled than I thought. He's a big body and he's physical. It's like, that is a better forward unit with them as their third line, dude. Like, and then forget I, been, the fourth line. And, and, and now here, here's, so then you look at the goaltending. Can right? I just quickly say that uh, as far as Vegas is concerned, I'm so impressed with so many of their guys. I don't think I really knew too much about their game. Like Bar- Barbashev's playing out of his mind too. But we go back to like Hag, White Cloud, and these other fourth liners you're talking about. Like these, these fuck, these guys deserve, deserve a lot of respect. And Eichel, holy shit! I mean, you can have all the Sabres fan you want dogging him, and and you're you're seeing things went awry there. We've been over it a million times. I, I I'm friends with Jack Eichel. I'm very happy for the guy because yeah. he's not only like gotten into the playoffs finally, he's dominating. He looks so good out there. And you know it means a lot to be the second pick in the McDavid draft and then take him out this year, including him stripping stripping McDavid of the puck, getting the empty netter game in game one. He bitched him down at the end of the game in game six. Like, he he was a force. But the Edmonton goaltending situation is, that's like kind of main reason number one they lost. I, I mean, dude, they, they couldn't get a save. And I actually didn't hate starting Skinner because... For some reason, it seems when Campbell starts, he doesn't play as well. He Skinner had grabbed the number one starter role a while back, and they kept going to him. Now, I think with the way game six had gone, like if they had somehow pulled that game out, they would have had to start Campbell in game seven. But when you can't get a save, dude, like you have no chance whatsoever. There's no chance. And and Skinner, it's like I don't I'm not sitting here blaming a rookie goalie, right? Like he he was he was open with himself. Like I didn't I didn't get the job done. He's a rookie. I mean, he wasn't even supposed to be the starter. They signed Campbell five million dollars, and then he's not the starter. What did you think, Merles, in terms of the starting goaltender game six? Did you think they were gonna go with Campbell? No, I, I think they had to go with Skinner, even though he 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 hasn't been doing good because Campbell was just he was brutal. He didn't do it for the Leafs last year. He really hadn't shown me anything and Ooh, it is tough being being a rookie and, and and being out there but that's what the Oilers have always had but like they they don't play well enough D to support a goalie like that where you see in Vegas their D are supporting a goalie that's not so um experienced I would say Vegas Merle's also pushed back uh, on that as far as the Leafs thing I I mean I thought he was pretty good last year in playoffs and then that game seven it was two to one final I thought that considering they'd signed him for that. And at that point, Skinner was, was leaking oil. And I I think I sent the stats over RA to like one of the worst goals against averages to have a, overplayed a certain amount of games in like NHL playoff history, where at some point, like I think that Campbell deserved to get the start in game six, like 100%. I was okay though. In the group chat, I said, I got, I go, ah, I can't really blame him for trying to go back to Skinner. 
All right, do you have it? I do, yeah. Worst goals against by a goalie within team's first 12 games of a playoff, uh, minimum nine games. And uh, the, the let's see, one, two, three, fourth worst ever. Stewart's going to 3.68 goals against average. I know there's obviously a little bit more that goes into it, but numbers are numbers. Numbers never lie. It is what it is. And yeah, I, I thought it was a coin flip going into it as well. I mean, you you, you gave what? Uh, Campbell what a five-year, five times five deal, and it's a must-win game, elimination game, and he's not starting. I don't know. I, I think that's kind of a, an indictment of the front office that they're not starting this guy. They paid all this money to be their number one for. And I remember, I think uh, Gretzky either told you, Biz, or he said it on one of the broadcasts about Grant Fuhrer. It wasn't like he always saved everything, but he, he made those timely saves. Yeah. And I feel like Skinner mm -hmm. didn't do that. Like, if he could have made that save after the terrible Ekholm penalty, if that just, like, because that was just a killer, it just ruined all the whole game right there. If he couldn't make one, one big save Marshall right shows there. Third goal, right? Yeah. Bail him out and then get back to business. But he never made that save that Gretzky talked about. And, and, and like, if I, if I look at Aiden Hill, I mean, this guy comes in the save. He, the save he made on Ekholm in the third period was out of control. And then what was the other great he made? And then the Kane save Kane's like mini breakaway earlier in the third. It was, it was a clinic. And, and and like you said, the defense is there the entire time around McDavid. It's like two guys going to him. He's got no room. He's got no space. It's just, it's per, it was perfect clinical team defense holding on to a lead. And then back to the Oilers. I mean, like Yamamoto came off 20 goals. He signed a two year, three million a year deal. I mean, he didn't do much in the regular season. Had a lot of effort, I feel like, in the second round, but just not producing. Nugent Hopkins, I already said, like, you're like, oh, these guys are undersized, right? This is playoff hockey. Well, Marsha shows undersized. Look at how he played. So it's some sort of like team defense man mentality that Vegas has bought into and knows how to play that Edmonton just doesn't have yet. And and running into that team, it was like that was not that was not a great matchup for them. Not by any the, means. The oppor the opportunity was squandered when they couldn't win with Petra out of the lineup. Because you yep. knew when he came back in, he was going to be playing with some jam. What did you make of the back and forth? And I, I want to say both, was it both McDavid and Dreisaitl, like motion the baseball swing back at him? Bukestad did it. Oh, Bukestad. Okay, it was Bukestad and Dreisaitl. And it looked like a pretty poopy pants uh, handshake line, too. It was a quick one, and it looked like uh, Dreisaitl uh, worded something back to him. Yeah, he kind of ripped his, his like hand out of his hand real quick and said something to him. and. I understand the anger and frustration and what they're doing to Petrangelo, but at that point, once the game's going, like the fake slash thing, like, you think he cares? Like that's not that's not doing anything. Um, and, and of course, like you said, Petro, they had they had a chance with him out, and they weren't able to get it done. And then he has that sick assist over to Marshall Show on the four on four goal, the hat trick. Like that guy. I mean, he's their top paid. What is he making? Nine, nine and a half. Yeah, so is yeah, Nurse. There. <laughs> I mean. There, there you go. It's like Wait. Darnell Nurse. It's like it, he gets totally punished by fans in terms of his salary. He's a solid NHL defenseman. And the problem is, if he was making six million, you'd love him. He's making nine and a half. And then you you look at like Bouchard needs a deal. Luckily, he doesn't have arbitration rights. So hopefully they can. I mean, they have all the leverage. Hopefully they can kind of get him on a bridge deal where they're not gonna. He's not gonna break the bank. But it's really hard when you got a guy right there. The nine and a half million dollar defenseman who who isn't a number one D man, maybe not even a number two. Petro is making eight eight per year too. <laughs> Oof, that's a bargoon. Oh, what the fuck was St. Louis doing? That's a bar. I know that was a bargoon. Another save. I don't know if you would think of the, a McDavid uh, save that Hill made. He what his left pad. I'm still waiting for a replay on ESPN. Yeah, they didn't by show the, the replay on that. <laughs> Phenomenal fucking save. It was like Luongo like, and yeah, never got a replay on that. Brutal. We'll get to ESPN later. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just um, it was it was a tough ending. I mean, to go to the Western Conference Finals, even though they got their bo their doors blown off, it's like you're losing in the second round the next year. That's a step back. That's not good. I don't. I I I'm not even really ready to get into what they need to do. I I the the goaltending situation. Like maybe Skinner continues to improve, and and Campbell's not going anywhere with the contract. So I don't. Are you I don't okay know how with that Woodcroft staying? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so as far as changes, you're talking like, uh, you know, a couple personnel changes, but for the most part, that core is going to be back. Uh, I don't think we talked much about Evander Kane. I don't think he looked like himself these playoffs. He looked like no. way more of a beast last playoffs. Last playoffs, he had 13 goals in 15 games. This playoff, he had five points in whatever, Oof. 12. Now, it, you, you have to be honest in, in the, the assessment that he, he had two big injuries throughout the year. 
he might have mm-hmm. never felt right, but right. he definitely wasn't the player that they had last year. And, and so it's it's a team that like is it, I mean they're right they're looking at these next few years like they're all in right they have no other option so I don't know what you're going to be able to do they'll probably look to trade Yamamoto um, but I don't really understand that's why I'll never be a GM I'm so bad at stuff like this I don't know what you can do but there has to be adjustments and changes made to just making it a better defensive team like you're just you're unable to win in the playoffs the way they play and and Vegas proved it Another stat I included with you boys, uh, 49 playoff games since the uh, 2016-17 season. McDavid's got 75 points in those 49 games. leon has got 77. Uh, team goals per game for Edmonton, 3.43, but the team goals against per game, 3.39. And that just doesn't cut in the playoffs. Team record, 22 and 27. So just kind of, you know, back to the, the goal. Time. And I think that also ties in with team defense as well. It's not always on the goalie when you give up that many goals, but they do need to make improvements as far as next year. Uh, Ryan Yenmark, Shaw Bukestad, all UFA, uh, Bouchard, Costin, McLeod, RFA. Uh, other than that, they're bringing everybody back. And Campbell's got four more years at five mil. And Skinner's deal goes up to 2.6. He gets a raise next year. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a lot of the same band coming back next year. Uh, Biz, well, uh, do you have any final thoughts on Edmonton here? Or, like, what do you, what do you think? Do you think they need no, to No, I was just like, curious to know as change? a fan what Witt, Witt wanted to do like with, with coaching and if there should be any like drastic changes. Like, I... Much like the Skinner and Net in Game Six, like I, I think that Woodcroft deserves to be back too. Like he's only had a few years with these guys. There's room for growth, and I think we forget how young these guys are. And it's it's a tough fucking league to win in. Like right now, more than other uh, other is that this term? Right now, more than, more than uh, ever. ever. Excuse me. Um, the parity is just so strong. So if you don't have that depth, like it doesn't matter how good your top guys are. Like it could end up costing you, and we're seeing it more than ever. Right? Quickly like, about at- the coaching. I, I know by the end in Boston, guys could not stand Bruce Cassidy. But, I mean, you got to give credit where credit's due, right? This guy can coach. And whether his message goes stale, whether he's hard on guys and they get sick and tired of it, he gets somewhere early on and you see success. And he totally outcoached Woodcroft. Now, granted, his team overall is built, I think, for the playoff style hockey better. But that guy can coach, and you look at what they're doing. It's not really a surprise considering their roster and then what he's doing behind the bench. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, like, if I'm coaching a defense, I, I swear to God, I'm, I'm working on the high flip with guys. You see these teams. Florida's doing it well. Florida look does at, it Look over there. Carolina does it well, and Vegas was unreal. When they don't have anything, these teams have mastered a high flip. Not icing but out into the neutral zone, possibly the defensive zone if it's a perfect one, enough for a change. And you see, you see any time these teams are under pressure, I don't know if it's something they're working on. I don't know if it's something that just comes natural to guys, but if you're under pressure and there's no one open and you don't want to ice it, a high flip, whether it's off the glass or I'm, out, it, is, it has been like the number one breakout yeah, used I'm, by teams winning in the playoffs. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Panger pointed out Florida does it a ton. I think probably more so than any team remaining in playoffs. And I was actually interested to see how Carolina was going to adapt to that. Same with the, the other way around is Carolina is very predictable at where they dump in the puck more than any team in the league. So you know it's going in. So how how would you defend against that flip in the air? I said so it ended up it ended up burning the Leafs on what I want to say was the the second goal where Verhagi got his stick on it and then it went to declare in the mid declare in the middle where he kicked it back out. If anything, you got to retreat and you got to have back pressure from your forwards because you never know. Like it's it's like the a bounces. punt. You never you never know where it's gonna go, right? So if you don't have guys skating back, you're hosed. Yeah, that's what's so great about it. It's not just like a defensive system. It's creating that 50-50 puck in the neutral zone, bouncing around, and anybody can get it and go. Like a team like Edmonton should definitely deal more of that with ninety seven. Anytime he's out there, just flip it out there and let him go. And, and Biz, you remember being a defenseman when you were, it's like, it's kind of the hardest play to deal with. So you have a high oh. flip. Not, not only do you have to figure out where the puck's bouncing, you're looking up, you got to figure out the bounce. And then if it's a good enough high flip, it gives the board enough time to co- put complete pressure on you. Like you mentioned with the Varhegi one, it's like, it's the perfect play in the playoffs. And I don't think it's like as easy as some of these guys are making it look. Because you have the ability to flip it out of the zone for a penalty. You have the ability to ice it, which is not the end of the world, especially if you're tired. But when you're able to do these perfect ones that are landing red oh, line or buddy, offensive Some blue guys line, are so fucking good at it. 
they like get it up on their toe and it's it's you, you're you're looking at the jumbotron you're like where is that thing next thing you know you're fucking eating it but then sometimes these fans are probably wondering like why why that guy just throw that away in the middle of the ice like that some guys try it and then they whiff on it if you don't do up, it it looks oh, ugly they end up as some of the worst pizzas that fans are probably like get this guy out of the city right i now. remember i tried one in montreal or toronto i know or ottawa it was one of those eastern canadian teams and i whiffed on it and then oh. i got buried and then they came flying into on one where i was like oh my god i'm not the high flip guy <laughs> <laughs> so um i was actually i was mucking it up with talk as far as talking strategy about how like carolina for instance uh, they dump it in all the time so teams like they like florida they should cheat back like that weak side defenseman needs to cheat back whether it's going to be a hard rim or near side rim where you know most of the time it's going there so the strong side defenseman just worries about trying to get that slight second delay of hold up and then just either pounding it back up the strong side wall and or going weak side rim with it where you just tell your forwards and then you push the fight as, as close to the blue line as possible and you live to fight another day that's yep. it that's where some teams they they like army's criticism of the leafs is like they refuse to just play the muck game whereas they're trying to make it maybe a little bit too clean every time where it's like sometimes just to back them off for a little bit you just got to push it up the wall try to flush it out and live to fight another day am i am i crazy here merles no and what happens oh, is if you perfect. if you do it enough the teams will start cheating on it and that's when you get the time and space to make the there pass. you go there you go so and all it, of a sudden it, it, you'll get some clean break-ins it, it's a I, it's a great under like i don't know undervalued's the right term but it's it's just Playoff hockey, the pressure, the forecheck, it's just there's so little time and space. Just get it out without an icing, and all of a sudden you're creating offense, and it, it just never looks pretty, but it works. Yeah, I remember, Biz, what you're kind of talking about leaving a guy way back. I think Anaheim did it, and I want to say it was Sammy Paulson would do it on like the penalty kill. They would play like three on the blue line, and he would stand all the way back at his own goal line, just waiting for the dump. And it would take the teams a few times. They wouldn't realize it. They would go dump it in normal, and he's already standing there, and it was... Boom, right out again. Yep. Well, that, I wonder that, that, if that was before they started doing the the first guy goes up and then he does the long drop drop back. Oh yeah, so this is this is old school. Like it's it's crazy how the power play breakout and then how to defend it has has evolved, eh? Like I Didn't feel like Datsuk maybe De in Detroit start that. I, I was gonna say it was probably Detroit who started that long pass back, and people are probably oh. wondering like why teams do it because because you have to try to gap and match the speed of that first guy. Because, I mean, in some cases, like, some teams even cheat that now where that Montour goal in the Boston series, I think it was in game seven, where he just all of a sudden, he was like, well, I'm not firing it back. I'm just going to go give and go with, I, I want to say it was either Luster Reynan or Lundell, and it was just a quick give and go, and next thing you know, it was in the back of the net. So it's, it's wild how it's all evolving and how you have to constantly adapt to the systems and the styles that each team play with and how quickly you can do it come playoff time. Yeah, no, Con Conley claims the Sabres started that. They used to fire it back to Finneganov. Remember how fast he was? Oh, yeah. They would fire that's it back to him, like, just go. Like, you just, and he would, and that's how it really started. And then they, I don't know who came up with the two guys back. Connolly's taking credit for starting that. <laughs> yeah, he's saying that team, not him. He's saying that Sabres team. Remember how good they were those two years after the lockout? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said those, that Sabres team was the one, that first one with the drop back pass for the pp Fenaganov had some of the nicest gear wear you ever seen in your life he looked like bure he was a mini bure out yeah, there he did he, yeah, his yeah, gear yeah, wear was the same brand as his <laughs> uh, biz we gotta give your buddy sean burke some props too he's been done great work as the goalie coach uh we mentioned aiden hill already but since brassois got hurt brassois got hurt in game three he uh aiden hill three and one with a 219 goals against 934 save percentage which is tremendous in the playoffs and since vegas has entered the league They've won nine playoff series. Only Tampa has more playoff series win than Vegas in that time with 13. So, I mean, I they, they have four along. conference finals in six, six years, years in the league. Insane. Insane. Yeah. And then I, I have something else to talk about later, yes. depending on how Seattle does. But we can move on to our business favorite club. <laughs> All right. Before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at Muggsy Jeans. Muggsy makes the most comfortable jeans, chinos, and joggers ever. Muggsy also just dropped Cool Max Denim that are like air conditioners for your legs. They spent years in the lab developing the most breathable jeans ever, designed with lightweight fibers to ensure a cool breeze with every single step. 
These jeans come in enough colors to make a pack of crayons jealous. These are the only jeans you'll ever wear this summer. Go from the backyard barbecue to the bar in one swift motion all summer long. You guys and gals watch the uh, police fire game we hosted a while back. Saw how smooth I looked at my mugsies. Look at this bad boy right here. Canadian tuxedo, boom, done, looking sharp. So head to mugsy.com and get 10% off now for using the code Chicklets. That's 10% off some of the most premium jeans, chinos, swimwear, and shorts on the internet. Mugsy also offers free shipping and returns, so there's absolutely no risk to giving them a whirl. So if you're in Chicago or Austin, Texas, make sure to head downtown and check out their storefront as well. Easy vibes every time. Enjoy your beers as you shop as well. It can't beat that. And if you're in Boston or D.C., keep an eye out for a Muggsy store coming in June 2023. Go to Muggsy.com and use the code Chicklets for 10% off. Well, bef- no, uh, we're not quite done yet. Uh, oh. We got to get into the ESPN aspect. Uh, people. Holy shit. Very pissed <laughs> off at, at the 10 p.m. Eastern start time. Uh, I reached out to someone. Uh, well, I'm not going to drop dimes here. He said he, I was told there was no place to put the game. The NHL demanded ESPN. But Sunday Night Baseball is the deal that ESPN already has with the baseball, with the uh, Major League Baseball. So they, they, it's like, I don't know how that negotiations go, Biz, but like th- that must have come up at some point. Okay, well, if this game goes late, what do we do? But the fact that they started on a fucking split screen and instead of just moving the game, instead of moving the baseball to ESPN2, which which case ESPN's now going to piss off MLB. And if they did it with the NHL, they'd piss them off. They were kind of between a rock and a hard place. But how does this happen? Why wasn't this avoided, I guess? I'm, not that it's your fault, Biz, but... Like, what do you think happened here? As far as, like, uh, like uh, the fuck up. <laughs> oh, I know, you're the TV guy, so I want to... Th- oh, the- yeah, fuck. Yeah. Like, I know all that shit going on behind the scenes, dude. I'm just trying to fucking... I'm just trying to keep it together so I don't get canceled <laughs> on air here. Um, <laughs> oh, I'll take the cancel for this fucking thing. Go ahead, wait. All you. Okay, yeah, I just... I don't know. This it's is just- pathetic. This is okay. pathetic. And and it's, <laughs> it's... I think it's ESPN's fault, say, 80%. AB 70, NHL 30. All right, so ESPN, they have this enormous deal with, with MLB. They actually went to, and I talked to somebody that, that works there. He reached out to me. I can't say his name. So he sent me this tweet. This doesn't really have anything to do with tonight, but some semi-related sports media history. Major League Baseball and ESPN went to court in the 1990s because ESPN tried to bump Sunday Night Baseball to ESPN 2 in favor of the NFL. So Major League Baseball obviously has an enormous, expensive deal with, with ESPN, okay? And, and they're adamant about their Sunday night baseball. I mean, which, which the ratings probably smash NHL, even though it's, it's ridiculous. But that, whatever, that's the world we live in. So ESPN, and, and let's, let's also get ahead of this. Had Toronto won, they would have been playing at 7 o'clock and there would have been no issue because there was just two games. Once you get to one game... ESPN is like, nope, this is Sunday night baseball. The game's staying over there. My issue with the NHL is that why aren't the NHL willing to go to ESPN2? If ESPN said to them, we'll put you on ESPN2, the NHL at, at 8 o'clock, whatever, the NHL should say, okay. Like, And all these people on the West Coast are like all over me. Like, it doesn't revolve around the East Coast. I'm not saying it does, but it's Sunday. It's not even during the week. It's Sunday. NBA just played a game seven at 3.30, okay? There is absolutely no reason to not have all these East Coast fans, forget Newfoundland, who's another hour, not have the chance to watch one of the greatest players the league's ever seen in a must-win game. Like, that is bullshit. And what it shows is that ESPN doesn't give a flying fuck about hockey. That's just a fact. I, I, like, they have baseball. They got the football stuff. They don't care. And they... they the NHL decided to go in with ESPN thinking like, oh, this is great. Like, and, and Merle said it right from the start. I remember saying, this will be great. You know, all of a sudden, every office that has ESPN on, every bar that has ESPN on, this is awesome. Nope. They stick them on fucking streaming ESPN plus all season. So that's one thing where it's like, I don't, I guess the money the NHL got from ESPN, is it worth it? I don't really understand. Maybe it is, but they don't care, dude. They don't, they don't even like... Look at TNT, and I, lo- I love Bucci. I love Ryan Callahan, uh, Kevin Weeks. They, they got great guys working there. It's not on them. It's on the business they're working for, not giving a flying fuck about the NHL and their product. They look at it as like the stepchild. They don't care. NBA, Major League Baseball. So all of a sudden, you have this game on a Sunday, dude, 
that's played at 10 o'clock. I fell asleep after being husband of the year all day at 8 o'clock. I woke <laughs> up on the couch at 8.30. Like, there's 90 minutes till this game starts? It's a disgrace. And and also, I think there was a talk about maybe TNT getting that game and just flip-flopping, and then they wouldn't do that. ESPN wouldn't agree to do that. Like, why not? And then you get one of the TNT games. It's just, it's just such a bad look for the league. And there's a bunch of different blame to go around, but it, 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 it makes hockey look like an absolute pigeon sport. Very well said. Very oh, well wow. said. Uh, uh, Non-pigeon sports. For Ryan Whitney, folks. That was... It's a joke. It's 10 o'clock would, on a yeah, Sunday? I, I, yeah, There's I, no I, other I just, games. I, I liked... I thought 8 o'clock would have been a fair time, you know, help everybody out on the East Coast and West Coast. But yeah, 10 o'clock, best player in the world playing an elimination game. I don't think there's an excuse there, and that's a, that's a, that's a tough one to argue and defend. So... You, you, you said it a lot more eloquently, though. What are the two biggest leagues in the world? Who's football, the best league? NFL football and NBA. Basketball. Football and the Premier League in England. Oh, okay. what, I, when do yeah. they play? They play at 1 o'clock on Sundays. What would have been wrong with 1 o'clock on Sunday in Edmonton, 4 o'clock on the East Coast? Well, then seven, you got the seven I would have said, said, said rest. You don't get the 48-hour rest. You get the NBA game, Game 7. But the thing, uh, when Game 7, Sixers, Celts ended... Now, granted, there's not an enormous crossover, I'm guessing, but still, boom, 7.38, everyone's finished that game. You go right into McDavid, Leon, and no, let's wait till 10. Well, Toronto didn't asleep. have that problem because we lost in five. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, it's Newfoundland, too, Wit. You're going to get some bad tweets out. So what I say? Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Like they say, Shut like, the like fuck I understand up Newfoundland. Understand. <laughs> is that from Terry Ryan that's Sr.? A great that's a great end all this. Uh, that's from this, everybody this in Newfoundland when you pronounce it, mispronounce it. Before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at The Score Bet. Hello, Canada. This episode is brought to you by The Score Bet Sportsbook and Casino. The Score Bet is the best sportsbook for the hockey obsessed. With a wide variety of markets and daily specials from us here at Spittin' Chicklets, got you covered for everything on the ice. So if you're in Ontario only, download the ScoreBet app and create an account today. You can build and follow your bets directly from the Score Sports app for the best possible experience. The playoff push coming up right now. We're in full swing. You don't want to miss anything. And the ScoreBet also has you covered for all your other favorite sports and plays as well. Plus, there's tons of iCasino games any day, anytime. That's the ScoreBet. Download today and see how the best sports app, period, does sports betting. Please play responsibly. 19 plus, Ontario only. Gamble problem? Call Connex Ontario at 1-866-531-2600. Uh, yeah, biz, our condolences. Uh, Friday, Toronto, the Leafs season came to an end. 15-32 in the overtime of Game 5 when Florida's Nick Cousins beat Joseph Hall to give the Panthers a 3-2 win and punch their ticket to the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time in 27 years where they'll beat the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, this being the 2023 playoffs, it was not without controversy. Uh, the winning goal, Radko Gudis. Hats off to Radko. What a oh fucking play, man! Oh my god, this guy to, to get to push the puck up. Then he fucking chased the player. I was like, holy shit! Look at him fucking crashing the net. And he grabbed uh, what's his name? Uh, I think it was Jan Kroc's stick for a half a second, just enough to throw him off. Cousins put it home, and boom, game over. Dunzo, uh, were you crying in your beer or what, Biz? After that. I wasn't even mad at the Gudis play because I just respected it, and I, I kind of had a good chuckle as to like Dabby. him just going so hard down the ice like a fucking bull in a china shop, and then him setting the pick for Cousins to do it, and then him screaming in Wolf's face. Like, did you see the image that ended up coming out? Classless. It was classless. Hey, yeah, yeah, texted him with a picture and goes, "What's wrong with you?" And he wrote, "Too much sugar." <laughs> <laughs> All time like that's photo, just straight. I, and people did say classes. It kind of the, the image looks bad, but dude, that guy is oh, a straight up off. barbarian. It's fucking sports, man. Seriously, come on. Yeah, I mean, come on. they just won. I'm a Leafs fan, and, and I, that yeah, play, I hey, no doubt, that's a penalty, like a, a for sure, hundred yeah, percent penalty. But it's such a bang bang play, dude. Like it's it, that's it was it was a it was a great smart penalty Sad that he didn't move. get called for. I, I thought it was smart, too, that he didn't make eye contact with the ref in the corner, although when getting away with something like that, sometimes you look over to see if you've gotten away with it. His, his uh, you know, his um, focus to not do that and just go right right to the pile, I mean, I commend the guy. Um, to the goal. Now, very frustrated with how some people online were basically calling me a fraud as to what I was arguing about this thing crossing the line. 
everybody thought that I was using the example of when he stood up Bobrovsky. Okay. First of all, did any of you actually see a feed where you heard a whistle go? No, and and when you guys you. you guys released Thank a five you. minute clip, but Biz, I'll I'll get ahead of this. I think the ref got that call right personally, but uh, but I'll say this: you guys released on TNT a five minute explanation, and I and I was like, oh, I want to watch this. You don't hear a whistle. You did. We didn't hear the whistle. Okay, it and just that's what everyone's. That's what's claiming that the the, the 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 referee's box is saying there was a whistle that went which would have signaled Bobrovsky to then get up, and then that's when the puck went in, where I'm like, okay, I didn't hear a whistle, but let's say that the ref signaled, hey, it's dead now, and then he got up and it crossed the line. That's not what I'm talking about. In the play in which he's going to the net and that puck ends up getting lodged in his pad as he slides over, there ends up being a view of it where you can see it. Everybody is now saying the, the parallax angle. Which is legit, the, man. It is. No, that's when the I puck understand. was in the air. That one army sent that the puck oh, that was, was in, in the, the air. air. Yeah, that goal, the Calgary one, that was in the air. That's why it looked like that. This puck was Co on the ice. This puck was on the ice, and you can clearly see that there's some white in between it. And and even if there it was a parallax angle, the amount of uh, – why are you laughing? Am I saying it wrong? No, just that's so crazy. People are talking about this they with a hockey goal. They keep saying that to me. Yeah. So I said online, I said, shove the parallax angle <laughs> up your fucking ass. That puck's on the ice. It's beneath his pad, which is completely lodged inside the net. So I think it was a goal. But to back it all up, that's not my excuse as to why they lost. I love how they tied the game up and they didn't use that as an excuse. And we saw an unbelievable push by them. I thought it was a sick performance by Nylander. We got to go to overtime, and then it just sucks the way it ended on the fact that it probably should have been another penalty call. But guess what? Who gives a fuck? That's not why they lost the series. They have a lot of issues that they need to address as a team. You go back to round one, I don't think that they were the better team against a tired Tampa team who lost Cernak, whose goalie didn't play well. And overall, I thought that they just didn't, we didn't see a big enough push from the overall core group and superstars. Uh, seven games for the Toronto Maple Leafs in which they only scored two goals each game, which, guys, it's the driest spell that the team has gone on in the last 13 years. 50 shots combined between uh, Tavares and Matthews in the series, and they weren't able to find the back of the net. Zero, R.A. Your head, yep. your, your, <laughs> R.A.'s holding up the donut. He's already got the stat <laughs> lined up. Oh, no. And to the point where towards the end of the series, especially in that, uh, in that game five, you saw Matthews kind of teeing up one-timers from farther to the outside where maybe we'd normally see him where he's, he's stepping into ones in the slot where he's flexing that stick and they're fucking zipping. One of the biggest problems I saw all series is they weren't able to get to areas with the puck where they were able to elevate it. Bobrovsky was unbelievable. And he was probably the star of the series for the Florida Panthers. But I don't feel that he was challenged with seeing pucks go by his ear or far enough or high enough up top where most of it was saved from the from the, the middle of the net down. Where he's And you great. saw Nylander's goal to tie it up was up top. Finally. Finally, they they got to a distance whether it's tight enough where they could elevate at top cheese and or they just didn't have enough high danger scoring chances where they were getting clean looks. And I don't know this time of year, it's harder to get to those areas. And who is everybody going to look to, to score those goals? Guys who want to be paid 11 and a half million dollars. I don't have an excuse for those guys. Do I think it's time to give up on them, give up on those guys and implode the whole thing? No. You got. I think you, you you can't come back with those four guys. I you would, can't, dude. I would. You would. Why? Why? The, the, I feel because 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 you have no money to spend anywhere else, dude. By the way, look at their free agents. Look how many guys that need a deal. They're they're. I, I okay. So the same way the Oilers aren't built to win the Stanley Cup. Like I got two guys you can't get rid of in Edmonton. You're telling me that that Toronto team, those four guys, you can't get rid of them? That that's it? That you're going to win with those four making that much money? No, I, 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 
So right, so right now you're probably sitting. You're, you're, I don't think you're getting rid of Tavares, right? So let's count that out of out of it. As far as Marner and Matthews, like one guy is nominated for a Selkie and had 100 points, and then the other guy, Matthews, maybe had the off year this year, but he was an MVP last year. He played banged up, and it's not like he's not also trying to add other things to his bag. He led the he led all forwards in the NHL and block shots. Like it's not for a lack of effort. I think it's for a lack of experience and then also tightening up a little bit when that moment's coming. I don't think there's any denying that 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 some of their star players and I would lean towards maybe more so Marner and Matthews to tighten up a little bit more when the going gets tough. You you got 2 years with them left. I I don't understand you got one with Matthews. Marner's no trade clause kicks in on July 1st this year, too. Matthews Correct. has one oh, year left. Does, Mar- does, does Matthews have two years left? Can you look that up, G, or, or I might be going crazy? And, it, and if it is one year, I agree with you. I thought it was one year left on his deal. I don't understand trying to run it back for its final year. Because, because dude, what, what, what if he's not, it, with him not being re-signed? He has one year remaining on his deal, and he also has a no-move clause kicking in. Nylander has one year. Matthews has one year. Nylander and Matthews have one year and Tavares and Marner have two. And you're right. You're not getting rid of Tavares. Nobody would take Tavares' contract. I actually said on Game Notes today, Biz, and dude, John Tavares is an unreal player. Everyone loves him. Amazing career. He had, what do you have, 45 goals or something last year. This year, over 80 points. They kind of fucked up signing him. If you look now, Merle said it today. Like They didn't need him. And, and then with 11 and a half million, it's like, that's what I look back to in terms of like, that's kind of killing him now. And everyone said when he signed it, he was going to get old quick, which, which makes it sound like he's not still a good player, but he's not eleven and a half million and a half million player. No, I would say that the three big components as to why certain Leafs fans would want Dubas out of his seat is overpayment of Marner and Matthews, uh, getting rid of Kadri and getting the return in which they did, and then the JT signing. But you've also been a very good organization since doing all that. And you've been, you know, what, what do they finish? Second in the East as far as points or, or third maybe behind Carolina? I'm not sure exactly. But yeah, I think it was third. They finished third in the East. To have the dominance in which they've had, I just think that there's been other core groups where teams have not given up on them, where I think that maybe, I don't think get rid of Keith either because I would like to see him get one more and if it, it needs to take two more years to get Dubas and him to come back, I guess, okay, sure. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be like screaming from the mountaintops if they gave those guys two years. Dubas said he ain't going anywhere other than Toronto. Run it back for one more year. Give him, give him Dude, a, if they go back with this roster next for year. One, why not give him one more, one more year? What, who else would you give the keys over to that that would do a better job than than Dubis? Okay, you might be able to. No, maybe, that one I'm fine with. Coach, I'm not. Okay, so but in the same breath, it took Trotz four uh, four full years with Washington, and that was an older group, an older established group. So I'm also okay with allowing a coach to learn from his mistakes. If you're saying, no, he's inexperienced and he's in over his head, I would say, okay. But I don't think, and you might say, well, what's changed since if they would have got swept where you would have set off with their heads? I would have said, well, no, I'm just not going to defend them. <laughs> I would say, okay, if they want a full, a full clean slate and they want to fucking blow it all up, what, who am I to defend? They got outplayed by Tampa and then they got swept by Florida. Like, right? You wouldn't make some calls and start looking at packages you could get from Mitch Marner, dude. Can you imagine what you could get back from Mitch Marner? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would probably, I would probably, I would probably listen. I would definitely probably listen. But you're also getting a fucking hundred point guy who 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 is up for a selkie. Who's? I would say the only issue that anybody has with Marner is he tightens up come playoff time. And then the other counter argument with, with people saying, well. They allowed Washington to go so late. Well, they were fucking winning president's trophies. And also, I don't feel like those guys were also choking up come playoffs. They were going to the brink with with a Pittsburgh team who was also a fucking d- dynasty. So there's the, the counter argument where I would say, I'm okay with them running it back for one more year. If 
Chiefs get fired, I would say, okay, well, bringing in an older, experienced coach, now I understand it, but who's the coach you're bringing in? If they end up getting rid of everybody and they want to do do it that way, I would say, okay. But if I were in control, I would say, everybody take a one-year deal. Dubas might say, fuck you, I'm not taking a one-year deal. I'd say, well, then fuck you back. <laughs> That's all you've earned, <laughs> right? Because he was in control of the ship, and and you have to you have to hold them accountable to his moves, which I'd say the costly ones were bringing in Tavares, getting rid of Kadri, because there's your cheap replacement as the a Kadri second line center. The Kadri one was a killer. That was a killer, because there's your cheap replacement as a second line center, and then you saw what he did with Colorado. Ouchie. And, and so money was, that- and, and I said on game notes, and it's bad. It's it's a lot of bad luck, right? But they 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 traded Jersey. And they traded Grundstrom and they traded a first round pick to bring in, um, why am I drawing a blank? D-man Muzzin. who's hurt. Muzzin. Muzzin. The D-man and, and, and the, the old, like those four forwards, yeah, they're great. The D stinks. So yeah. what, like you can't, th- th- that's my point. Like you so, bring those guys back and you have Morgan Riley, but like the D, you need D-man. I'm glad you brought up this point. So I, I, I talk and shop with people. I agree. One of my biggest complaints about the playoffs was the disconnect between D and forwards from an offensive perspective in which they played most of the year. And then one of the things that Dubas mentioned was his concerns were was changing up and adding six new pieces to the lineup that closely to playoff time when you've done it the way that you've done it. There was times when the, the Leafs D overall in playoffs were, when, were, were where plays went in the offensive zone to die. There was never a Sandy. I thought when Lilgren hopped in, there were certain times where I'm saying, that's why you need him in the lineup. Because he's in the offensive zone and it goes to him and then he makes another clean play to one of the other skilled guys and then the functioning machine just keeps keep the going and they're able to sustain offensive zone pressure. When Brody gets it and he's not moving his feet and all of a sudden now it's like the play is a 50-50 race to the corner to maintain possession. It's like, motherfucker. That was part of the disconnect. And then also when the Leafs would go on a rush in certain cases, let's say it was a turnover, there was no second wave. By the time they got up ice, there was such a disconnect where there was so much of a gap in ice where they would, whether it was Florida or Tampa, they would come back and then, Tam- uh, and then Toronto would have no gap as far as their defensemen and they would give easy zone entry. So I agree with you. The, the, the D just simply weren't good enough where I'm saying is if you're going to get it one day with the certain personnel you have up front, I think they probably should have maybe rolled the, the, the dice with Sandine and Lilgren or at least kept Lilgren in the entire time. Okay. But you need the other thing about guy, do, You also need better guys, though. You need better The other D. thing about Keefe, and I want to go to Merle's on his Toronto takes. Elander was the best player, correct? I would say that in that... Florida series, yes. Even when he was snake bitten early on. Why is he taking off the first power play then, dude? What are you doing as a head coach? You have the most dynamic player in your lineup currently who's been on the first power play the entire regular season, and he's not on the first power play unit. It's like those are the decisions that happen throughout this series. It's like what is going on behind the bench? Uh, and, and, Kyle, du- Kyle Dubas actually said that the, the adjustments that he thought that Keith made throughout playoffs, he liked. And maybe that's part of the press conference that I disagree with the most as far as what I was seeing based on him defending his head coach. But, Miros, I'll throw it over to you because I know. What, what do you got with Toronto, Murr? Yeah, I, I, you guys covered it all. The Nylander not going in back into the bumper at any point was was amazing to me. I don't understand that at all. And that's the problem. They don't have good defense because those other guys all wanted to make $11 million. That's they, those why you have guys no money. that team over, yeah. dude. Just like, imagine Vegas' decor on Toronto. Yeah, then they could win a Stanley Cup with those forwards. But those forwards take all the money. They're selfish to take all the money. And there's nothing left over. I read all their, I watched all their press conferences today. They love playing there. They want to be there. Okay. Prove it to me. All resign and all yeah. sign for seven or $8 million. Don't try to sign for $15 million. So then you, you run into the same problem for the next 10 years. That's so, all. And, and, yeah, it, that's, and, it, and Biz, sorry, it wasn't even UFA money besides Tavares. That's the biggest kick in I, the dick. And that's why I'm saying is I can't defend these guys from a lack of production and not getting it done standpoint, because if you want to be paid 
to the regard of the McKinnons and the McDavid's is you have to show up and play like them. Like we can all agree that McDavid is not the reason that Edmonton lo- performance was not the reason that Edmonton lost. Do maybe him playing too much we ended up hurting them as far as them being able to compete with them, but not a, from a non-producing standpoint. And it, Biz, yeah, and, and, and the 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 what's it called overdrive like um, uh, McCullen. Uh, Hazy and O-Dog talked about this, and the issue that they have with this team is the same monotone answers that all of them give them, where there's no, it feels like the team has no soul. It's like they say all the right things, but there's not as enough emotion as, associated to it, where I, could, I could, couldn't agree more, where it might, it might be frustrating to hear the same robotic answers where like, I don't know if they're being told to talk to a certain regard, but most of the time, like if you really do want to rent, win and you appreciate and care about where you are, you don't hold your team hostage to pay you eleven and a half million dollars when you're a restricted free agent. And exactly, and you want to win as a core group because they're all saying in these po- post season press conference that they want to all stay together and they love each other and and that's that's what makes me want to keep the band together for at least one more year. I want to see what changes from one more year after hear, hearing all the right things or after next year, I could actually say, you know what? I actually think that you guys are full of shit and you're just so, saying all the right things and you don't actually fucking like, maybe you're, maybe you think that you want to stay together, but you're not doing the things that represents that you want to win together. They hate the media, which it's hard to judge against. Like when you're dealing in that fishbowl and 40 reporters every day, like I understand it, but they hate the media. So all, all their answers like Marner, we don't listen to you. Like they're just, they're always so disgusted having to answer questions, but their play is what's leading to these questions in the playoffs. But you bring up the monotone and, and I'm not saying like, oh, you want to copy a guy. Do you remember McKinnon when they lost to Vegas the year before the cup? Remember what he said? I'm yeah. sick and fucking tired of this shit. And, and they're, it, it just kind of like, yeah, yeah, we love it here. I, I don't, I love these guys. You know, it's like, and Dubas, well, he's made some, and his deadline deals were awesome. He made this team better, and I, I understand he's this like golden child where he'd be, he'd have a job in two seconds if he was fired, and he he had all the leverage when those guys were RFAs. That's that's my. He problem. had everything. Like he didn't have to give them those deals. I don't understand that. I, I I would tell you right now is if I was a GM in the National Hockey League, and I don't care how good the kid was, if it was excess money and you hadn't had play, like proven yourself come playoff i would say hey man you're gonna have to this certain date they did it with Nylander. they did it with Nylander. dallas did still it with got the seven million though he still got what he wanted who they just made him wait um, he wanted seven million he got 6.95 he ended up getting what he wanted yeah okay but I, yeah i guess i guess overall is what i'm trying to say is i would say listen if you don't want to sign by the deadline you're going to be spending the entire season not playing hockey and i think that's going to be worse for you in the long run because remember like they weren't at a time where they were going to win then either like they were still they still had some growing to do so it's like okay take the year off fucking go to belize for all i care you know, hang out with fucking uh, him and uh, <laughs> RA at, at, at what, what did he go do when he was naked the whole time? Oh, 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 naked uh, bungee jumping? oh no, he did he did he did him too. Yeah. Oh, right. um, naked last last thing for me on the Leafs is um, Dub is coming back. Like makes sense in a way that. OK, so Matthews has one year left. You, you got to figure out, like, is he re-signed? They can sign him July 1. Right. And I and and I read his no. He has a no move clause that starts July 1. So you can't can't really go into the season without him re-signed, right? You can't. You put it this way: you cannot lose him for nothing. You can't. It would it would it would cripple it would cripple the whole team. So if Dubas has the ability to get him to re-sign, like maybe that matters to him. Or who's there? And that's something where it's like, all right, get Dubas back here, get this guy re-signed. Because if you're gonna keep any of them, it's him, in my mind. Um. So I, 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 the, the, the question is, what is Matthews thinking? And right now, he's pretty much calling the shots. You had the chance to call the shots with him earlier, and you let him do it anyways. Well, now he's officially calling the shots, and that will change the entire landscape. You just need an answer from him. Like, what, what do you want to do here? So they're kind of held hostage Toronto's a little gonna bit. You think Toronto's going to get JT'd? <laughs> Imagine. Oh, man. Wouldn't that people, be by the way, people are already sending me... Um, 
People are already sending me uh, videos of McDavid holding up a, a Leafs jersey he got for Christmas when he was like oh, 10 years man. old. Oh, wow. Imagine, <laughs> imagine it, that it, wife It kind of recalls what like, Gaudreau and Kachuk. You know, Gaudreau played his deal out. Kachuk said, hey, I'm definitely not signing here. And it gave Calgary an opportunity to do something with him. So, you know, they're kind of in the same boat right now with Matthews. I mean, if, is he going to give him a heads up if he doesn't want to be there? Or is he going to play it out till the end? So... Remains to be seen, but but Biz, I think we uh, we do have to commend uh, Morgan Riley. He had he was one of the best Leafs all playoffs. Four goals, eight assists. I mean, he was a, a true leader. He he was both ends of the ice was stupendous. I just wanted to give him uh, an extra shout out because I thought he was one of the best it's players. Right. If not I the couldn't best agree player. more, buddy. And and it's crazy because like they got the goaltending. I felt like I felt between Samsonov and and Wall, I feel like they had good enough goaltending to win. Yeah. By Who the way, Samson was so a free agent with O'Reilly, with Shen, with Achari. So it's like you could talk about the core four. They have a million question marks. Forget those four. And and yeah. and dude, imagine going in with Murray and Wall next year. <laughs> what the f- there there is some interesting. This off season is going to be nuts. Nuts. No doubt about it. I no think doubt we about spent it. Enough time, but hey, yeah. Are we gonna are we gonna pump Florida's tires or we? Uh, so I, I, I wanted to get the Leaf stuff out of the way, but we have to get into this team. This is yep. a magical run. Magical run. All right, before we go any further, there's a word from our friends at Game Time. Game Time is the exclusive ticketing partner of Boston Sports. Created by fans for fans, Game Time is the ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last-minute deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. Summertime is here. Concerts are here. It's not just playoffs. All that's going on. That's great. I love concerts in the summertime. I go down to Great Woods, down a little south of Boston. I think Guns N' Roses is coming to Fenway. Probably going to hit them up as well. Whatever you want to see, Game Time will hook it up. It's possible with that app. The biggest last-minute price drops can be found on Game Time on the seats that you thought you could never buy. Purchase process takes just two taps in 10 seconds. And once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone. No printer needed. The app also allows you to easily share tickets with friends via text so you can get to that game seamlessly. All right, so we're, we're actually, I don't mean to cut you off here. Oh, no, please do. Started the planning for the Stanley Cup finals trip today. Oh. First thing I do, first thing I do is check game time for the prices. You know they're going to have the lowest prices. We got to find a way to get in the door. We're not getting any media passes. So the first place, as always, is game time. The absolute best of the best. You know what, gee, I got a guy. And you know what my guy says? Go to Game Time. Skip the hassle. Enjoy the moment. Download the Game Time app or go to the website. Enter your email and redeem code Chicklets for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Yeah, Biz, man, we definitely have to give our flowers to Florida. I mean, the Leafs did a great job of neutralizing Kachuk too. Those last few games, he didn't even get a point. I mean, I don't know if he's dinged up or whatnot, but they couldn't capitalize on that. But Murrows, what did you see with this Florida team that impressed you very much? Yeah, same as in Vegas. The defense are are just outstanding. They keep everything the outside. Goalie Bob was was the difference maker. We give the Leafs a hard time, but Bob was 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 great. Um, one little story I like is because uh, he's he's a journeyman like myself. Is the Zach Dalpy? I think I hope I'm saying his name right. I'm awful at that, but he he's basically been a career minor leaguer, called up for a couple games each year, but mostly down in the minors. And then he's getting up there. He's playing a good role. He got a goal and. Uh, you can see he's just kind of a team guy that the coach trusts. And, and those are the kind of guys you need around when you want to make a long run. So I hope to keep him going. And uh, I love the minor league stories. Merles, did he not win a Calder Cup with Chicago Wolves last year? And was he not the MVP of playoffs? Um, I, I think he was the captain of the team, okay. I, I, I believe. I don't okay, have yeah, all yeah. of his hockey DB. I can look that up though while you guys are covering him. Yeah, it's it's I think we got caught up in the Bob contract too, Merles. Oh, 10 million, 10 million. He he played himself out of a job. Lion took it, but then all of a sudden Lion, you know, stumbles a bit and then, oh shit, Bobrovsky, two time Vesna winner, he can steal a series and he's playing the best hockey probably since he's been in Florida, I'd say. And, oh, and definitely going from yeah, going from backup was he back up until game three or four of the Boston series? And now I would say that he's probably in conversation for Con Smythe. The way he he I think he he was their best player in that second round, and he definitely saved their bacon at the end of the first. So to go from where he was come Game Four of the Boston series to now is just remarkable. And I mean, we already talked about Gudis. You also need guys like that who are just creating so much fucking morale in that locker room. 
Like, I feel like they have so many, like, quirky guys. Like, that Nick Cousins, when he's doing the lineup reads, you could just see the way that the guys react to him, that he's a clown inside that locker room. Like, he he was beloved in Arizona. And after his press conference, after scoring the winner, he was, like, shouting out Bell Vegas, the hometown of Belleville. So, you know, he's just a dirtbag from Belleville, Ontario, loving life. So, uh, Delpe was named the MVP of the AHL last season with the Charlotte Checkers. Oh, Charlotte Checkers. Oh, God, here we go. I fucked um, up the team. Grinelli made a good point about Florida. I, don't, I think it was on Game Notes. He said they they remind him a lot of the 2019 St. Louis Blues. Ironically, Grinelli partied with them after they won the Stanley Cup against his favorite team. But it's a pretty good analogy. And it goes back to the end of the regular season. St. Louis is in last place January 4th. They go on this amazing run. Florida's out of the playoffs. They got to go on this wild run, including 6-1-1 one, one on their last eight just to sneak in. It, it, it has, it, they had great goaltending. Now, granted, Bennington was a rookie, but Bobrovsky's completely stepped up. And they're bullies, more, too. They bully everyone bullies. out there. They're bullies. They're bullying every team <laughs> they play against. It's going to be a lot harder, I think, to bully Carolina because they just stay away from all bullshit and they don't get involved. But they have done an amazing job. And the biggest thing is, like, talk about going through losing and figuring it out. They were the president's trophy losers. The president's trophy winners. They get bounced in the second round. They get swept. They lost the year before that. They had a great regular season and Tampa beat them. In a, remember the first round that year, how crazy that series was? So they've had the years of losing. They have this struggle throughout the regular season. They turn it on and it's an amazing roster that's added Matthew Kachuk. And people said, well, they lost Huberto and Uyghur. Well, look at, Bron look at Brandon Montour. Their best defenseman, Gudis is on the last pair with Mahura. He's a straight-up savage, a barbarian. Mark Stahl, I got the chance to play with him. I played golf with him at the All-Star break. He was he's laughing. He's playing now, like a mean motherfucker Buddy, right he's now, playing too. unbelievable. He said to me, like, I, I signed with them thinking I'd play like 10 to 12 minutes a game, be in and out of the lineup. He's playing an enormous role. Yeah. Shout out the three Stahl brothers playing against each other to go to the Stanley <laughs> Cup. What an amazing Wild. story. And... It's a team that it, it, it has this weird feeling team of destiny. I, I, I still don't know who I'm going to pick in that round, but they have just done such a great job at believing in themselves while nobody's given them a chance. I mean, no one gave them a chance against Boston. And I'd say not that many people thought they'd beat Toronto either. So they just keep humming. And, and the fact they were able to beat Toronto in five with Kachuk not really doing that much, some nice assists, but he didn't score, right? <laughs> no, I mean, not in the last... And and, no. and he's going to get... So they, they won Friday. They're not going to play till Thursday. So if he was banged up, which I think he was, that's a five-day rest. And it's just... A, it's an amazing team to watch right now that that everyone has underrated, including, you know, me the most. Hey, hey Paul Maurice knows how to play to a crowd too, eh? He's great oh in the press God. conferences. Oh, these pressers. him Between him and Kachuk, it's WWE shit at this point. He has tooled with Montgomery and Keith the first two rounds tooled with them. Yeah, I mean, he's been doing it for quite a long time, and I heard you can actually have gotten 40 to 1 on Florida as late as February uh, 10th. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. We heard about you, get a, you get a free <laughs> t-shirt when you put the bed yeah. in, too, I heard. Yeah, your Florida <laughs> underwear is proving that. <laughs> Meow. He gets, he gets Kachuk's bath water as, a, as, a, as an upgrade gift. I'll put it next to his dad's that the, I've had for on the band 30 years. Wagon. Oh shit! Uh, uh, I got one more thing on Florida. Go. We gotta, we gotta, we we were hard on him. We we, I think we even said we might take a dump on his his car when he was gonna scratch. Oh, the management and Zito, Billy Zito. We gotta, we gotta pump him up. He figured out they didn't have what it takes to win in the playoffs. He made some switches and and they're on an amazing run. And I've known him for a long time. He was a uh, agent of Ray Drew and Hamilton, even the Migs for a couple of days. So I've known him a long time. So I'm happy to see he's doing well there. Um, I think that. Uh I remember mentioning that I was going to take a sky dump on his car for what was going on with the Yandel situation, not for any other reason other than that. So I will rescind the sky dump comment. <laughs> and yes, that, uh, that brass box with, um, uh, Luongo was pretty cool. That video. Do you guys you see, see Luongo's that? tweet? Yeah. Act he like tweeted out the before. picture of him. Just like he's jumping in somebody's arms. Then he just wrote, act like you've been there before. <laughs> <laughs> what does FK mean? That was on the end of it. I, I Thought it was short for fuck, but maybe I don't. I don't speak. Oh, I don't know millennial, so I'm not sure what it meant. But uh, boys, any uh, final notes or thoughts on this before we send it over to uh, 
Mr. Charles Barkley. No, we're going to throw to Barkley. We'll be back after game seven tonight. We'll be able to go over Seattle, Dallas, and we'll be able to preview the conference finals. So I think because of the time, Merle's, it'll be 4.30 in the morning. We're going to have Army on for the end of the pod, which is great. Get the two game notes daily, guys. And uh, looking forward to a, what should be a crazy game seven. I think all you guys are going to love Charles Barkley. Yeah. Uh, oh, the first pick's Ooh. already in. Uh-oh. On Carolina. Hey, I, didn't li- I didn't get to listen to, I, or I wasn't in on the Barkley interview, but um, we can cut this if I sound like a real idiot. But did you, did you ask him who the leading scorer of the Dream Team was? No. Did you guys bring was that it up? him? Little nugget right there. He's the leading scorer of that Dream Team team. He what did a going- modest guy. He doesn't even mention it to all us. Right. But we oh, did talk Dream Team. That- a lot of yeah, dream we team talk. In detail Good shit. about it. Uh, it was awesome. About well, the it pretty much changed. It changed basketball. F- it changed oh. basketball forever. Incredible. Mm. Uh, well, t- one more thing on Kachuk. Uh, he's a hot candidate. Um, he's in the Eastern Conference Final, as is his former grade school teammate Jason Tatum, also in the Eastern Conference Final in basketball. So that's the perfect segue. Now enjoy Charles Barkley. Before we get to Charles Barkley, this interview is brought to you by Chevy. You know that we've been a big part of the Chevy EV family, but we've got some big news. The first ever all-electric Silverado is officially Barstool's most valuable truck. The Silverado truck forever has just been a horse, a beast, and now you can get it in the EV mode. We got the chance to see this thing and experience it, and it's a complete game changer. I I really want to get one. It's available 400-mile range, GM estimated on a full charge. Over 10 feet of length in the bed with a multi-flex tailgate combined with a multi-flex mid-gate. A large 17-inch di- di- diagonal display screen. 17 inches, that's enormous. It's a monster screen. It could tow up to 10,000 pounds of max towing. 0 to 16 under 4.5 seconds with a wow mode. And up to an impressive 785 pounds of torque. You think of trucks, you think of beasts, and then you think, wow, EV? Electric truck? Yup, it works. Head on over to Chevy.com to learn more. Chevy.com to learn more about the Silverado EV right now. Chevy.com. Learn about it. Get involved. Man, when I found out we were interviewing our next guest, I was over the moon. In a stellar 16-year career, this forwards list of accomplishments is something else. All-rookie team, 11-time All-Star, 11-time All-NBA, All-Star Game MVP, League MVP, 75th, 75th anniversary team, and of course, the Basketball Hall of Fame. It's a huge pleasure and a great honor to welcome my dad's favorite non-Celtic to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Charles Barkley. How the hell are you, brother? Man, I'm doing good. I'm really <laughs> honored to to be on the podcast. You know, me and Biz been together a long time, <laughs> and I and uh, he's so much fun on our broadcast. And you know what's crazy about this whole thing? We 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 bought hockey in the last year. I'm surprised they could afford it with your contract now. <laughs> Business oh, no, 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 no. You know, my contract came free, later. Right? My contract came later. Uh, so no, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it was so funny uh, when they called. They said, "Hey, we need a favor." I'm like, "What you need?" They're like, "We need you to talk Wayne Gretzky into doing television." I'm like, "Does Wayne Gretzky want to do television?" <laughs> They're like. No, you got to talk him into it. We just <laughs> we just spent like five hundred million dollars. I was like, <laughs> okay, and I was like, Wayne, I, can I come over and talk to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. And obviously, when you go to Wayne's house, we're gonna do some drinking. I was like, Wayne, you need to think. What do you think about television? He's like, I haven't thought about television. I said, Well, I need you to do me a favor. Go meet with TNT, and and then talk calls me, and I, he says, What about me? I says. Okay. <laughs> and then Biz comes in and man, it's it's been a lot of fun watching these guys. Cause I'm a big I'm a watch anyway. And then I was so excited. Cause actually what's really funny, I tried to get us to buy hockey like probably ten years ago. And our boss like, nobody's watching hockey. I said, You don't understand. I said, they don't watch hockey during the regular season, but everybody watches the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yes. And then they went to some shit network like the Outdoor Channel, if I remember correctly. We, we were OLN at one point. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, yo, man, I'm rich and got cable and I can't find OLN. <laughs> so I was like, who the hell? What the hell is... Wow. Yeah. And so I was so glad when, you know, you finally they start getting all these great televisions. You can fucking just push a button 
and say, "Hey, O L N." <laughs> I, I like, <laughs> like so. It you was get, funny. like bow hunting. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I'm trying to watch power play that, here. Uh, I, I said, it, but it was so funny. So I'm actually really excited that we got hockey, man. It, it's been awesome. That was one of my questions because I mean, this year you even said coming back from uh, halftime to the to your show, you said, "I'm this game's boring. I'm watching the hockey game." But when did you get into it? Was it when you got drafted by the 76ers and the Flyers? Like, what was your beginning to hockey and enjoying it? It was crazy. It was the Flyers. You know, when I went there with those guys, and, and I tell you, one of the worst days of our lives when Petty Lindbergh oh. got killed in that car accident, and uh, it was brutal. But And I tell you, my two favorite Philadelphia athletes of all time, I got on my wall, Ron Hextall and Brian Dawkins. Uh, I got signed jerseys by both of those guys. So the Hextall years, that, that was it. You know, the Lindros years. Yep. Uh, and that's when I first met Rick Tockett. Uh, so I've been with Tockett since the 80s. Uh, he had but, the flow going then, though. Uh, oh, uh, you, yeah. you, but, you, but you know what's so funny? He's always been just a great dude. Yeah. You know, so you you kind of con lose contact when you get traded. Then next time I see him, it's doing the Stanley Cup Finals. He's actually coaching in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and then next thing I know, he's coaching in Arizona. And uh, I'm glad of his success because he's a really good dude. And then I, I got to know Wayne through the years and Chelios. Uh, you know, I know Brett Hull a little bit, but Chelios and Wayne and Talk, man, I see and talk to those guys quite a bit. One common thing is a lot of Canadians in that mix, and you're you're a, you're a big fan yeah, of Canada. Yeah, yeah, I figure. Well, Toronto's my favorite city in the world. I you like Vancouver. Pearson? Yeah, I, uh, Pearson Airport. Uh, <laughs> it's the worst airport in the world. But go ahead. I apologize. What about the other stuff? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, there's plenty. I know. Of, I look at got, the negative. He got I'm stuck there asked. for 48 hours. So <laughs> oh he's my like, god. It's on his well, there's list. nothing worse than getting stuck at the airport, <laughs> yeah. especially if you somebody. <laughs> I'm nobody. Uh, no, because 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 people actually think you at the airport to fucking talk to them. <laughs> uh, I like, no, I'm here to catch a flight. Uh, but it that's the only. Hey, there's nothing worse than a delayed flight. Yeah. When you're somebody, because man, everybody think you there to talk to them, and there's nowhere you can go. But uh, Toronto is my favorite city in the world, and thanks Wayne for screwing up the, the golf tournament at Collingswood. Uh, Wayne used to have the best golf tournament other than Lake Tahoe I've ever been to. He used to have a tournament up in Collingswood, and man, it was the best week for all the celebrities. It was a, a corn fairy tour. Oh, the, they combined them. Uh, well, it was it was it was it was a, a corn fairy tour and a celebrity tour, and you played with a celebrity every day. And that little resort is right around the lake. It's right at the bottom of the ski resort. They got like. Five bars and restaurants right out the back door of the hotel. It was one of the most fun weeks of my life. And Wayne screwed it up. He quit having a tournament after like five or six years. But it was like the best summer week ever up in Canada. But, you know, in Vancouver, we were really pissed when they moved that team out of Vancouver. Because uh, it's fun to go to Vancouver. But Toronto is my favorite city. But to go back to your original question, I figured out that America's the only assholes in the world. Canadians are great. <laughs> On, the, most of the people I've met in my life are just assholes who are assholes. They're just American. <laughs> and the Canadians, they're just so fun to be around. There's no drama. They just want to drink some Molson and Labatt's, which yep. I love to drink. Uh, I do. I love to drink. I love to drink and gamble. It's one of my <laughs> favorite things in the world. Uh, and so the Canadian, they fit right in when it comes to the drinking part. Did you know anything about like Toronto? Was it the first time you went when the Raptors well, got I would a team? They came in the league while you were already yeah. part way in it, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, the only thing was really interesting. The only thing I knew about Canada was Edmonton and Calgary, <laughs> because and and it was awesome because in, in in I forget what year it was. It was I was still in college, and I played in the World University Games. It was, we went to Edmonton to practice for like a week. Then the games were in Calgary. And I'm still mad to this day because uh, they screwed us out of our gold medal. Jay Triano uh, was a really terrific guard. Uh, they screwed us. They, I'm still mad at Jay all these years for stealing our gold medal. They followed our whole starting unit out like the first quarter, first half. Who are we playing against? Canada. No shit. Yeah. Oh, that's a home cooking right there. Uh, uh, the home cooked meal. <laughs> as as a member of of Auburn, or was it like a special team? No, no, no. So there, 
guys who don't, uh, the World University game is kind of an offshoot of the Olympics. Like, so you represent your country. And uh, we end up playing Canada in the semifinals. And, man, you talk about, I think the referees were from Canada. I mean, we just got screwed. And I, every time I saw Jay Triano and some of those guys later in life, I said, how's my gold medal doing? So <laughs> we, end up, we end up winning the bronze. So, uh, but it, it, but man, the Canadian people were so amazing. I remember telling my mom, you know, you're supposed to be in summer school. Are you doing anything? I said, mom, I'm going to the library every day. I didn't tell the library was a bar. Uh, I did. I said, mom, I'm going to the library every single day. I said, mom, all the guys are going. And I didn't tell her till later on in life. You know, mom, the library was a bar. Uh, but we had a great time. But I did all right, mom. No, no, you, right. you know what was crazy about Canada at the time? And this was probably 80, uh, 82, 83, right in there. And, you know, we're so stupid about how money works. We're college kids. Like we go into a bar and we buy something. We buy some alcohol. And then they give you more change than you originally <laughs> gave back. I'm like, this is the greatest place in the world. <laughs> this is the greatest thing in the world. And that's what I learned about exchange the, rates. I, I, I said, like, and that's just like, yeah, yeah, man. We're paying for stuff, and they're giving us more money back than we actually paid. We should do something about this. This is a great little scam. Going, let's just go and go and start buying shit that we can. It was great. My buddy actually lives in Vancouver, and he went to watch you when you were playing against the Grizzlies. And you guys used to dummy them all the time. And he said you would just have so much fun on the court, even to the point when you guys were blowing them out, that you would be taking free throws with your eyes closed. Well, we were, well, you know, the Grizzlies, you know, when you're playing an expansion team, you can do whatever hell you want to. <laughs> I mean, the, the expansion team ain't going to beat anybody. Not in the NHL. No, the sh- yeah, the NHL's really- different now. Well, it's, it's different now. Yeah. It's different now because they realize that it's really an unfair system. And hockey, man, and when you're successful in hockey, it's really important because, you know, you guys have a hard salary cap. Like everybody in the NBA is cheating and the NFL is cheating, but to be great uh, in hockey, when you like, no, 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 you got exactly how much money you can spend and not a cent more, like that, that's, you have to be really good and handle your business. Like I say, everybody in the NBA is over, the, well, the good teams, they way over the salary cap. They pay the luxury tap, cap just to hit for just a win. And then in the NFL, you know, just keep moving money around. Yeah. But hockey, man, when you have a hard salary cap, like it's it's hard to be successful for extended periods of time. Yeah. And I think now it was more about these owners are paying. Well, Vegas was five hundred million, then I think Seattle was six fifty. So they're like, we're not going to be paying all this if you're going to have us have a shit team for this long. I, and so actually, I understand it. I actually, I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, because like, because I, you know, I, my at the heart of my sports is competition and i think you have a one reason i don't like the nba at times is load management bullshit that's going on nowadays i was like yo man these people paid their hard-earned money you're making 20 30 40 million dollars you guys act like we still workers you can go out there and play <laughs> basketball for 30 minutes a night it ain't like you're gonna kill yourself like but we played like yesterday i'm like yeah, that's 48 hours. Can you play basketball for like 35 minutes a day? And uh, and hockey, man, I admire the guys. I said this on the show the other night. I said, man, these guys just want to get their name on the Stanley Cup. There's no bullshit. I saw a guy get 70 stitches and come back in the game the other <laughs> night. I was like, yeah, man, if an NBA player got 75 stitches, he'd retire. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, done. I'm, like, done. I'm, I'm done. taking my max deal. Yeah, yeah. I, he's like, I'm taking my max deal yeah. and go home. Then, I, you know, I've seen probably two guys got hit in the face with a puck. One yeah. of them actually went in a goal. And I was like, man, you, uh, you, if you don't admire that. Was that was Haskin in the other night for Dallas. Yeah, yeah. And, and Hyman got it off the chin and it went in in the first round. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you, and if you can't admire that and respect that, it's just something wrong with you. We were, I think we were going to ask you about that. I, I mean, even we watched some of these guys walk in now and they got these silly outfits on. Like, it just, it's just, it's taken on a mind of its own, the NBA. Like, yeah. how much how much different is it from when you stepped in the league where I'm sure you guys had veterans and there was a pecking order where I feel like the, like the, the young guys just come in and they kind of run the show right off the hop? Well, I think the money has gotten so astronomical. You know, you know I'll give you an example, you know, like, <laughs> I, the best person that ever had me in the NBA was Moses Malone. 
Because when I got to the NBA, uh, my first contract was four years, $2 million. And that's total? Total. And uh, I like the way you said that total, like, damn. <laughs> uh, I so was like, eight that's million, that's my career. That's no. what I made my career. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't getting to play. And I said, Moses, I said, Moses, can I come see you? Because Moses lived in the penthouse in the condo building I lived in. And I said, Moses, why am I not getting to play? And he says, you're fat and you're lazy. I said, what? He says, which part do you not understand? I says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you, you weigh 300 pounds. And you can't work hard enough. He said, you got away with that shit in college. Can't get away with that in the pros. And this guy, who's by far and away the most influential person in my life, uh, basketball-wise, he said, Chuck, you can't lose weight being that big. He said, let's lose 10 pounds. He got me to 290. He said, let's keep going. 280, 270, 260, 250. And I didn't think I could lose 50 pounds, but I did, and the rest is history. And the to, to, to pick back your question is, I look at a young kid like Zion, who probably making, I got in shape for $2 million. And a kid like Zion's probably making 50 to $100 million, and he won't get in shape. Like he's been in NBA like almost five years and only played like really one season because he's just too big. So that goes back to your question. Like the young guys are making so much money, they are running things. And is it a negative? Yes, there's a negative. Because he seems like a nice kid, but I wonder, since he has so much money and so much power, who would he listen to since, son, you got to get in shape. So, you, well, you just brought up a good point, too, whereas you felt like you had that, that veteran leader to talk some sense into you, where I feel like the older guys tend to be weeded out quicker now because it's turning over to be such a young league yeah. in, in any sport, where maybe they don't have that veteran influence there. Well, because, you know, you, you try to get, you know, you see in the NFL, they're like, let's get rid of the veteran quarterback because he's making too much money. And it's the same way, let's get rid of the old guys where they're making so much money. Let's bring in young guys. And and it's happening in every sport. Because, you know, as a veteran, you have to make a certain amount. So now they, like, try to move on from the, the veterans as quickly as possible. And um, I think it's hurt them. I think it's hurt the league, to be honest with you. I think we all need some older, at least one older guy on the team. You know, Dr. J talked me about saving my money. As he said to me, son, how many cars you got? I said, I think I got like five or six. He says, well, how many of them can you drive at the same time? <laughs> he said, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, how many cars? I said, one. He said, well, let's take these other cars back. Something like that's smart. You know, he taught me how to dress. He said, son, you can't dress in warm-up suits. You got to wear a suit. This is professional football. You can't be walking around in warm. You you were walking around in the free track suits that the team gave you. <laughs> I did. Oh, I did. Because you know you don't have any suits really. Because you're not wearing suits in college, and so you still. And he's like, no, no, no. I remember the first time they took me shopping. Uh, it was it's a, it's a famous uh, clothing store in Philadelphia called Boyd's, and we spent thirty thousand dollars. And I guarantee you there's not a person in my family that ever made $30,000 in their entire life. And they made me buy all these suits and jackets and sports coats and things. And like I said, when I got the bill, it was like 30, 31, something like that. And I remember calling my agent. He says, hey, I need you to pay this bill. He says, what did you spend $30,000 on? I said, they made me go shopping. They said, this is professional basketball. You don't walk around in warm-ups. Because, you know, at that time, we're flying commercial. Yeah. And I remember calling my family and telling them, like, you spent $30,000? And I think my mother and grandmother probably were making about $15,000 because my mom was a, was my mom wasn't making $15,000 because she was a maid. But I think my grandmother, she worked in the meat factory, and I think she was making around seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year. And for me to spend $30,000 in one day, they thought I was crazy. But they understood. And I, and I understood. So that goes back to my original point, like, Having an older guy who's seen all the BS that goes on, I think every team should have a guy like that. Yeah, without maybe without Moses Malone, like who knows where your career ends up, right? I yeah, mean, because you know, I I, I I've seen yeah ten guys eat their way out of the NBA <laughs> easily. <laughs> 
this good pregame meals for you guys. Hey, man, when you got all that money and, you know, and it's, you know what's really crazy, what, what people don't understand, like, I try to, they're like, well, what's a day like? I says, oh, days are pretty, pretty easy. But, you know, football players are different. They're there like all day. I have no idea what they're doing all day, I might add. Like I says, well, they said, what's a normal day like? I said, what a, a game day, you go in for a shoot around about 30, 40 minutes in the morning, then you're off all day, then you play the game. I said, on an off day, you go in in the morning, some team practices at 10, some team practices at 11. You're there probably an hour, maybe an hour and a half, because you can't practice too much during the season because you play so many games. But then you're off for the rest of the day. I'm like, what? I says, yeah, on an off day, you're there probably an hour, hour and a half. You ready? Uh, off. I said, man, you have so much free time. And if you have any bad habits, whether it's alcohol, drugs, eating, it's going to multiply with all that free time. And the Especially money. Especially when you have the money to, to do all that stuff. So that's why I always tell people when, when I read all the time, I say, if you're a jock, you got to have discipline to be successful. Because with all that free time and all that money, man, if you got any bad habits, you're screwed. Yeah. When you join that team, uh, Charles, you got Dr. J, Moe's, you already said, Mo Cheeks, another great player. How long did it take for like the starstruck, starstruck aspect to wear off when you just kind of became one of the boys? Well, I think, it, to be honest with you, it was crazy. Because uh, I've told this story publicly before. I was so nervous like the night before training camp. And the only thing I was thinking about, what do I say? What do I call Dr. J? <laughs> <laughs> and I was stressed out about it. And I said, do I call him Dr. J? Or do I call him Doc? I call him Mr. Irvin, Mr. Julius. And I was sitting there just thinking, because I, I was nervous because it was my first camp also. But I, that was it. And I remember he walked up to, hey, I'm Doc. And he broke the ice. But those guys, man, they treated me great. You know, they were all older. I think they're all probably in their mid-30s. They were all on the backside. But, man, I, I wouldn't have been the player I was. And we had a great coach, Billy, Billy Cunningham. Cunningham. yeah. And um, who was crazy about it, Billy, who's a great friend and mentor to this day, he like, you know, I'm not going to play you because you're not in shape and you don't work hard. And the owner's like, Billy, he's the number five pick in the draft. You got to play him. He's like, no, no, no. He's going to play very limited minutes because he's, he he's not in good enough shape. But then this funny thing happened. The owner went behind his back and traded the player. His name was Mark Alvaroni. And we were in Chicago, I'll never forget. The coach is late to the bus. Alvaroni's late to the bus. And Billy was a stickler. He would leave anybody. He, he never was late. He would leave anybody. I mean, he left Doc. He left Moses. If you one minute late, he gone gone. So one minute, we're like, probably about five minutes late. Billy comes out, he gets on the bus, and we look around, I've run this down on the bus. And we get to the, to, the, to, the, to the game, and Billy's like, Charles, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, oh, couldn't have did anything wrong. He <laughs> says, well, the owner traded Ivorone behind my back. I'm not fucking starting you till you get your ass in shape. I'm like, okay. Oh, that guy was playing in front of you? Yes. Okay. And then he says, Sam, you're starting. A guy named Sam Williams. Sam hadn't played all year. <laughs> and Sam's like, what? <laughs> he says, you're starting tonight. And it was, it was hilarious because he said, he says, I'm not starting you. He traded a guy behind my back so you could start. You're not starting until you get your ass in shape. And it, it was really a blessing in disguise to have a coach who held me to a high standard, uh, and, uh, and, and to this day, we're still really good friends. But that day, I was pissed. I was going to punch him in the face, to be honest with you. <laughs> He's yelling at me for no reason, like I made the trade. <laughs> how, how pissed was the owner after that? Uh, he, you know, they had a, a, a combative relationship at times, but it probably ended up being a good thing for me in the long run because I wasn't physically, because like I say, I, 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 I forget where I was on my weight loss journey, to be honest with you. but. I, I, I was, what was really crazy about it, when I lost the first 10, I noticed a difference. Then I lost 20, I noticed a difference. Then I lost 30, like, I'm like, oh man, I can work really hard out here. And I, like at that time, I'm getting some playing time. And I, then right after that, I started starting. 
But if it wasn't for Moses and Billy holding me to a standard, man, I, it, my career could have turned out totally different. I, I saw the 60 Minutes piece that was recent where you went back to your hometown. It was awesome. And and then I also was reading up that you were a late bloomer, right? You didn't make your high school. I didn't. Team. I grew from 5'10 to 6'5 in one year. Oof. What's really crazy about that is because everybody's like, why is this kid ranked number five in the state? There are four guys ranked ahead of me. And I never got any big time offers until the, my senior year because that's when I grew. So everybody's like, how can this kid be this good and nobody ever heard of him? Yeah. And he's like, well, he grew from 5'10 to 6'5 in one year. So he came out of nowhere. But what's really crazy about it, I, <laughs> when I was trying to decide where to go to college, I was going to go to Alabama, Auburn, and UAB because they're all, I mean, I'm from a small town of a couple thousand people. Birmingham is about 20 minutes away. That's where UAB is. Tuscaloosa is about an hour and 15 minutes away. And then Auburn's like two hours away. So when I was looking at schools, UAB was my first choice because I was really close to my mother and grandmother. I said, I think I need to stay close because they went to every game I played in high school. And then I said, well, Tuscaloosa is interesting. But what really was really happened, they both made it to the Sweet 16 and had everybody coming back. And then when I went to go to Auburn, Auburn had lost like 12 games in a row. I said, oh, shit, this is where I'm going to college. I'm going to play. I'm going to play. <laughs> because, you know, I talk to kids all the time. I said, yo, man, the number one thing, I said, I don't want to hear the education aspect. If you want education, you're going to get it anywhere. I said, but the number one decision you need to make when you're trying to decide to go to college is if, are you going to get playing time? Because it's going to be the first time when you're away from home. All the guys can play. If you're sitting on the bench, it's going to be miserable. So when you, you know, you see now with this crazy shit in the transfer portal. I'm yeah, like, it's not. Wait a minute. Didn't you study who was ahead of you before you decided to go to college there? I like, you got, no matter how confidence you got, much confidence you got in yourself. If you go to a school that's got two players at your position better than you, you're not going to get to play. And now you're going to have to transfer, transfer, transfer. I said, Auburn, Auburn turned into the best decision I ever made, but it was because they sucked at basketball. What was the recruitment like back then for our college players? Was that, was that a big aspect uh, at the time? Not really for me uh, because, I, like I say, I was such a late bloomer. All the right. money was gone. <laughs> you know, uh, all the money was gone. You know, and it was really funny. You know, I heard the stories about Bobby Lee Hurd and Ennis Wiley getting paid, and which – and now, in my last 40 years, I hear, heard all the stories about guys getting paid. And now it's legal, which is crazy. But because I was such a late bloomer and not highly recruited, I, I never got induced by financial. Like I say, because I wasn't a high enough recruit. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't like it was a bidding war for me. <laughs> I mean, like I say, because I grew, grew so late, most people, they had already had the players they want. And like I say, it, it came down to – and Alabama and, and, and UAB, I think they had everybody coming back. I think they wanted me, but they didn't need me. I think Auburn needed me. Um, as far as Auburn's concerned, like you ended up going fifth overall, and you said you were a late bloomer. Like at what point were you like, okay, this is actually – maybe I got a future in this and I could go to the NBA. Like what propelled you from being – I believe it took to your senior year of high school to make the varsity team. Is that true? Yes. Uh, and I, but I knew after my freshman year in college, I didn't know I was going to have success in the pros, to be honest with you, but I knew I was going to go to the pros. Because what happened was I never averaged more than 12, 13 points uh, in college. All the but years? Every, in my three years of college. But I was a rebounding machine. I led the conference in rebounding every year I was there, even as a freshman. So I knew at the end of my freshman year, I remember a guy saying to me, one of my coaches, he says, it's easy for you to get 10 rebounds a night, isn't it? And I says, every man walking should get 10 rebounds a night. I love the <laughs> rebound. He says, why don't you pick up that newspaper over there and look at the stats? And I said, what do you mean? He says, look at the NBA leaders. He says, I mean, the guys are averaging 10 rebounds a game. I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six. I says, there's only 10 guys in the NBA averaging and rebounds a game. He said, I don't think you understand what you're doing. He How says, valuable that is. Yeah, he says, rebounding is so valuable. He says, 
son, if you get 10 rebounds a night, you going you ain't gonna never have to work a day in your life. <laughs> and I said, I could like I said, I didn't know I could score. It's easy to score in the NBA because in college everybody's playing the zone. But he says, if you get 10 rebounds a night, you're gonna be successful for life, making a shitload of money. And so that's my thing. So like I say, all three years in college, I led the league in rebounding. When I got to the NBA, I said, like, I'm gonna get you 10, 12 rebounds a night. And then the scoring came later, but like I say, I'm gonna get you 12 rebounds a night, and I, and, and that the rest is history. W were you considered undersized for a, for a strong forward at the yes, time? Yes. Yes. So what was it about what what made you such a good rebounder? Your anticipation as far as like where it was coming from and just the angles and no, stuff. No, you like, just got to go get it. That's <laughs> it. It just came down. Yeah, came yeah, down. You got to go get it because taking elbows and shit. Oh yeah, you got because. <laughs> so I tell you a funny story. So I was. 20 points, 20 rebounds in, in high school. And so when I went to college, I wasn't getting in a rebound. And the coach says to me, he says, son, why aren't you getting in a rebounds? He says, I said, this dude over here on my ass screaming at me. There's a head coach is screaming at me. He's one of those fundamentally sound guys. And the guy recruited me. He says, they told, the coach says, they told me you could rebound. I said, I'm a great rebounder. He said, why don't you ever get in the rebounds? I said, Cause, and the coach says, hey, man, fuck him. What did you do in high school? I said, I went and got that bitch. <laughs> he says, this dude is telling you to box out every time. Fuck him. This assistant coach, Roger Banks. He says, go get the fucking ball, man. <laughs> he says, and because he said, he says, remember in high school, you just said, I'm going to go get every rebound. He said, them fools who box out, Guys who box out only get the rebound if it bounced to them. And he says, man, go get the ball. That's what, that's what we wanted you to come here for. He said, if the coach yell at you, I'll handle it. I said, Sonny, turn that boy loose. Turn that boy loose. <laughs> and from that day on, I'm going to get it. He says, son, people who box out, unless the ball bounced to you, you never get a rebound. He said, you got to go get the damn. That's one thing I admire about Dennis Rodman. There was a guy named Michael Cage who was a great yep. player. Xavier McDaniel, guy that played. Yeah, man, go get it. Don't worry about it. if you box it out unless it bounced to you. You ain't never gonna get no rebound. Yeah. And so from that day on, I was like, Yo, man, go get the ball, man. And, and uh, that's the way you have to rebound. The, the scoring, like I mean, I guess Larry Bird. The story is every summer, every off season, he got better at something. So. Was, it, was that what it was for you in the summers? Like your, your offensive game was just getting better? Or was it just hard work in terms of like, I'm going to become a 25 point per game guy also? It's just easier because, you know, you, you don't play zone in the NBA. So it's really one-on-one -on -one basketball. So it's easier to score in the pros. Especially, and for me it was easier because I'm playing against a guy who's a lot taller than me. And you get those big guys in space. They don't want it. They want you down on the box, just beating the hell out of each other. But I tell people, you take a big guy 12 to 15 feet away from the basket, he might as well be, be on Mars. He's lost. He's lost. They do <laughs> not want to move. They just want to beat you to death in the post. And that was the way the game was played as a power forward. Like, let's go on the box. We're going to beat the hell out of each other for 48 minutes a night. And then what happens, happens. And I figured out, like, Three guys, uh, John Drew, Clark Kellogg, and Adrian Danley. All three undersized power forwards. They were great rebounders, but what they did on offense, they took their man away from the basket. Like I say, those big seven-footers, the guys 6'9", six, 6'10", six, which, which most power forwards are, they want to be in the paint. They just want to beat the hell out of you. But if you get them out, off that lane and make them move, that's their nightmare. It was easy for you once you got it. It was easy that. once I learned, once I got to work on my game. Because you, But you have to work on your game because, like I say, in college, they're playing zone. So it's they can take a big guy out the game in a zone. But the NBA, when you're going one-on-one, -on -one, you can't take you out the game. They can come double you and make you pass the ball. But if you're going one-on-one, -on -one, if you're any type of player, you should be able to get a good shot every time. And like l legendary shit talker, right? Was that always part of like who you were as an athlete? Did that come as you became more dominant or were you always into that part of it? It, ca it, it came later, Yeah, uh, to be honest with you. Because, you know, I'm playing against Bird, who's a legendary shit talker, mm -hmm. Gary Payton, Reggie Miller, Michael. They're legendary shit talkers. You kind of just get 
caught up in it. Because, like, I remember one time we were playing the Celtics. And this, I'm a full blown star at this point. And I remember going, uh, talking to Larry, who was amazing. <laughs> and thank God. shit talking to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and so it's my team at this point because Doc and Moses are gone. And Larry says, Chuck, can I talk to you a second? I said, sure, what's up, LB? He says, yo, man, y'all being disrespectful to me. I said, Larry, I would never <laughs> let one of my players be disrespectful to you. You're Larry Bird. He's like, yeah, y'all being disrespectful. I said, what are we doing? He says, y'all got a white guy trying to guard me. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like... <laughs> And there's only two guys <laughs> said that to me, him and Michael. Yeah. Michael said to me one game, he said, yo, man, y'all, I'm just offended out here. I said, what you offended by? Y'all got a white guy trying to guard me. Larry and Michael are the only two guys. And you, you, and you gotta laugh. Yeah, of course. I mean, you gotta laugh. It's I'm a like, setup, too. They, yeah, you can get like, hey, What's like, happening out here? Hey, man, don't put a white guy on me. That's just fucking disrespectful. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one white guy, I think you said he might have been the toughest to defend underneath, Kevin McHale. He, he, he was a he bitch is, of a time for you. He's huh? the best player I ever played against. No shit. Uh, offensively and defensively, he was the best player I ever played against. He he caused me problems because of his size and his arm length. Yeah. I mean, first of all, he had some of the best footwork you ever going to see. His shots were pretty much unstoppable. Uh, but defensively, his his size really bothered me. Uh, but I tell people, and that's no disrespect to Carmelo, Larry, guys like that who are all great players. Those guys, you can, you know, you got a chance against. But Kevin was so long, uh, and his shots were so on guard, but his footwork was such uh, impeccable. He was just a nightmare. You talk about the shit talking coming a little bit later. Were you always outspoken like, with the interview stuff? Because I think that that's probably eventually how you, you got your name and why they wanted you in television because you're just raw, open, and honest. When you were first at Auburn doing interviews or, or even early time in the NBA, were you just letting it fly where people were like, what? The? No, it probably happened. I think I became a star my third year in the NBA because my first couple of years, I never got an interview. Coach, so you're on a team with Dr. J, Moses, Maurice Cheeks, Andrew Tony, Bobby Jones, uh, guys like that. You're never going to get, like, wait, let's talk to Doc. Let's talk to Moses, Maurice, and Andrew. So I never even did an interview my first two years, basically. So then Maurice, uh, Maurice is gone. Andrew's gone. And Moses is there and Doc. And then my third year, I think, that was my first year, uh, I think I made the All-Star team and things started coming together. Then they started interviewing me. And I, I talked to Doc because he was the best. And I says, Doc, I'm having a hard time with this media thing because I'm getting criticized at times. He says, well, son, you got to make a decision. You want to make everybody happy. You want to do shit your own way. I said, well, I want everybody to like me. He says, well, that's a tough call right there. He said, because... No matter what you say, half the people going to like it, half the people going to dislike it. That's the way he handled it. He says, I want to be politically correct all the time. I want to kind of, you know, skirt my way through it, make everybody happy. He said, but that's a negative at times because you can't say what you want to all the time. And I said, well, I want everybody like me. He says, well, you got to make that decision right now. You want everybody to like you. You just want to be honest and fair with yourself. And he says, now... It's going to be great at times, and it's going to get you in trouble at times. He said, well, I can live with that. He says, but just tell the truth. Say whatever the hell you want to say. <laughs> and that's and all I, you remember from his comments. <laughs> and that, Jay's like, what no. the fuck did I tell this guy? Yeah, oh, no. I did. <laughs> and I said, because if you try to answer a question politically correct, it's still going to be criticized. Because Anybody who try to make everybody happy realize quickly, oh, shit, there's not a lot you can do making everybody happy. So about at this point, I'm like I'm in full bloom, like my fourth, fifth year. I'm like, hey, man, going forward, guys, I'm just going to say my truth doesn't make me right or wrong, but I'm going to tell the truth in my eyes. And from that point on, I've been stuck there. Like, and I'm happy to be there because – Man, if you try to answer questions and make everybody happy, you're going to go fucking nuts. Because, like, I remember saying something s simple like, you know, I just thank God we're so lucky, we're so blessed. 
uh, it, it was something stupid too. I just say, hey, I'm glad we won. God blessed us and blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, hey, uh, we need you to quit talking about God. I'm like, what you talking about? They're like, well, we get some complaints from people who don't believe in God. I'm like, wait, no, no what? <laughs> and I was like, that was like my first wake up call, to be honest with you. They're like, hey, just don't talk about God. Just say we were blessed, we were fortunate to win, so phrase it a different way. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, you're trying to say the right thing. I'm like, no, nah, don't talk. They pulled me and said, hey, don't talk about God. People are upset about that. And I was like, oh, shit, this is crazy. And then from that point on, I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to say what the fuck I want to say. Some people are going to like it. If they don't like it, fuck them. <laughs> uh, I know uh, your last season in Philly, you had changed your number from 34 to 32 after Magic's diagnosis. Now, I want to ask, did, did, should he be in the GOAT conversation? Well, I know it's basically LeBron versus MJ, but if he got a, you know, a couple more years there, I, I think Magic would be in that conversation. Do you agree? Well, I think that, not just saying this now, I've said it publicly many times, the two most important figures in NBA history are Magic and Bird. I think they saved the NBA. You know, the year I came in, David Stern first year, the average NBA salary was about $250,000, the average. The league was too ghetto, too black, too thuggish. A lot of drugs then, the right? Drug, yeah, Guys drugs, were snorting too, coke a yeah. lot, weren't they? I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, uh, I, 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 but that's what the perception was. Uh, the finals were on tape delay. Uh, it was crazy, and you know now the average salary is fifteen, about right around. Well, actually, no, the average salary is right eight to ten million, and it's crazy now. And bless these guys, but. It all started with Magic and Bird. And, uh, you know, obviously Michael took it to another level, but if it wasn't, I always tell people, if it wasn't for Magic and Bird, I don't know where the NBA would be today. I mean, it was crazy what those two guys did. And I hope people always acknowledge that. Uh, because, like I say, where we, where we are today to where we started, my first year is like night and day. And it's all because of Magic and Bird. But to answer your original question, I think that whole conversation is stupid <laughs> and lazy because I think guys who have no talent on TV and radio, because you know you're going to get debates either way. Uh, I think the best way to do it is generationally. Because, you know, Kareem, most, uh, you know, how many guys – Talk about this. I actually saw Kareem play. How I many guys, I, you know, Michael's probably been retired for 30 years. So anybody who's been around the last 10, 15 years, old enough to understand basketball, they never seen Michael play. Uh, same thing with Kobe. LeBron is great, great, great. Uh, but I always say, hey, listen, I, he can't be better than Michael Jordan <laughs> in, my, in my eyes because I played against Michael his entire career. Uh, and that's no, and I and I never really played against LeBron, uh, so uh, I, I can I imagine what it's like to play against Giannis right now. Huh. So I, I think that debate is when guys on radio and TV they're like, "Come on, man, you, you're just trying to get people to call in or get clickbait." Because, uh, like I say, I know a lot of old guys. So you guys need to put Kareem in there, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and like I say. But what Bill Russell did as a man, as a player, he's got to be in the conversation also. I mean, the guy got 11 championship rings, y'all, if y'all want to talk about winning. I always tell guys, man, don't be lazy and try to get people to call into your radio show and argue or try to get people to click onto an article. Listen, I love LeBron. Everything he's accomplished, I think he's a really nice person. Uh, but playing against Michael all those years and watching it firsthand, Going back and looking at the last dance, you know, watching that, you forget how physically they beat the hell out of him. The Pistons did the, the, the early in his career. I think they beat him four years in a row before Michael finally broke through. I mean, there's something about that struggle. And, you know, a lot of older guys like myself hold it against LeBron to his first couple of championships when he joined Dwayne Wade down in Miami. So it, it's a layered argument. Right. But 
I'd always want to give appreciation to Bird and Magic because if it weren't for those two guys, I have a zero idea what the NBA be, would be today. That, that, the dream team in, it was at 92 yep. in Barcelona? Yeah. yeah. Was, Bird was on there? Yes. So you got to play with all these legends. That must have been the, one of the coolest things about your entire career, right? I'll say this. It was the most intense thing that I've ever been through in my life. Huh. Just because of the amount of pressure to win? No, not the pressure to win. Just playing against these guys every single day in practice. The egos... The fun egos, because we got along great. But at that time, you had me and Carl Malone were the two best power forwards. We had to practice against each other every day. You had Michael and Clyde Drexler who hated each other because they had just beaten them in the finals. And Clyde thought he was as good as Michael, and Michael hated him. Uh, Ashley, and you had Magic, who had just gotten locked down by Scottie Pippen in the finals. So he was pissed. And you had David Robinson and Patrick Ewing, who were the two best centers in the NBA, and <laughs> playing against the guy considered your rival every day. Is, uh, and people have said, uh, many people have said, they've never seen anything as intense and fun and thrilling as watching the Dream Team actually practice. It was crazy and exciting. The crazy thing about it, we all got along so well, but when we went on the court, man, it's probably the most intense thing. Uh, you know, playing against a guy like Carl, like every day, like, okay, they said, a lot, most people think I'm the best power forward and some people think you are. Now we get to prove it on the court every day. And like I say, Scott against Magic, Clyde against Michael, and then David against Patrick. Did, did, did that spark it? Was it was it more of the Michael thing that that sparked it, and like the whole group got invested in it, or was it literally man to man where every guy was looking across the room like, "Yeah, I'm going uh, to war." It was with this more guy man to man. And these were close practices, right? So it's just yeah. nobody. It's 80, not video. Yeah. It's fist just no. your pride. Any fist fights? No fist fights. No. No. What the thing that was crazy? I couldn't believe how long well we all got along. I mean, it was crazy how well we got along. I mean. It, you know, they we made a T-shirt because Larry Bird and Patrick Ewan became Harry and Larry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we made a T-shirt. <laughs> and you know, me, Magic, Michael, and Scotty, we gambled every night from probably eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> to four o'clock every single day. <laughs> I mean, blackjack? No, uh, uh, tunk. Huh? I don't even know what that is. Wow. It's uh, white folks call it gin. Gen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it, man, we and what I can say, man, it would be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars changing hands every night. Oh it was my crazy. God. It was crazy. And then we would finish up about four in the morning so we can go get like two hour nap. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was so much fun. Like how, we, would, how would you guys compete at such a high level but yet be such degenerates off the court? Like that's like that's not treating it very professionally. Like guys nowadays don't do that. They don't even drink. Well, you, you guys well, were boozing, well, it, gambling all hours in the night. Like, how was your stress level going into practice? The, the, the basketball was the fun part of it. <laughs> I mean, because, well, because I'll tell you what was crazy. There's this infamous practice, and Grant Hill's full of shit, <laughs> and those guys. So we played against a, a group. The first day we played against a bunch of college all-stars. And I think it's probably eight of those guys who went on to go to the Hall of Fame. But we're all probably all... 30, if I remember correctly then. So we played this group of all-star. Bobby Hurley was there, and we could not guard his little ass in the beginning. Because Magic wasn't a great defender. He couldn't keep him in front of him. So we started scrimmaging. And before we know it, we're down like 20. Chuck calls a timeout. And we're just actually just screwing around. They're all like 17 years old, 18 years old, and we're just joking around. And they're playing like it's game seven. And before we know it, we're down like 20 points, and we're still screwing around. And Chuck says, Chuck calls timeout and says, you guys know if y'all fucking lose this gold medal, it's going to be the biggest upset in sports history. We're like, what? You guys out here jacking around. These college kids kicking your ass. The other team, the foreign team's much better than these guys. And, you know, if you guys come out here jacking around, it's going to be hell to pay for the representing your, your country. And we're like, Okay, guys, let's turn it up a notch and kick these dudes. So we score like 18 straight points to get it to, and Chuck calls to say, game over. We're like, what? No, 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 no. He's like, I said game over. <laughs> and his point was, guys, you don't understand. You're representing your country. You got the greatest team ever assembled. 
But if y'all fucking lose, it's going to be an international deal. And from that point on, we start taking things really, really serious. So no drinking and gambling the rest of the trip? Oh, no, no, we go. Oh, no, God, no. Come on, my God. Come on man. You, know, you, you crazy, my, bitch? Hey, you know, you know, I was reading the other day that well, drinking is really, really bad for you. Yeah. So I quit. Uh, I quit reading. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> I, you're fucking, you're out of your mind. No, no, no. The guy told me a couple good ones the other day. He says, uh, he said he was talking to his wife and he says, baby, I was looking in the mirror and I got a gut. I got wrinkles. My titties are hanging down. <laughs> What do you think? He says, well, your eyes work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. You know, hanging with your crazy friends are the best thing about playing sports. No, There's no. nothing like it. But once we said, okay, let's get this thing done, and it was so crazy because we didn't realize how big we were going to be. When you got older. Like there. as far as the oh, media yeah. circus? No. But, well, not the fans. So, because we, we started out at Torrey Pines, we went to Monte Carlo for a week to practice. I forget what other country we went to, but we just went, they just wanted to make it fun for us. So we get to Barcelona and at our hotel, you couldn't get close to our hotel. The security was so tight. Man, it was 5,000 people out there watching us get on and off the bus every day. It was crazy. It felt like the Beatles. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like they were probably, 50 yards away, and they could only see you for like five to 10 seconds walking. And every time, obviously, Magic, Michael, and Bird were the three biggest stars, but it was three to 5,000 people out there every single day just watching when we go to practice in the morning, when we go to the game. And then driving to the game, they had a police car in front, they had a police car in back. On the side of the bus, each side, they had a, a, a guy, two guys on motorcycles, one guy driving a motorcycle and one guy with a machine gun, and they had a helicopter above the bus. And then along the highway, there were at least 500, couple hundred people to up to 500 every time we went to the game because it was different going to practice. People just holding up signs, standing on the side of the highway. We're like, whoa, this is a big deal. Because like I say, you don't know what to expect going in. But then we're like, yo, man, there's 5,000 people waiting outside our hotel just to get a glimpse of us. And we're like, oh. And then, like I say, just standing on the side of the highway, holding up signs. And then I remember after we... They're like, God, this is a really big deal. And then the game started, and we're like, even though we're winning games like 50, 60, 70, 80 points, they're like, number one watched event in Olympic history. Like, people watching us, and Chuck's like, guys, look at these ratings. We're shouting everybody ever watched the Olympics record. And, we're, and like I say, we're winning by 50, 60, 70 points some of these games. And people over here are still watching. And then we're like, guys, we need to start taking this thing really serious. And from that point on, we just like, we just going to kill everybody. Because like I said, we did not know going in that we were going to win every game by that many points, to be honest with you. We knew we were going to win more than likely. And I think the closest game we ever came was probably 45, 50 points. Yeah, and still that much interest. But like you talk about the salaries now, and 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 part of it is just how big internationally the NBA is. Like that was the beginning of it, right? That was it. But David Stern, who was the best ever commissioner in sports, he admitted later that was really his game plan. He says, because through Nike, we had did a couple things in foreign countries. I'd been to J China, Japan, Germany, things like that. But that was just like me and a couple of Nike guys. But David Stern admitted later the reason he wanted to send pros to the Olympics was to make the game international. And I've had so many young guys say, hey, my first recollection of basketball in yeah. my country was the dream team. That's awesome. Yeah. 
I got, well, just one last one, the dream team. Now, obviously, Leighton was on the team. Famously, Isaiah Thomas wasn't. Was that strictly because MJ didn't want him there and that, and that, but that was it? Because, I mean, was, Chuck Daly was his own coach with the Pistons, and he still wasn't on the team. Yeah, you know what's so crazy about that? That's been a controversy for since 92. And I've said publicly, they never ask us about me personally, about Isaiah. And then Michael, I guess, had lied for 100 years, <laughs> <laughs> saying um, – he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and then the tape came out. Says, well, they got Michael on tape saying he, would, he wouldn't play if Isaiah's on the team. So I guess it's true. But I've, I've always told Isaiah this, because I like Isaiah. The, they never asked. I, and I, I can't speak for other players, to be honest with you. I don't know who they asked. They didn't ask me. But uh, it, 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 I guess Michael didn't want him on the team, plain and simple. Uh, was there any poopy pants of guys? Because, like, obviously playing time is so different. Were there any guys that, like, they were pissed they weren't playing enough? Or was it such a close-knit group? People were cool with not getting the minutes they usually get. You, you, you know, that's a great question because I have two stories. Because I actually played on the first two dream teams. So on the first dream team, Chuck had two starting units. And he says, you guys going to play the first 10? You guys going to play the second 10? And we didn't care uh, about Leitner, to be honest with you. Like, okay. Yeah, college doesn't yeah, count. Yeah, yeah. He said, one well, of you guys ain't going to play a lot one game. And they were like, we're cool. We're cool. Four years later, I wasn't going to play again, to be honest with you. In Atlanta, right? In Atlanta, because it was such a great experience. I said, hey, man, because I tell people this. Ain't nothing like the Olympics. If you like sports, everybody should go to the Olympics one time in their life. It's the coolest thing. Television does not do it justice. Everybody should go to the Olympics one time in their life as a fan. It's unbelievable. So I said, well, I'm not going to play because I want somebody's experience. And then Leonard Wilkins called me. He says, no, we got a bunch of young guys. I don't know how they're going to be. I need to bring you in. I says, okay, you know what? I said, because number one, family and friends couldn't go to Barcelona. My hometown is an hour and a half from here. I'm like, okay, that'll be cool. My mom and everybody can come, blah, 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 blah. And it was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it was a fucking nightmare. It was a cutting it into your gambling. And no, 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 no. <laughs> you you're a babysitter. Ga ga like, guys, like, I'm not getting to play. Why am I not starting? We had a couple. Like, and I was like. Carl you know, Malone didn't start last time. I, I, I was like, wait a minute. I played with fucking the best players that ever played this game. Nobody complained. And you guys are and you're not even that fucking good. <laughs> and y'all complain about starting. You complain about playing time. And so it really bothered me and pissed me off. I says, guys, I played on the greatest team ever assembled. Nobody ever said a thing about starting. Nobody complained about playing time. You represent your fucking country. In your country. Yeah. Because 90% of the time, 99% of the time when you go to the Olympics, you're playing in another country and you can't have a bunch of family and friends there because they can't afford to go there. They, I say, everybody can fly to Atlanta. You represent your country. You probably got all your family and friends here. This is going to be a great experience. You're going to get to fucking get on that medal stand. And, and you guys are complaining about who's playing and who's not. You're not getting enough benefits and you ain't starting. So that was a great question you asked. But it, 92 was not a lot of fun. Now, excuse me, 96 was not a lot of fun. 92 was amazing. Uh, you, you did mention the gambling thing about uh, like you guys would have some crazy hands. What was the craziest hand you ever saw live? And when you talk about these amounts of money, are guys just carrying wads of cash on them? When yeah, we always carry cash. Like always up to what? Like there's always going to be a game. Yeah. There's you... always going to be a game. <laughs> like, like, so are, are you stacking? Like, like, would you have cash on hand right now, ready to go any game you want to play? Oh, yeah. You always got a bunch of cash. Because you know, because like, uh, I'll give you an example. Like, yo, man, we got a 12-hour flight to Monte Carlo. Better bring plenty of money. <laughs> <laughs> What's plenty of money? A couple hundred grand? No, probably a, a hundred grand. And then you saw some pretty pretty crazy ones go down. What was the biggest pot you ever saw? Oh, I don't even remember the big. It was so long ago. But it was like, like I said, you could lose $50,000 a night easily. Any blue light specials? Where like, hey, just give me 30. Or no, you're yeah. collecting every penny. Well, you got to pay your bill. <laughs> there you go. Well, we used to it. do. No, 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 I agree. But NHL, we're, we're, like, we're if cheap. I won a thousand bucks and like the guy was a younger guy, I'd say, "Hey, guy, you know, hey, give me listen, six fifty. Yeah. Lawrence Taylor can't play with us. <laughs> All right, uh, Lawrence Taylor is an interesting guy. <laughs> the football player. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you know, 
every time we play golf, we gamble. And then and we we all pay up except Lawrence. And you know he's fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah. So you gotta be <laughs> careful. And he'd be like, We'll run it back tomorrow. And everybody's like, he is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we can't fucking challenge him. <laughs> like, like everybody else, everybody else is handing out money. He's like, hey, we're running back tomorrow. Everybody's looking around like, we, yeah, we don't even beat. have a tea time. <laughs> you beat. <laughs> no, we like, who's going to challenge this crazy motherfucker? <laughs> like, you guys are playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, 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 yeah. to ask him. If like, Leitner says it, he just gets yeah, bitch slapped. Yeah, yeah, let's, let it, let's let it run back tomorrow. Because <laughs> you're not going to fuck with LT. No. Yes. Well, yeah. you mentioned, um, just quickly, you mentioned playing golf for money. I mean, a legendary golf figure, I'll say. Like, you lost the swing. You were a good player. You lost swing. Now I've seen videos. The yeah, swing look looks great. great again. Has golf always been a big part of the off season for you? Like what happened when, when you lost your game? It's just kind of a crazy story, right? Yeah. You know, I was probably a eight handicap. This is the mid eighties, early nineties. I was a good player, but then I got traded to Phoenix. Got the bug. No, I had to bug. I had to bug, but I wanted to get better. Cause I was like, cause you play, cause you end up, like you don't ever play golf during the winter in Philly because it's cold as shit. <laughs> and then you play all summer, but then you go back to Phoenix, you're like, man, it's seven degrees right now. Let's go play golf. And then guys are just kicking your ass. And so I started taking lessons from every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world. I started standing over the ball. I had like <laughs> eight guys like, <laughs> what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? And I, my brain just locked up for probably 20 some years. And I was standing over the ball and I really, I'm not even joking. Like I had like six, seven guys talking to me. Like, well, he said, take it like this. He said, swing like this and do this. And I lost it. I, mean, I lost it for at least 20 years. And then about four years ago, I was playing in Tom Lehman's charity golf event. And the, one of the best teachers in the world, a guy named Stan Utley. He said, Chuck, won't you let me work with you? I said, Stan, I don't work with I don't everybody. Need no, nobody can, I don't yeah, need nobody nobody can fix this. Yeah, I said, I work with Butch. Yeah. I work with Hank. I don't work with Eric. I like another probably 10, 15 guys tried to fix me. I'm like, yo, man, I, 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 I just play for charity now. It's no fun for me to play. I'm terrified over the fucking golf ball. He said, well, give me a chance, Chuck. And then he, I said, you know what? He was so persistent. He's such a good person. I said, okay, Stan. So then he said, meet me here. And I met him and he says, well, well, tell me what happened. I said, and I told you the same story. I was saying I used to be a good player. I want to get better. I took lessons from everybody. And like, yo, I just lost it. I mean, and I'm terrified over the golf ball. And then he said, let's work. And we start here and he says, I need you to cut everybody off right now. Just listen to my voice. He says, don't think of it. He says, just do what I'm telling you to do. I need you to really concentrate and just hear my voice. It's going to take some time and some effort. And like, I started just hitting some good shots. I wasn't doing it consistently. And he said, let's go to the golf course. I said, well, let's just hit some more balls. He says, are you scared to play golf? I says, what do you mean? He says, you practice how many hours a day? I said, I practice probably four or five hours a day. He said, you're scared to play golf. You're never going to get better playing golf unless you go to the actual fucking golf course. He said, driving range too fucking wide. There's no targets and shit. So then we start gradually going to the golf course. He said, I need you to listen to my voice. Forget the other people. And then after about a month, I started hitting some good shots. And now I'm back down to almost single digits. Unbelievable. Yeah. Thanks to Stan Utley, man. It's crazy. He said, Jay, just think about my voice. Forget those other voices. Huh. But it, it it really saved me because I quit. I was I went from playing probably a hundred fifty times a year to ten to fifteen. You didn't even want to be there. No, because it wasn't no fun, you know. And because you can only drink and smoke so much. Because <laughs> I like smoking cigars on the golf course, and you know, you know, God got a really wicked sick sense of humor. 
I mean, there's a reason. There's no other sport that let a little cute girl drive around and bring you alcohol. Because <laughs> God's like, there's nobody can beat this fucking game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they might as well have some fun while they're out there. <laughs> they, 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 no girl ever pulls up in the first quarter of an NFL game and says, hey, you guys want anything to drink? They never, in the middle of the first quarter of an NBA game, no, no girl ever comes out and says, hey, you need a, you need a refresher or something? <laughs> no, only golf, because you cannot beat golf. I mean, that's like, even when you're watching guys who do it for a living, you're like, they just lose it sometimes. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, so especially, it's just so much fun to be out there. I like to walk. I like just being out there. Because one of the few things where you go and get peace and quiet, you know, I like to golf. I like to fish. I like going to the movies. I always go in the morning with all the old people because they don't bug you. <laughs> because once you get in the limelight, it's hard to ha have time where you're like, well, people, because people think you're out to fucking talk to them. You handle it pretty well, though. Well, you always got to be cordial, but you, it is annoying at times. Yeah, I mean, every time I've seen you, you're so good oh, with I'm strangers. I'm always, yeah. I learned that from Dr. G. I always be cordial. That don't mean it's not fucking annoying. <laughs> when, I, when I'm, is going, that why you got that special he's... Delta thing where they drive you on the tarmac up to the plane, you get on, and then you get off? Oh, yes, I like that. That's unbelievable. How do you get that? You have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Biz is like, I'm out. Well, fuck oh, it. Maybe, shit. maybe, maybe if you lower your salary a little bit, they can afford to <laughs> hey, keep paying their. Hey, no, they, gave, they spent all my money on hockey. <laughs> they spent all my. You'd money. be making forty if it wasn't for the <laughs> NHL coming exactly. back. Uh, I'm glad we got it. Be though. on a max deal. Hey, I, that's right. I can't wait to. So I got to figure out what city, you know, uh, I'm gonna come to for the Stanley Cup Finals. You, That's gonna be awesome. You're gonna come? Oh hell yeah! You I'm should coming. join the broadcast because no, be no, I'm coming as a fan. <laughs> as a fan. Oh, as a yeah. fan. I'm okay. coming as a fan. Well, uh, when when you talk about like what you do now, when did you know playing? Like, or did you even know playing? Like, I'm I'm gonna do this after I'm done. Like, after he did Space and, Jam. <laughs> 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 well, after he was a monster. Uh, 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 you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because uh, Dick Ebersol, who's my mentor, NBC, right? Yes, who ran NBC because our games were on NBC back then. He said, uh, Charles, can I talk to you? I said, sure, what's going on? He says, what do you think about doing television? I says, what do you mean? He says, well, you're going to retire in the next couple of years. He says, I think you would be great on television. And to go back to our original thing we talked about with Dr. J earlier, he says, you're going to be great on TV. He said, you're always going to be in trouble, but you're going to be great on television. I said, what do you mean always in trouble? He says, Charles, people don't want to hear the truth. He says, fans want two things. Tell me my favorite player is great. Tell me my team is going to be good. That's so true. That's all fans want to hear. You tell them their favorite player is overrated or not that good. They hate you. And you tell the people, like, your team's not any good. They hate you. He said, so the way you have constructed your interviews, that's the reason you've been voted best interview for, like, the last 10 years. People know you're going to be honest and a straight shooter. Now, that's going to work on TV. But – you're always going to be putting out fires. Yeah. Like I say, because people are going to come for you. Now, for Biz and I, like we, we were pigeons, right? So it's hard at times. You have to criticize players or you're not doing a good job. I've always thought it would be easier for a guy who's a Hall of Famer, right? Like you have the, the resume and the ability to say, like, this, this guy's playing like shit. Has it been hard, though, like when you're like, I got to be honest, I got to call out Kevin Durant, I got to call out somebody else? Are you like, nope, this is my job. I don't really care how pissed off they get. Well, First of all, you have to – my favorite analyst, believe it or not, is Barry Melrose because he's just a straight shooter. As long as you fair in your criticism, that's all you can do. Like, first of all, fans aren't stupid. Well, some of them are. <laughs> I, I don't want to not neglect that. Some of them are. But they sit there and just watch the game. If you guys get on television or podcast and say, yeah, he didn't play that bad. They're like, no, I just watched him. He played like shit. You're going to lose all your credibility as long as you're fair and honest. Like, I get no joy to saying, that, man, he was awful yeah. tonight. I get no joy out of that. These guys are really part of my family. Like, hockey players are part of your family. But you're doing a disservice to the fans if you don't get on whatever you're speaking on and be honest. And as long as you say to yourself, hey, I was fair, I was honest. But you know what pissed me off the most about this bullshit we do? Motherfuckers have never called me and said, man, he said, he said I was great. They, I can say nine things about a guy great. If I say one thing about a guy, 
I get a call from him of his agent. I said, yo, man, you never fucking called me when I said great things about you. What? Now, 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 you played like shit, and I had to call you out one time. The other nine things I said about you were positive, and now you fucking pissed? That's the only time I ever get mad, to be honest with you. Uh, you said putting out the fires. Like, how many times, especially early on when you did start your TV career, were you getting called into the principal's office? Oh, I, no, 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 no. Not, not, from, not from the principal, from the, the player, uh, from the player or the agent. So there was nothing that early, early days you might have said on television? No, at, I've never got called in by, the, by TNT like that. The, my, when they I never said, asked you, hey, maybe tone it down? No, they, nothing, never. Not one time, Not eh? one time. But like I said, my fires, when I said it, I, I've gotten a million calls, and obviously I'm exaggerating, from players and agents. I remember this one night, Kobe Bryant texted me and called me, motherfucker, you son of a bitch, <laughs> like a hundred times. <laughs> so you remember the infamous game where he didn't – took one shot in the second half against the Phoenix Suns. He was trying to prove a point. He ended up shooting like one time in the second half. They lost to the Suns in a in a seven-game series. Were people calling him selfish for shooting too much no, or something? No, no, no. He was like trying to say – he played a great first half, if I remember correctly, but in the second half, the Suns were just beating him. And he's like, I got no help out here. I'm not even going to try. And I called him out after the game. And he starts texting me. About 2.15 in the morning, calling me, you motherfucker, you son of a bitch, you asshole. I go back and forth. And I said, Kobe, what you, you know how much I love you and respect you. What you did tonight was bullshit, blah, 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 blah. Then he sends me some more, motherfucker, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. I said, Kobe, call me. Fuck you, motherfucker. Uh, I'm not, blah, 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 blah. And this goes on for like three hours. <laughs> At this point, it's like five, six in the morning. You know, we don't get off to two. And, we, and we're texting back and forth. I'm like, yo, man, pick up the phone and call me. I'll explain why I said what I said. And I, I said, yo, man, 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to bed. You should be in the bed, too. And then we saw each other about sometime later. He said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I apologize. You were right. I was wrong. And we buried I said, yo, man, we're good. You were mad in the moment. You know how much I love and respect you. But it was hilarious, though, man. Uh, that was one, That's one of my funniest stories. Like, going... Hey, yo, man, just pick up the phone. Let me talk to you. But <laughs> It's like arguing with your wife on yeah, text. Like, what yeah, are we doing yeah. right now? Yeah, it's like, but when you read, motherfucker, son of a bitch, fuck you all in a row, like, uh, on a text, you just laugh. <laughs> 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 like, uh, I'm talking about Phoenix a little bit. You actually were originally traded to the Lakers, and it was retracted. Is that is that true? They could yeah, pull so back a trade? This, the, not the only drunk game I played. Oh no, it's the only <laughs> no. Hey, it's the only drunk game I ever played. It's not the only hungover game I ever played. It's the only <laughs> drunk game I played. So my agent calls me one morning because I'd had enough of Philly. Because I went two years where everybody was trying to trade for me, and the Sixers wouldn't pull the trigger, and I had to read about it and talk about it every day. I said, "Yo, man, I just want this thing to be over." Blah blah blah. I was just tired mentally. We had our team what did it good. And then finally, my agent calls me and says, Hey, the six is gonna do it. I said, What are we doing? He said, You're going to the Lakers. Uh, I'll call you back when they finalize the deal. I said, Thank God. I want this shit to be over. I've been dealing with it. My family had to deal with it. My friends have to deal with it every day for two years. <laughs> he called and it's, I think it's just right after lunchtime. And we got a game that night. He calls me back like two and a half hours later. So me and my friends go out and celebrate. <laughs> he calls me back like two and a half hours later. He says, Sixers reneged on the deal. It's not going to happen. I said, oh, man, I'm drunk as shit right now. <laughs> we got a game tonight. <laughs> and I said, he says, well, what do you want to do? I says, well, I, I'm going to play. I mean, I got to play. I can't. I want to be professional. And I have zero idea how I played that night. <laughs> I just was so pissed. What was the stat line? Do you remember? I don't remember. I, <laughs> he doesn't I, remember I, who he played against. <laughs> I, I actually don't. Uh, but we had went out. I, I called a couple of my boys. We went out and celebrate. We went to Friday's. Uh, that was a great Friday's restaurant on City Line Avenue, about two blocks of my house. AI Detroit. was there all the time, right? Was that uh, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he took over when I left. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I heard you. Yeah, I heard yeah, you yeah he, took, he took over the, when I left town. But I was like, yo, man. I'm drunk as hell right now. We out celebrating. He says, well, they changed their mind. I'm like, oh, shit. 
uh, going back to the TV stuff, I'm assuming you don't get nervous at all, but you ended up hosting, I think, SNL when you were playing and after you retired now as that's well. that's nerve-wracking. Oh, I was going yeah, yeah. to say that you must have been fucking shitting bricks, man, going on. And then and how many skits did you end up doing? Like, who were the people that made you feel the most comfortable? Like, how, how was that whole experience? It's a really intense thing. I was talking to J.J. Watt about it and Travis Kelsey. It's like the longest week of your life. Monday and Tuesday are pretty easy. So you go in on Monday, you go in a room with like 30 writers and they throw like three ideas each at you. Like, what do you think about this? I'm like, okay, okay. I say okay to everything. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll, they'll. so that's Monday. That takes about four to five hours. That's Monday. So by Tuesday, they have to have the script written. So you sit at a table with what whoever they got in the skit with you, and y'all kind of read it. That takes about six, seven hours. They're like, okay, that's not, that was good. That was not good. Let's don't do that one, blah, blah, blah. Then you have a dinner with the boss, Lauren, and a couple of people he invited. Then starting Wednesday, you rehearse like 12 hours a day. And then Saturday, you rehearse from like 9 o'clock to about 4 o'clock. You get like a two-hour break to rest. Then you do an actual show. In front of a live audience. Just a practice run. To see what they like. But you end up doing probably, this, should, this is longer than a regular show. Because you end up doing like three or four extra skits. And they figure out what people liked. And then you got a, about an hour and a half break. So you all get together and they're like, they laughed at this. They didn't like this. They laughed at this. They didn't like this. Then they piece together the ones that people like. Like I say, they cut probably five skits out. You rehearse five extra skits because you don't know what people are going to like. And then you do the actual show. What's really crazy is there are some times you walk behind this wall and these four ladies just snatch all your clothes off. You're standing there. This is like, what? Yeah. You're standing there because you have like two minutes because all your outfits are Velcroed on. So like sometimes you have like two minutes to get dressed uh, before the next skit starts. So you walk behind this wall. They got four ladies there. They snatch two arms, two legs. You're standing there butt ass naked or with some shorts on. I had to buy underwear because I burned all my underwear like 30 years ago. <laughs> right. So you st- that, that's the only time I buy underwear when I'm hosting Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Chuck goes commando. Yeah, is that yeah. the first time you've ever said that Reggie on any Roach, show? Or? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I burned all my drawings. It was a big fire, too. Uh, <laughs> so you're standing there with just drawers on, and they're Velcroing your next outfit on the lake, and somebody's screaming at you, two minutes, 145, 130, 115, one. And, like, you're halfway done and then they push you out there and you have to be ready to go. But it, it, it's, it's so none of the skits that they pre did where the audience was loving it and you guys like maybe nailed it. They wouldn't have like pre recorded that and then maybe used that. Everything had to be live. Everything's live. Damn. Yeah. That sucks if you executed one and you nailed it and you're like, well, well but you, your nerve, it's really nerve wracking. It's the, uh, the monologue is very nerve wracking. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's the, the hardest part. part. Yeah. That's the yeah. hardest part. And that's how you start your night. So if you fuck that up yeah. off the hop, then you're and it's you're just easier. Your to, it's, it's much easier the second time, but it's still nerve wracking because sometimes w- when they start laughing, you have to fucking stop and let them stop laughing and clapping, and then you have to fucking get back on the teleprompter that's fucking still moving, <laughs> and like you, you don't know how long they're gonna laugh or clap, and you're like. Now you're trying to catch up and you feel like you're doing Evelyn Wood speed reading and shit. Yeah. I mean, but but it, it's it, it's an honor and a privilege to do that. We've had a lot of discussion, um, like on our show about like retirement and and, it, and it's hard for guys. Like you mentioned, it's just the best being around the guys. It's what everyone yeah. misses the most, the locker room. And you had TV. I don't know if you hopped into it right away, but was there ever times for you, a couple of years maybe where, where you missed it so much, where it was like hard mentally once you were retired and out of the game? When you retire, it's really hard mentally because you have nothing to do. It's hard for everybody. And I'm one of the lucky ones because there's not a lot you can do either because you're not going to go get a nine to five. That's out the window. Yep. You can go into television. You can go into coaching and things like that. But it's very difficult because, number one, 
you 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 don't really have a, a formal education. Uh, it's uh, and even if you do have a formal education, what job? It ain't like what job are you gonna go get? You've been out of the. If you had a a, a, a long career, you still been out of the workforce. So you re, so what are you gonna do? And so it, it's a very difficult for every player when they retire. Every player, you just hope that you played long enough that the team likes you or somebody in the business like you so they can give you a hand and like keep you in the sport. That's that's the perfect scenario. But for most guys, you become an owl, as I call it. And you have money, which is like yeah, bad in yeah, a sense. Yeah, but they'll be like, when I call it an owl thing, it's like, Charles who? Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, every player goes through that. Like, they call you, like, you, they're like, who? Who are you? Uh, we call it the owl syndrome. Like, my friends call me sometimes, like, yo, man, can you help me get some Nike shoes? I like, yo, man, you can't get those Nike shoes? They're like, dude, I'm in the owl category now. They're like, James who? <laughs> and I says, and I, and, but we all become owls, most of us. But if you're lucky, because I always tell people one thing about sports. If you're not an asshole and you're a good dude, you know what? Let's help him get a job in the business. He's going to be great for the business. People going to like being around him. Like, but you also know guys on the other side of the spectrum like, Yo, yeah, 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 man. The day you're not good at basketball, you're screwed. Yeah. They ain't not want your ass around. They only kept you around because you were good at it. But you've been an asshole the whole time and you gone. The day your ass can't play, you history. We don't even want you coming around anymore. So I've seen it work both ways. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to the SNL real quick, uh, the first time you hosted, Nir Nirvana was the musical guest, right? No way. So, did you party with those guys at all? I tell you what's crazy about that. I had no fucking idea who they were. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, they were really nice. They were really nice and awesome. But what's really funny, if you ever been to SNL and still like this today, it's in a little dumpy building. The the lock the dressing rooms are about the the space of me and biz. So. Every time they open up their locker room, that they dressing room door, it was like one of those big. You ever seen one of those atomic bomb flumes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a flume of pot that yeah. rushed into my locker room. But I had friends coming by like at midweek. Says, "Yeah, we don't have to spend money on pot. We just have to wait for them to open their door <laughs> and, and, and get a contact high." I mean, they, they were so nice. And I remember my friends, yo, man, they're like the most popular group in the world. I'm like, yo, man, I, I, I don't know them. Uh, that's not my type of music. Yeah, but what they, were you listening to? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm back to uh, Luther Vandross. Oh. Uh, I'm in that demographic back then, dude. But uh, I don't, I'm not a, a grunge guy. But, but people are telling me, they're like, oh, dude, they're the shit right now. They're like the number one band in the country. I'm like, well, they were very nice. I remember meeting Kurt Cobain, Courtney Love, and but they were they were awesome. But man, but it was so funny. Every time they opened up their door, I was like, <laughs> contact high. Perfect. Got yeah. lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they were awesome. Uh, huh, interesting. Who does that? Well, whether SNL or not, the best impersonation of you and well, the most terrible. Frank Caliendo. Oh yeah. He can do everyone, right? He can. Oh, yeah. I remember this phone call I got. Uh, from my agent. He says, uh, hey, John Madden want to talk to you. I'm like, ooh, that's cool. I said, well, give him my number. He called me. He says, Mr. Barkley, Mr. Madden. I said, hey, I said, hey you're the best. It's an honor and a privilege. He says, well, thank you, blah, blah, blah. He says, hey, I want to talk to you about a lawsuit I'm thinking about filing because this asshole Frank Caliendo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? He says, this asshole, have you seen impersonation of? I says, yes, I have. He's like, I hate it, and I'm thinking about filing a lawsuit. And I was like, Mr. Matt, I don't even know how to say this to you. Like, you don't consider that flattering? He's like, he's like no, I don't consider it. I'm like, and now I got like, I don't want to insult John Madden. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, let me talk to my agent and my representation, and let, and I'll get back to you. And I never called him back <laughs> because, like, I was like, I'm not getting through to him. Because, uh, like, I can consider it flattering, and and I know Frank a little bit because he lives in Arizona, and I've seen it in person. 
I see it on television. I think he do a fantastic job. But John was not having it. Wow. Huh. He was not having it at all. Well, you mentioned some of these like like current players like would text you or get mad at you. I mean, I, I think Kevin Durant fires back at you sometimes. Like, like, were you that player when maybe you were getting criticized? Would you go after some of the media members or guys if they said something to you? No, because Dr. J said some. I remember the first time I actually went to him and said, Doc, this, this guy wrote this article about me. And I don't like it. I, I, and blah, blah, blah. He says, well, let me ask you a question. Is the article fair? I said, what do you mean? He said, before you automatically go at somebody, the first question you got to ask yourself, is it a fair criticism? I was like, wow, I never thought about it like that. I said, okay. Okay, you know what? I'm going to think about it differently. Uh, so I don't randomly, I, I very seldom have went out to report. I go out to Skip Bayless because I don't like him yeah. at all. And I just like fucking with him because he's so sensitive and shit. Uh, <laughs> but I think as a player, the first thing you, you, and I don't mind a player coming at me, but the first thing, instead of just automatically assuming the guy don't like you or he's wrong, you, the first thing I learned from Doc, he said, just ask yourself, is the criticism fair? And uh, so I know you guys asked me a question earlier. I have never criticized a player personally. I stick strictly to his job. And when a guy plays bad, you look, first of all, you look like you look really bad if you get on TV or radio or podcast or whatever and you say a guy didn't, if you, if you if played awful and you get on it. And, and that's another thing I don't like about Skip Bayless. There's two things I don't like about him. Number one, he has a double standard for guys he likes and dislikes. If two guys do the same thing, you got to be fair, even if you like a guy. But also, he brags about it when he gets it right. Like, he'll get two out of five right. He brags about the two instead of saying the three he got wrong. And see, I, I, I hate guys like that. Like, in our job, Sometimes you get them right. Sometimes that's not a person in the world picked the Panthers to beat the Bruins. That's not a single person. And let me tell you something. I'm pretty sure that's not a single person picked the Panthers to beat the Maple Leafs. I sure didn't on either one of those fronts. And I'm just a fan who bet. But if you did get it right and you missed another six series, don't brag about the one. <laughs> I'm the only person had the Panthers beating the Bruins. I got to stop doing that, eh, boys? <laughs> well, RA is a future on everyone. Yeah, I, so I have the worst predictions on the pod, so that wouldn't be me. Going All of our my... predictions are tough. Yeah, yeah but, but, but see, I never look at it like that. There's a team that's supposed to win. Now, if they play like shit, we can't factor that in. Like, wait a minute. Every single person in the world picked the Bruins to win that series. You don't have to feel bad. Yeah. And let me tell you something. As a fan, I thought Toronto was going to win the next series. First of all, what's crazy, Vegas did too. Yeah. They showed the stats. After the first round of the playoffs, the two favorites, the next two favorites, the Maple Leafs and the Oilers, after the first round of the playoffs. And now, clearly, the Oilers obviously is still alive, but the Maple Leafs are dead. You don't think they're coming back? Uh, that's not a good chance when you're down 3 zip. <laughs> There's four, four teams in the history of the yeah. NHL have done it. Toronto, in the cup finals, they did it. That uh, was in the 70s. That was, no, no, that was, that was, that was in the like 40s. The 20s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the what now? The 40s. Yeah. Yeah. The 40s? Well, <laughs> when did the Islanders do it? The Islanders did it in 75. 75. Yeah. The, the Bruins, the Flyers did it to the Bruins in 2010, and the Kings, Kings did it in 2014. The Kings went on to win. It was the first round, I think, in yeah. San Jose. In San Jose. Yeah, so, but, yeah, they're dead, like, yeah, like yeah. you said. I got a question just because like all the legendary things that have happened to you, the the ad campaign, like I'm not a role model, yeah. right? Like wh whose idea was that? How did that come about? Was that for Converse or what? Nike. What, okay, that was Nike. Sorry. What what was the idea behind that? I mean, it was pretty, pretty incredible to look back at it now. You know what's so crazy about that? When I went to Nike, so, you know, you, you know, you do a lot of speaking at different schools and things like that. And I noticed that the young black kids all thought they could only be successful through sports. And I was like, cause I was going to predominantly black schools and then going to white schools. 
in the white school, I said, well, what do you want to do? They're like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer, a teacher, fireman, things like that. I was like, oh, cool. And then when I would go to the predominantly black schools, I said, what do you want to do? Like 99% of them like, I want to play sports. I want to play sports. I said, what about being a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, a teacher, fireman, police, or something like that? And then after a few years, I realized these kids think they can only be successful through athletics. So I went to Nike. I said, hey, I got this idea. I want to do this. They're like, are you fucking nuts? <laughs> I says, I says, what do you mean? They're like, you're going to get crushed. I says, what I'm going to do is start a debate about yeah. what a role model is, and it's going to work out in the long run. Nike says, this is a bad fucking idea. This is a bad fucking idea. I said, if you want to do it, I said, yo, man, I play in Philadelphia. I thought sometime my middle name was Charles Barkley, you motherfucker. Hey. <laughs> A few more people cursing me out ain't going to be like, hey, <laughs> I have to be like, hello. And I made the commercial, and obviously it tore up the internet in the world. I don't even know if we had internet back then, in fairness, but I knew it, would t- it took over every talk show in the country and blah, blah, blah. And I did what I wanted to do, start a debate, because I wanted to get my point out about, I tell these young black kids, hey, man, you can be a doctor. You can, first of all, you got a better chance of being a doctor than a lawyer than playing in the NBA or any pro sport. And it got my point across. And in fairness to Nike, they came back to me in a year and says, 95% of our letters we got were so positive about your commercial. No way. Oh, yeah. They says, even though we thought you were crazy as fuck, <laughs> they said, listen, it's the most positive response we've ever gotten on any commercial we ever did. And like I said, I was just trying to provoke a debate because I thought it was really, I want young black kids like, yo, man, first of all, you ain't going to play in the NBA. You ain't going to play in the NHL. You're not going to play in the NFL, uh, NBA. But you got to, you can be a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, and teacher, things like that. And I've still, even to this day, I had people saying, thank you for making a role model commercial. Yeah. Awesome. I, wrote, I wrote a college paper on it. It was like 93, no I think. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 And I, I agree with you. Basically, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have your kids looking up to athletes. You yeah. know, they should be come from the community yeah. or whatever. But hey, yeah, you could, well, first of all, you don't, we don't. You, first of all, you're not going to be a pro athlete more than likely. Right, right. It's yeah. like hitting the lottery. Or well, it's probably, I mean. More than It's that. more. Yeah, it's probably worse to the odds are worse. But like, no, nah, man, think about being something else important and significant. You mentioned uh, part of it, like you said you uh, played in Philly and you would face a lot of criticism, like people would yes. yell stuff at you. I want, I want to say Talk told me this story. He goes, ask him about this crazy. And there's a funny quote at the end where, like you were at a bar or something and like some fan like spit at you. Yeah. And then you ended up pushing him out a window or, or, yeah. and then, <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you tell the story and then like the famous quote and, and, uh, at the- yeah. Well, so I'm at a bar one night and, uh, the owner says, why don't you guys wait till we get rid of everybody? I'm with like three teammates and a couple of chicks. And we're sitting in the back of the bar and the guy says like, uh, why don't you guys just stay here until everybody leaves. I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. It's going to be traffic outside and hectic. So we're sitting there, and I actually got my back to the situation. And all of a sudden, we get wet. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? And Clyde Drexler says to me, that dude threw a drink on us. Oh. And I was like, what? And I turn around, this motherfucker starts running. And I chase him through the bar. Thank God was nobody in there. So I got that motherfucker pretty quick. <laughs> then we get to the front door. And it's one of those bars that's got the big window. And I'm shaking this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck was you throw a drink on me for? What the fuck you throw a drink on me for? And I said, I don't even give a fuck why you threw it. And I just rammed his ass through the window. Yeah, so he didn't spit on you. <laughs> he threw a drink. Yeah, yeah, yes. And I fucking, then the cop says, Charles, I saw that. I got to arrest you. <laughs> and um, I got arrested that night. And my other funny story Talk said you you guys went, it, it, did it go to court? Oh, yeah. And then you were, oh, yeah. The judge says, Mr. Bark, you have any regrets? I said, yeah, I regret we were on the first floor. <laughs> <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> motherfucker threw a drink on me. I wish we were on the fucking balcony. <laughs> what city was this in? Philly? Uh, Orlando. Oh, shit. It's Orlando. Yeah, I regret we weren't uh, on the third uh, floor. Yeah, I, yeah, I regret we were on the first floor. <laughs> did he start so snickering? Yeah, yeah, he did. So my other story, <laughs> so we're playing in Milwaukee. And two of my great friends are Larry Kristowiak and Frank Brikowski. So we go to a place, I think it's called Rosie's. 
Uh, we having a great time, and we still fly commercially. And so we got like a six thirty flight in town, out of town. So we go there, and we go to the bar. We got like two hours before we got to leave for the airport. Frank said, "Man, I live right up the street. Why don't you come over and have a couple more drinks? If you're not going to bed, I said, good idea. You go to bed sometime, sleep for an hour. You're gonna be tired, more tired. So he said, once you ride with my wife, uh, it's okay." So it's, we go outside. It's a fucking blizzard. It's cold as shit. So we start walking. And she said, I parked like two blocks away. I said, okay, no problem. So we're walking. And be as I could, it's quiet. It's just snowing like a mother. But I could hear a noise. I couldn't tell what it was, but I could hear a noise. So I said, hey, we need to speed up. She said, okay. We see speed up. And then I could hear is people running. And I said, uh, this shit ain't good. Nobody should be running this time of night. Before I know it, these three weightlifters up on, on me. And I turn around. I says, excuse me? They're like, we're going to kick your ass. And I'm like, why? We don't fucking like you. And I says, I don't even know you motherfuckers. Why y'all going to fuck with me? And I said, we don't fucking like you. So then I'm thinking like, oh, shit, I'm going to get my ass whooped right now. So I'm saying to myself, Shit, I don't even know what to do right now. And these dudes are right in my, the one, one's right in my grill, the one's right, they, the other two stand right behind. And I said to myself, okay, I got to do something. So I said, I, I got to make these motherfuckers think I'm crazy. So I started taking my clothes off. So I take my shoes and socks off, take my jacket off, I take my shirt off. Then I start doing karate kid shit. Wipe on, wipe off. <laughs> wipe on. So, so I do it the first time. Nothing happened. I do it the second time. I'm fucking freezing too. <laughs> I do it two more times. And the two dudes back up. There's one motherfucker still in my grill. I says, well, Chuck, this is your moment right now. You got to make your move. So I did the wipe off thing one time. And I ran back, hit this motherfucker as hard as you can hit a person. This motherfucker went back. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? You just hit me. <laughs> He's on the ground bleeding. And I said, yeah, motherfucker, there's plenty more where this came from. And then the other dude's like, hey, man, this motherfucker's crazy. Let's leave him the fuck alone. And so I go back to the hotel. I say, hey, just drop me off at the hotel. I'm not in the mood to drink right now. And about 30 minutes later, this is my coach. He said, Charles, what the fuck did you do to Come on, 30 minutes later? Oh, yeah, it's the cops. It's the coach, it's the coach with the cops. He says, cops say uh, they're here to arrest you. I said, for what? They're like, this fan said you're in a bad mood because y'all lost and you punched him. I said, coach, oh, that's shit. not what happened. So they take me to jail that night. And then the thing that's funny, these three guys, these fucking muscle heads, they come into court nice in suits and shit, lying. I wish just Judah had been there. And like, yeah, we just walked up to him, asked him for an autograph. No way. He was in a bad mood because they had lost a game the night before, and he just hauled off and slugged my friend. These dudes get up in. So, so then the girl gets on stand. She says, that's not what happened. So she tells the story. And then th we got lucky. There was a guy in the parking garage who saw it also. He says, yeah, I saw this black guy get naked in the snow, and he was <laughs> – <laughs> Doing some crazy karate stuff. And the judge says, hey, man, y'all just get out of my courtroom. And that was the end of it. But it was crazy, man. I, I was thinking, like, I'm going to get my ass whooped. And that lets you know how long ago, because I I just happened to sit, I guess I had just watched the Karate Kid. I was doing yeah. the wipe, wipe on, yeah, wipe yeah, off. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Miyagi. Uh, Mr. Miyagi. Yeah. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, what's it, Ralph Maggio? Yeah, Ralph Maggio. Hey, thank Marie, you for yeah. that. Oh, my God. He's that was a movie guy. I'm surprised you haven't brought up The Simpsons yet. That Charles is. Oh, oh do, yeah. Do, do you know what, what part he played in The Simpsons? God, do you that remember? Was, that had to be 30, do you know? 30 years ago, no. too. Oh, you were in The Simpsons pretty recently. Really? Yeah. I my, did not know my, that. My buddy texted me to ask you about it, but I got my phone yeah, right Yeah, because I, I mean, I haven't watched The Simpsons. I haven't watched them much the last 20 oh, years. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't either. When that what, thing first started, I watched oh, it. Oh, man, the first, those first eight, 10 seasons. Oh, I mean, my some God. Of the best it was television. crazy. It was it just was, poking yeah. fun at society. Yes. Yeah. And it needs to be poked. Oh, very much yes. so. Very much so. But well, you brought the movies up. Are you will you, will you watch anything, or do you have certain like categories of movies you watch? Or you no. Put anything so on? so I, I'm a big movie guy, and I think it's 
like there's not a lot you can do because I'm a one. I get sick of like you got to get out. Like I don't want to be one of those stars who like stay at his house the whole time. And I figured out the reason I love golf, love fishing, like nobody fucking bothers you. But the one thing I figured out was, and I always go in the morning. Like old old people are the best. They don't ever fucking bother you. Uh, so I always go at like eleven o'clock uh, before the, the riff raff and everybody gone. But I but I love movies. That that's. That's like one of the most peaceful things in the world to me is movies. Yeah, it's all it's gotten tough the last few years, like you said. The crowds. Uh, yeah, I just it, started going again. Uh, I I just saw. Uh, I guess the first movie I saw in like probably three years was Maverick. Uh, oh, I, I was I, so I, good. Yeah, I just saw um, Air last week. How is Air? It's great. Yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. was it was really weird. So they talked about me and most of the movie. <laughs> and and uh, we, we actually had Ben Affleck on the podcast. And <laughs> he was saying, yeah, we put you a little nice surprise uh, in the movie. And I know and Ernest says, can I please tell him? And Ben says, you don't want him to see the movie for himself? And Ernest said, nope. I just want to see the expression on his face. So there's a line in the movie that says, nobody want to see Charles Barkley on television. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started laughing. I was laughing my ass off. And because, you know, they, in the movie, Sonny, he says, we got $250,000. I want to spend it on three guys. He says, I can't get Jordan because he's going to Adidas. I like Barkley, Sam Perkins. And then one guy says, I like Melvin Turpin. And <laughs> Sonny says, tell me one thing about Melvin Turpin. <laughs> and the guy's like, He's a good guy. He said, you ever fucking met him? No. He says, well, tell me why you like Melvin. I mean, it, it, like, I guess uh, to be in that room, because I'm in it, uh, that's my thing. Because me and Michael, Michael went to Nike together. But to see how the, everything really, really went down. And he says, I want to spend the whole $250,000 on Michael Jordan. He says, no. I said, and uh, Phil Knight. Ben Pooh plays fair night. And I says, no, I said I wanted three fucking guys. He says, well, I'll try to find two other guys. He said, well, you need to find three because we're not going to get Michael Jordan. He's going to uh, Adidas, as they <laughs> call it in the movie. <laughs> but it's a really good movie. But it was really fun to see how it went behind the scenes. Is it accurate? Yes. Nice. Oh, yes. Looking Very accurate. That. Yeah, I think it hits uh, streaming next week, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And it's what was really cool how smart Michael and his family were because – Michael wasn't, he was, he only took the meeting uh, because of George Raveling and things like that. And then he, when he called Sonny and said, um, Michael's going to sign with Nike, but he'll take the 250, but he wants a percentage of each shoe sold. He says, no, we don't do it like that in this business. He says, and they had this really back and forth. He says, we all need to change that. He said, well, and he's like, he's saying, like, we've never done that and no company's going to do that. And uh, finally, he, he went to Phil Knight and he says, you really believe in this guy? I mean, obviously, and it just, then they showed the numbers. Michael makes $400 million a year from Nike. I mean, it's Same. crazy. That's a, that's a pretty good deal. I, 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 we can't thank you enough for all this, but no, I do. No, we, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted ask to, one we, last one. I just, yeah, I wanted to ask about. Um, you have a show starting pretty soon, I think, with with Gail King, yep. King Charles, yeah, King Charles. Great name for a show, and like you mentioned, right? You've always just been a part of basketball. It's tough to find anything when you're done playing, not involved with basketball, and this is totally stepping out into. I'm not gonna say politics, but just what's going uh, on in the world. Like, yeah, it, well, so I'm just doing a favor for the company. Okay. I did not want to be on TV more, and neither did Gail. Because they said, I said, I don't want to be on TV anymore. I want to be on TV less. And they're like, would you do it with Gail? I says, I love Gail. I would consider it with Gail. And Gail, me and Gail got together. I said, Gail, I don't want to be on fucking TV. She said, I don't want to be on TV either. She says, but I would consider doing it with you. I said, well, I would consider doing it with you. And I said, one day a week at the most. She says, perfect. And because, uh, like, we're in last place. That's not good. Yeah. So I'm just trying to do a favor for the company. One day a week, probably going to be 10 to 15 shows. 
going to be on a Wednesday night in New York because Gail's got a real job. She's best friend, yeah. good friends with Oprah too. Oh, so they, they have a great uh, background and yes, just yes. being able to get everything and, out of people. And, and like I say, I'm just trying to do our team a favor. I'm I'm not even getting paid for it. I just hate that we're in last place. Uh, but like I say, I want to be a team player. Listen, they've been fair to me. They've been great to me, uh, TNT. Uh, this is my 23rd year. I'm going to stay a couple more years. Uh, I just turned 60, which is fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe that. Nuts. You don't look any different. Uh, you look the yeah. same. Well, I'm getting in shape now. I'm down 55 pounds. Good for you. I gained 90. Well, I start quit, quit lying. I gained a hundred pounds. <laughs> I gained a hundred pounds when I got my new hips. So now, uh, I, I my doctor told me, "Hey, it ain't no fat old people. It's only fat young people." So I started doing a drug called Manjuro and working out, and I'm down fifty five pounds. Can't get to my plan weight, which is two fifty. So me and my doctor are gonna get to two seventy. That's the goal. Yes. Uh, I started this diet at 352. I was a fat old fuck. <laughs> and I just weighed in at 295. So I want to get to 270. And I'll feel really good and healthy at that point. Last thing I was just going to end with, well, at least for me, was just like you talk about being blessed. Like you said, 23 years with TNT, getting to work with Shaq or Ernie. And, well, that's, and, those are not blessings. <laughs> <laughs> Working with Shaq. No, you know, like, I would say it is just because like no, a, no, no, not, amazing no, 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 not the, not the show is the easiest part. Oh, is it? To be blessed enough to dribble a stupid basketball. Everything in my life is because of basketball. That's the blessing and the lucky part. I mean, growing up in a small town of a couple thousand people, and because of this little orange ball, I've been around the world. I've, I, it, the people I've met is crazy. I mean, to, 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 to I, I mean, it's, sometimes you have to pinch yourself. Like Obama. Like, you know, the yes, goes, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Like, and like, there, I got a great picture in my condo. Uh, when I went to the White House, they interviewed President Obama. And there's a picture of us standing in the Oval Office, and they didn't even tell me, because I guess the president has a, a camera person with him all the time, just taking pictures that you don't even know here around. He's so secretive. Yeah. And there's a picture of me standing in the Oval Office. And I remember all my friends calling me like, yo, man, this is crazy. A friend of ours standing in the White House in the Oval Office with a, with a president. And like, they're like, it's unbelievable the shit I've done in my life. And uh, I've been to the Olympics twice, represent my country. It's amazing. It's been a, a crazy, amazing journey. Now, the television is just icing on the cake. It just makes sure I go my whole life without working. <laughs> but to play in the NBA for 16 years and th that stuff is just so amazing and crazy. Crazy. I got one or two more here. Like you just mentioned you turned 60. I, I was reading you were the, the first black baby born at this particular hospital at the time during segregation. Of yeah. The, the, the ass end of it. You know, nine months later, JFK gets assassinated. Then MLK, RFK kind of rolls into Watergate in Vietnam. How would you compare sort of that era to where, where we are in America right now? Do you think it's it's worse or was it worse back then? Well, clearly it was worse back then. Uh, not that I know because I was too young. But you think about it, like we couldn't uh, if I I couldn't have been in this hotel. Back then, we would have had to go to separate restaurants. That's crazy and stupid to even think about. Right. The so civil rights stuff is really important and significant to me for the number one, because it's important, but also where I grew up. You know, I grew up in Birmingham, uh, right outside of Birmingham. So you, you talk about the church bombing and the year I was born in 1963. You think about the Montgomery boycott. You think about the Selma massacre, all those within a couple hours of my hometown. So all those things are really important and significant. But I, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't say things were, are they 100% better? No, but they are a lot better. But we always need to keep working to make things better for everybody because, you know, a lot of people like to talk about race. Racism exists, always has, and unfortunately always will. But the biggest problem we have in this country is, is economic economics. Uh, being poor is you at a really huge disadvantage. 
Uh, if you're born poor in this country, you're going to be in a shit neighborhood more than likely. You're going to be in a shit school more than likely. So I always use this analogy. If you got two strikes against you, yeah, every now and then you're going to get a hit. If you always step up to the plate and you got two strikes against you. But it's hard to get a hit if you step up there and you're 0 for 2. But that's the thing. We got to really do a better job of giving poor people economic opportunity. We can't put them in the ghetto or the hood and say, hey, put you in an inferior school and say, good luck. That's really unfair. Uh, I guess one last one, too. We've been hearing about Snoop's interest in buying the Sens. Do you think there are more black folks watching hockey now than, say, 30 years ago or when you started watching back in Philly? Well, I think the biggest problem with hockey is it's just really – hasn't really, they've done a really poor job of putting it on television. Mm -hmm. They re never really showed the NHL. Uh, I think we're doing a better job. I think ESPN needs to do a better job. I mean, they don't make a big deal out of it until the playoffs. I mean, you got basketball on. We're on Tuesday. They're on ESPN Wednesday. We're on Thursday. They're on ESPN on Friday. So they're on four days a week. I'm trying to think. Uh, hockey's not on enough during the, during the regular season. I mean, and think about it. You look at hockey today. Let's take Edmonton. You got Drysaddle and McDavid. You got Matthews up in Canada. This boy Kachuk down in Florida is rolling right now. The Devils, you got Hughes, who's a stud. You know, I even watched the uh, I watched the lottery last night to see who's gonna get Bedard. There we go, <laughs> love it. What you did know, you think of that? You, 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 a little shady? Were you pissed the Coyotes didn't get the first pick? They were not, dude. We got a thirty five hundred seat arena. We wasn't gonna get him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we got thirty five. No, no. I think it was great for the NHL. Whether it was rigged or not, that's another debate. Uh, because Chicago is a a major, major city. I'm pretty sure they wanted him in a big city in the United States. Like Columbus? Uh, that Columbus is not <laughs> going to get it done. <laughs> but, I mean, you got to understand, we're, this is a business. To have him, no disrespect to Anaheim, Columbus, Arizona, it's probably not the best avenue for a guy who we think going to be the next big thing. When the Blackhawks were in their heyday with Taze and Kane and those guys winning three Stanley Cups. That was a big deal. We need Chicago. Like, right now, the NBA is better when the Knicks are doing great. Yeah. The NBA is better when the Celtics do great. Same thing with the Lakers. Whether fans want to admit it or not, you know, it, sports are better when the big teams are doing better. Plain and simple. Well, we can't. We can't. This, this is unbelievable. Play. This yeah. is we really appreciate. No, it. No, man. I, listen, I, uh, I want to thank you all for having me. Keep up the great work. Biz is my guy. I appreciate uh, yeah, you. Stay been on so, Biz. You've yeah. been stay so on this guy. Yeah, you gotta, yeah, take me under your wing here because I, I I've been called into the principal's office a couple times, so <laughs> I got I got to keep on the straight and narrow, Chuck. Hey, brother. As long as they keep paying you, you're doing all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, of course, awesome. brother. Thank course. you so much, Chuck. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it, it brother. It was an honor, pal. This interview is brought to you by Chevy. You know that we've been a big part of the Chevy EV family, but we've got some big news. The first ever all-electric Silverado is officially Barstool's most valuable truck. The Silverado truck forever has just been a horse, a beast, and now you can get it in the EV mode. We got the chance to see this thing and experience it, and it's a complete game changer. I, I really want to get one. It's available 400-mile range, GM estimated on a full charge, over 10 feet of length in the bed with the multi-flex tailgate combined with the multi-flex midgate, a large 17-inch di di diagonal display screen. 17 inches, that's enormous. It's a monster screen. It could tow up to 10,000 pounds of max towing. 0 to 60 in under 4.5 seconds with the wow mode and up to an impressive 785 pounds of torque. You think of trucks, you think of beasts, and then you think, wow, EV? Electric truck? Yup, it works. Head on over to Chevy.com to learn more. Chevy.com to learn more about the Silverado EV right now. Chevy.com, learn about it, get involved.
Man, huge thanks to Charles Barkley for coming on. Just an awesome interview. Hopefully you, you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed doing it, Biz. Thanks a bunch for getting him on. It was uh, spectacular. I might have to stalk him in Boston this week. He's going to be up here for the uh, Eastern Conference Finals. Oh, group, yeah, so. just what we need. He'll never come back on the podcast. <laughs> I mean, the we- was better than you. Uh. So, uh, anyways, we got to wrap hey, I up. Got, I found that paper I wrote. I found that. Get this fucking guy away from me. Uh, I do get it stashed somewhere. It's just not in this place. But anyways, we're going to talk about... Uh, Dallas, Seattle, that just finished. A couple of previews. And our boy, we had Merle's earlier. And now we have the other half of game notes. Colby Armstrong, Ami, the Arm Dog. Thanks for joining us, pal. Yeah, awesome to be on with you guys. Yeah, me and Merle's, the old uh, game notes daily squad. We went halvesies, you know? Yeah. We went halvesies. So. Yeah, a little, there you go. little nice. swap there you go. of the spit. And, yeah, and like a little one dessert in. for it. <laughs> <laughs> a little dessert, tasty little hey, dessert you know what's, We couldn't handle you guys together. Hey, you know what's crazy, though, Army, is we were talking about it. The old shit sandwich grenade, all these flicks that these teams are putting in the neutral zone. We, you could call it punting. We're trying to think of a funny new name for it, kind of like we call it the mixer. But sure enough, is that first goal by Dallas tonight was a flick in the neutral zone. Who who ended up sending it out? Lindell? Just airmailed it. Was it Lindell? I, I could see him doing it. I mean. And then Alexiak. I, I, I just can't believe Singer. how Alexiak played it. <laughs> That's what he they looked do, like though. he didn't want to play it. Oh, and then uh, he was uh, like, oh, shit. Easy from the couch. That's like with with especially if you see hints flying at you. He's like McDavid. He, that guy might be top five fastest in the league, and I I think you just have to straight up whack it off like against the boards at the bench. It goes in the bench. Sorry, boys. Like I wasn't playing around with that one at center ice. I don't think I think you got it in that situation because if you go back and watch it, he started in his own end. He wound it up in front of his bench and like he timed it perfectly to get there. It was like it's like in rugby or something, you know, when they kick one and. I don't know. It's just like the perfect timing. He met it as he just started to bumble. You got to like commit like a, like a shortstop, like that has to get down in front of that bomb line drive and like, just block it down. You've got to like, you've got to eat it and you know, he's coming at you. You just got to go down in front of it and just make sure you smother the puck. You're going to get nailed. Like, like a guy catching a kickoff in the NFL that they don't allow anymore. He's kicking XFL style. Just XFL style. face in. You got to take the face cave. The XFL's in back. They just had their championship the other day or something. I kind of yeah, missed the really? whole season, but uh, what are those called that? when you call for the f- oh fair? Yeah, no fair, fair catch, catches yeah. allowed. Yeah. The XFL, no, yeah. no fair yeah. catches. Well, I'm pretty sure catch. he tried to stick handle it though. Yeah, yeah he, like, double it looked like that to me. Yeah, he just got his pocket picked. I think you know, like it was a, it was a nice you, play. And, by and him. then you see that speed coming out, and your your arsehole puckers up about this tight, and the next thing you know, you blink and he's gone. And just to uh, get the listeners updated, we just finished Unreal Goalie Battle Game 7, Ottinger Grubau. Just a phenomenal battle. Went down to the wire. Uh, Dallas had a two-goal lead all game. Seattle scores were like, like 19 seconds left. Then they caught the face-off off in the offensive zone. Made it a real nail-biter, but uh, Ottinger was slightly better. So Dallas marches on. They're going to meet Vegas in the Western Conference Finals. And Biz, we were just talking a second ago. Uh, Pete DeBoer now 7-0 and in Game 7s as a coach. And interestingly, He's been the coach of five teams. Uh, four of those teams he's taken to the conference finals all four times. He took them in their first season. Uh, in San Jose, he actually did twice. His first and, year coaching them? Yeah, first year. The four teams he's taken to the conference finals. Yeah, uh, San Jose, New Jersey, obviously Dallas tonight, and uh, who's the other one? Uh, Vegas. Uh, escape me. Vegas, yeah. All four, his very first season. And of course, he took San Jose back again. And now he's going to face the team that shit canned him last year. So, uh, Pete DeBoer, man, uh, game seven genius, eh, Biz? Yeah, yeah, I would say they remained patient, yet they still, I felt that they generated a little bit more in the first two periods. I thought Grubauer was tremendous through two periods. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, it, it, it all came down to that flick play, and that's what got them ahead. But I feel like that was the tail of the series. Although it went to seven, uh, Seattle had a really hard time generating inside the house credit Dallas and they play their structure the way how hard their D box out and they play in front of Ottinger along with his play and I think if you look throughout the course of the entire series as far as high danger scoring chances and the way that each team was able to generate I would say that Dallas was up two to one and on top of that you mix in the unbelievable goaltending of Ottinger and they just couldn't generate enough offense and and credit to the better team overall I thought that Dallas was the better team Originally, I thought after Vegas had advanced, I wanted to see the two expansion teams go head to head. But after watching game seven, I'm like, no, the right team won. And I'm actually excited to see way more excited to see Dallas go against Vegas because I feel like they're both 
a little bit more physical, a little bit more brutal. And I have the feeling I could get even nastier than the, the series against Edmonton. And I think that that's all, that's what we all want. We want some fucking cre- smash mouth hockey. Yeah. It, some Western conference hockey. It's our first, I believe uh, all Sunbelt final four, you Dallas, Vegas, Carolina and Raleigh, and then, you know, Florida and Sunrays, all, all like Southern states or su- sunny states as you will. And just to piggyback on the DeBoer stuff, this uh, Jay Fresh hockey we, we talk about, Pete DeBoer, hired by New Jersey in 2011, goes from missing playoffs to cup final. Hired by San Jose in 2015, goes from missing playoffs to cup final. Hired by Vegas in 2019, goes from first round game seven OT exit to conference final. Hired by Dallas in 2022, goes from first round game seven OT exit to conference final once again. So just a uh, fixer. Unreal, unreal boost this guy this guy gives, but uh, let's see what the Wit Dog has on this game. I know you had a little action there once a little bit, Wit. Fuck you, Granelli, you little weasel. Yeah. You'd still be working at ESPN Radio the Ocho if I hadn't dragged you from New Hampshire yeah. down and you're betting against me in a must win game for my gambling career. You're not even on the screen right now. I'm just waiting for where your box usually pops. Fuck you, Granelli. Oh. You, <laughs> you, 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 you. You just ate that one. You pissed off Witty. I wrote the guys. I wrote Pavelski. I actually sent in a, a telegram like the 80 Olympic team when they were playing Russia. I sent one in. It was faxed over. So I appreciate you. Um, the glass banger. The glass banger. <laughs> you hear the glass banger during that game? Well, there's one that's famous <laughs> Glad in Glad G popped Dallas. in to take that. Are you talking PP about the one like behind it? the net? Thank you, G. The, 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 <laughs> there are microphones above whatever the... Uh, the net, like, like on the top glass of the glass. With, and oh, behind yes. the net, right yeah. above the top of that glass, there's microphones. They pick up the fucks. So, and Dallas was shooting <laughs> on twice. And I don't know if Sportsnet, Canada, they just do it better than, than an ESPN. I don't know if Sportsnet is like, maybe they can silence that mic when the game's going on. Well, ESPN can't. There was a guy, the whole game, it was like a woodpecker off my temple. I don't know if anyone else, if it drove the, anyone, I was losing mm-hmm. my mind. I almost wanted Dallas to lose and me lose the money so that Glass banger. We had to go home unhappy, but um, Peter DeBoer is a wizard, and I don't know if it was Dallas playing that well or Seattle just looking. I mean, that was not the Seattle crack, and we've seen all playoffs. They had, they had, no, they had nothing going. I mean, it, if it's not for Grubauer, that game six nothing. The second period, I, I, what an absolute, amazingly, perfectly timed mush tweet. I wrote this as this as the makings of a game seven goalie just stealing a win and the other team, like it had the makings of Seattle scoring some crappy goal, you know, some fluky goal, winning one, nothing and Grubauer, you couldn't beat him, but the high flick play and hints his speed. And it all changed And from there. We got to witness a kid who turned 20 years old. Was it today? Was Wyatt yeah. Johnson's birthday today? Yesterday. Yeah. It was Sunday. Yeah, Yesterday. It was Sunday. He tucks Sunday. in that goal. To just wrap up that game, well, for the most part, it ended up being the game winner. But what a what a ridiculous! It looked like he didn't even have an angle to the net. He ends up just going backhand, like skates almost on the goal line, just shelving one. It was in and out too. What a goal by that young stud! And Dallas is moving on, and they deserve to move on. I mean, granted, they they were down one nothing and two one in the series, but they were able to kind of get home and I think put game six behind them, and it was all Dallas from the opening puck drop. Yeah. It was it. And could you feel that coming though, boys? You could like, I mean, the game was I pretty tense. Yeah. I, I would have felt horrible for you and your gambling. But career. I, I really <laughs> did think like, I, I was like, I, I don't see them losing this game at home. I, I, I was messing yeah. with my mind, but I was confident. No, I was confident. I was on your side. I had Rupe Hintz first, uh, anytime goal scorer, which hit for us today on, uh, Game Notes Daily, which was awesome. I got Singzy, uh, beauty from Game Notes Daily too. Big New Jersey fan. He had, Rupe Hintz, uh, first goal, plus 1,100. So he was all fired up about that messaging me. Uh, I mean, amazing to get that at that time in the game, too, in a game seven, how tight it was. Uh, Rupe Hintz came to play. That was his ninth playoff goal. He's been a beast for them. And that's the difference of Seattle comparatively to what uh, I know Robertson's been quiet, but you could just feel their... Yes, they were feeling each other out, but then you could feel Dallas start to push. You know, you could feel them start to get chances. You could see guys start getting energy off of shifts and starting to, you know, line some stack some shifts up against each other against Seattle. They were just trying to a little bit survive. So uh, I think they're the better team. I think they're faster. I think I picked Seattle to win the series, but there's no question that when Dallas strings it together, I think we saw what they what they can be even in tight games like this. Like they were the better team today. 
There's I, no I question. Think, so. I think Jason Robertson, he's got to be up there for most snake bitten player right now. Yeah. Um, for, for them to get through that series without him doing anything kind of shows like if that kid can become regular season, Jason Robertson, Vegas could be in trouble. I don't know. Army sent out the clip last night to the group chat. He was laboring. I don't know if he's injured. The one clip you showed me, he could barely skate. And tonight I did see some more jump in his step and he had chances, but he just can't buy one. So yeah. they still win. That's their top player. They still win because of a guy like Kent. And I mean, you talk about like guys and, and how much money they make. I don't know Hints' his salary. I think he re-signed. He's got a nice deal. Eight, I don't know if it's times next year. eight and a half, I want to say. That starts next year though, right? Or is this yeah. the first year of it? No, next year, I believe. All right. So whatever he's making this year, it, it's, the guy's got nine goals. He's got one point less than Connor McDavid in the same amount of games or one more game played. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing to see him step up. And that, that team, I think the Western Conference Final is going to be a war. I think they're both going to be just amazing, like, teams that aren't really going to back down from one another and play similar styles in a way. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I could see both of them going seven. I, I just look at deadline deals, too, and how much impact they end up having. I know we talked about, uh, well, we talked about Martinook and the, the offense that he had outpouring in the second round that really helped Carolina push past New Jersey. I felt like Max Domi has been such a great yeah. ad. I feel like he's also like, like I, he was a skill guy in junior. And you know his old man, you know, everyone knows who Ty Domi is. I feel like his game is better when he has a little bit of nastiness to it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that series, it really stuck out. He ended up getting in that nasty scuffle with uh, Vince Dunn about mid-series. And then even tonight, he was mixing up with Alexiak. Like, he's not backing down from the big guys. So not only with the point production that he's put up in the first two rounds, but just the overall game. And he just also looks like he has a step, too. It's crazy. Like he just he 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 looks he looks even better than he was in Chicago this year. He's like a playmaker. Hey, like you could see when he gets a puck, like he's looking to dist distribute it, yeah, uh, and and make plays and and he has like that skilled poise. Busy to your point, but I, you're right. I think when he's a prick, he's just and when on he's relied level. upon a little more, like almost like third line ish guy. Kinda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. But he can play that half well in the PP. We've seen him there when he's produced in this series and he's had a good playoffs. Like he's fit in really well with their style of game, I think, just because of the tools that he has. So, yeah, depth versus depth. I think speed, I think ability to play defense, I think uh, physicality through lineups. I think this Western Conference final is going to be awesome with these two oh, yeah. teams. I believe he's also a UFA as well. So he's I, he's playing for a contract, if I'm not mistaken. I think only Chicago. Yeah, he only signed, signed a one year deal with Chicago to bet on himself because he, he, you know, and and also he's he has moved around a little bit. So he's he's used to doing it. And then last year he did it at the deadline too, where he went to Carolina. It didn't didn't mm -hmm. he end up having two goals in game seven of the first round? Yeah. I think yeah, he, he, he stepped up big offensively there too. So do you think he goes a, back? You think he goes back to Chicago with uh, Bedard there? Do you think he's a guy that they would bring back in there? Because he he played pretty well there. I know they were limited, but uh, he can kind of he you know like he has that skill game, but he's not afraid. Like he'll he'll be a guy that can kind of defend Bedard a little bit in this modern game, and he he has a little little chip to him. I think he's a guy that I think I could see going back to Chicago if they take him back. Hey, how about uh, how about we've talked about the drafting right the the, the first round where they got all three of the studs in Dallas and. Thomas Harley, he was a first rounder in 2019. He's looked great. He only played 12 minutes then. I just clicked on it, but he's got seven points at 13 playoff games. Another draft pick, another young guy on a cheap deal, making an impact. These are the, and these are the cup winners. These are the Blackhawks when all those guys were on entry level deals. This is what you see. You see the draft picks producing and actually making an impact while not making a ton of money yet. And that'll change next year with, with hints and stuff, but um, Dallas is, is, is a. The board, I guess he just has some way of showing up and getting guys to believe, and he has a system that he knows teams he's with can play, and, and Dallas looks awesome. Is that is that alluding to your pick, Wit? Are you going to go with Dallas over Vegas? Ooh, here we go. He's going to get into it I, right I now? I think we have to talk about Seattle before we get into that. Yes. Oh, okay. Good, Sorry. good just, call, Wit. Yep. Just, you know, what a bounce back year. I saw an interview with Jordan Everly right after the game in the locker room, you know, emotional like he's not crying but you could tell it it means so much to him and he was talking about um, what it means to get to the second round he says I played seven years before I got in the playoffs I, I realized how hard it is to get into the playoffs to win a round 
And after the year we had last year to come back and make the second round and get to game seven in the second round after upsetting the cup champs, like this is so invaluable to these younger guys and you have to appreciate it, right? Like you don't know when it's coming around again. The game, he said, the games are so fun, but I think a guy like that who took him a while to get in and the Islanders had some good runs and now he's back. It's like you, you get older and you appreciate it. It's, you think it's going to, Army, remember we got in the playoffs? You think it's going to be oh, easy every year, yeah. and all of a sudden you, you go five years in Edmonton or where you were, Montreal, Toronto, you're not in, and Atlanta. You, yeah. your, your career just goes by in a blink of an eye. So, so cool for them that quickly to become that good, dangerous of a team to, to take Dallas to the brink there. Yeah, it's, it's great, too. I mean, it's only the second year in the league. I mean, Yanni Good, we know this guy was a bulldog out there, just incredible leader, like that that. First goal, I mean, the goal the first game that he just turned, spun, shot it right over Ottinger's uh, shoulder. From then on, he just, like, played with some mad swagger. Also, Matty Benares, uh great first playoffs. The kid's a rookie. Seven points and I think, uh, 12 or 13 games. And how about Ellie Tolvin? And, I mean, Nashville gave up on this guy. Anybody could have grabbed him before Seattle. Nobody did. He comes in. He plays a pretty significant role for the team. It gets eight points. And I think he was you know, playing in the top six. So, uh, if you're a Seattle fan, man, you got to feel great about this year. There's so many good things ahead. I know... Biz and Bowie have a little uh, thing going on, but it's it's a great fucking... I think it's so good when these new teams are good. I know people bitch about, oh, they've only been in two years. It's like, who cares, man? It's like they changed the rules because these owners are paying 500 fucking million dollars and you don't want to handicap them for five years having a shit team. So I don't know. It's, it's great for the league. Oh, and I, I feel I can't like wait to get Francis to Seattle. had to earn this too. And I think a lot of people like wrote him off after what they did in the yeah. first year. Uh, going back, I was trying to find the tweet, but it seems like a lot of their players will be back next year where there won't be a ton of turnover. A few a few things in here or there, but Hopefully nothing Shane much. Wright can make a big step. Yeah. I mean, there is an argument, though, R.A. Not an argument, but a discussion to be had that all these fan bases of all these teams, they see Vegas come in, they see what they've done. They see out of... See Seattle the first year struggled. This year they see what they done. It, it it's almost easier with how good the expansion rules are for you to start new. Like you see these teams, and there, there's like an argument to be made that you're in a better spot if all of a sudden your team's created out of nowhere. Yes, you're paying five hundred for Vegas, six fifty for Seattle. I'm guessing the next one will be nine hundred million, if not a billion. As crazy as it sounds, maybe nine hundred, say eight hundred. You're given, you're given, there's so many good players in the league. And you're all of a sudden now, like with these new expansion rules, you're starting off pretty hot. Like it, it is somewhat of, of, of a help as opposed to just like, you got to be awful. You got to hope for a high draft pick. And these teams are coming in. They're getting people scraps. All of them, most of them can play. It just seems that they don't fit in other systems. So, you know what, you know what though, what, what the difference was Vegas got a Mark Andre flurry. You know, they got like this. Well, Vegas really fucking rigged yeah. the system by like, yeah, take it. You know what I mean? They were getting draft picks for 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 not. Oh yeah, taking players, and I know things change, but still, like, it's like when you go on a trip with, and you go like to, by the train station somewhere, and they've got all these fake bags, and they're like, "Hey, here's a Gucci bag," and you're like, "Yeah, okay." You look at it, you're unsure, and you're like trying to work the guy for this sick Gucci bag. Well, next time you go traveling, you know, that guy's trying to fuck you. So you're like, Hey, yeah, buddy, I don't think so. So yeah, Seattle exactly. kind of, yeah. This They're is a like food, a little bit. actually a Fucci bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what it's like. It, it just shows though. There's some great players out there, man. There's great players who, who don't, who, who can't hack it on, on some teams, sometimes one or two teams. And they get in a spot where they're more than anything they're believed in, right? Like they, they were picked for a reason. They finally have somebody that is really in their corner and you see guys taking off like Bjorkstrand with the, that guy's awesome. Although was he, was he, a, did he sign with them though? I think, yeah, I think he was a free agent signing. Okay. Yeah. So him and Larson were the big free agent signings. That makes a difference. And, and they got guys though that can fit in different spots that are actually given a chance. Like, can you imagine if you're a third line grinder that plays like 12 minutes and now you're playing 20? I know, oh, like, and you feel awesome. you're, you're, tell, you're telling me Pittsburgh's not kicking themselves in the ass, letting go of Tanev, Tanev, mm -hmm. and McCann. Oh. Right? They gave up McCann to Toronto, to traded him, then they then they put him on, they got him from there, and then they took Tanev too. So they got yeah. So they <laughs> gave Tanev that like six year deal for eighteen million, whatever it was. Yep. How did they think that that was one of the guys you wanted to let go? Looking at how like, Pittsburgh, like if you could pick a player Pittsburgh needed, it's Brandon Tanev. I know. That's away. Okay. 
I say that all the time when I'm doing games of like post game. Like, damn, they could really go for a guy like Tanov in the lineup. <laughs> uh, Bjorkstrand <laughs> was acquired in a trade with uh, Columbus for a third and fourth round pick. Great Ooh. deal. Who's the? Uh, oh, there's another Swedish sound name that, that they did sign. Wenberg. I'm confused. Might have been that. But uh, back to uh, what's his name for a second? Uh, Tolvin and Poyle actually said we might regret this move by doing this. We, you know, we still feel good about him, but they, they, for whatever reason, they wa- wa- waived them. But he even acknowledged when they did it. We might this might bite us in the ass, and you know I'd say it has given the production. That, he's that could have been. I would a just coach. say that every time I put a guy on waivers, <laughs> just to cover <laughs> yeah. my basis. Yeah, be a well, No, and you're basically saying, him saying that is like, yeah, the coach doesn't like him, right? Yeah, if, yeah. If Poyle's saying like, ah, I kind of, kind of like him. him. Like it, I, John Hines <laughs> is like, no, point. you're not, you're not fitting in here. Bud. Oh, so the coach hates him at the press conference. <laughs> Oh, I didn't say that. that. I didn't say, I didn't yeah, say he that. Go, he'll go, no, I didn't say that. Uh, we just don't have room for him. I, I got these lines. We got our team constructed. We're going to play a certain way. And, uh, you know, there's just not room for Ellie at the time right now in our lineup. Uh, good luck to Ellie. I know this will probably come back and bite us. He's a pretty damn good player. But uh, anyway, he's off to a new beginning. Uh, all right. Exactly. I like our team. I like our exactly. team. We got a pretty. Is that on my chat? I almost that's went full Cali bat. That's chat GPD of any, any <laughs> press conference with any GM who's putting a guy on waivers. Uh, and Martin the, got it. <laughs> yeah, that was. I think that was more of one of those. They knew. Yeah, he wasn't going to probably get picked up. It was a paper move. But uh, Biz, to go back to uh, Seattle's cap situation, the only like like regulars who are uh, UFA: uh, Ryan Donato, Carson Susi, and Martin Jones. Otherwise, everyone is either wow, back next right. year or, or an RFA. Either so RFA you know, or yeah, they're looking or good. Back. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Busy, are you going to throw out a like a lifeline to Bowie? Maybe like is is there any room in their defeat? He's no, probably he's sad. Too. I would have no maybe need. used them to get a box at, at at the Climate Pledge Arena if they made it to the if they made it to the Cup Finals. But no, there's no need to no need to throw out a life raft. Yeah, Bowie's a disaster. So no love still for Bowie. You're just gonna let him hang on this and just let him like think about the loss, dwell in it, think of all the shit he's tried to taunt you into. He did a lot of he did a lot of shit talk in the biz, and you kind of gave it back, but no. No hand held out to Bowie to say, hey, great season, my friend. Fuck uh, whatever that thing is. I paid for your junk, <laughs> Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. All right. Okay, before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at Front Door. We all have that long, nagging home to-do list that we keep putting off. I certainly do. It's full of annoying things that need to be fixed. Ripping dishwasher, hole in the drywall, or the dryer not drying, all kinds of stuff. Wouldn't it feel great to get it all done? Now you can, and it's easier than ever. Introducing Front Door, the all-new one-stop home repair and maintenance app. Front Door lets you video chat with experts in real time so you can diagnose the problem faster, sometimes fix it yourself on the video chat, or Front Door will send you a list of vetted and trusted pros to come out and help solve the problem. Look, I've said it before, I'm not a fix-it guy. I moved into the condo last year. I still got things that pop up. Might be the stove, might be the toilet, could be the sink, whatever. That's why I use Front Door. They hook me up. They take care of it. And with the Front Door membership, it's easy to cross things off your home to-do list and enjoy that feeling of done. All right. I actually, I'm a huge, huge Front Door guy. I've said, I've told the Chicklets listeners a few times that I just moved into this new place. It's a bit of a fixer-upper, I'd say. And there's no better app for fixer uppers than front door. They've helped me with my washing machine. They've helped me with my dryer. So, I mean, everything front door is the absolute go-to. Perfectly said, Mike. So download that app right now and get our free video chat. Let's uh, slide over to this preview of this uh, series. Vegas, Dallas, uh, it should be an unreal matchup. The The line is basically a pick em. I think Vegas is like minus 116, Dallas minus 105. I mean, wait, that's, that's a pick em for all intents and purposes, right? Uh, during the regular season, Dallas went three and zero. Vegas went zero one and two. But two of those losses were shootout losses, so you know they weren't real losses. And uh, in those matchups, actually, they did not face uh, Aiden Hill at all. Dallas didn't. They didn't play him at all. They had the three other goalies this season, so they didn't really get a good look at him. But uh, I don't know, Biz. Go to you first on this. Uh, what's your outtake on this? Who do you think's gonna take it and why? I'm torn. I was changing my mind the entire ride over here. Um, I I I think I'm gonna go Vegas in seven. And I just, I think they have a little bit more offense from their D overall. Uh, I'm expecting Theodore to be a little bit better than he has come this playoff. Uh, I've already talked about Petro. I think that definitely advantage to Dallas and net. But as far as defense and then all four lines, I just lean towards Vegas. 
And with the question mark of Robertson playing the way he is, I feel like Vegas is just too deep up front. Uh, they're too disciplined, although that came back to bite me in the ass. And five on five, they're just a force to be reckoned with right now. And I think that they will prevail. Not saying I don't like the one thing that concerns me is goaltending and Aiden Hill and just the fact that Dallas is good at getting to the inside and they're good at these redirections. Pavelski being the main reason for that. But I think with the lack of power plays and them getting back to discipline hockey, I just, I really like Vegas in seven. I think it's going to be an awesome series. I just, that's it. Vegas is I'll my choice. I'll take Vegas boys. in six. I'll do Vegas in six. I think. Vegas, witty. Before I let you go, is is Seattle on steroids? Like they're relentless. They're deep. They're fast. They cycle. They eat up pucks. They get to the. They get inside, which you know Seattle had a hard time getting inside on on Dallas. I think they'll. I think there'll be a lot more to handle and in getting into those areas to a man through their team. I think their D are bigger. I think they're like can move better i think they're more physical as well like i think it's gonna i think they're a load to handle like like vegas is a load and then you've got jack eichel playing the way he is and chandler stevenson through the depths and stone is you know <laughs> he looks like busy skating but he's crusty. still getting it done <laughs> crusty but like they just have they just have so much to their lineup like that's i'll take them in six i got dallas in seven totally wouldn't be surprised at all if vegas wins but I guess I'm I guess I'm thinking like Vegas would be maybe a little bit more fun than Dallas. So that means if I want to go to Vegas, Dallas will win. That's kind of like my thinking. That's how even these teams are. I mean, I look at the center, we got Eichel, Stevenson, Carlson, Bluger, Hint, Domi, Wyatt Johnson, Radic, Fasca. Maybe overall give Vegas the 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 upper hand at center. Um D overall, I like Vegas as D better, but they don't have a defenseman as good as Heskinen. I know we've talked about Petro and how good he is. Heskinen's at a completely different level, 30 minutes a game. And more than anything, it's just Ottinger for me. And granted, like some of this round was a struggle. It's but the bounce this bounce back factor this kid's got going, that's like that that means something. I mean, they go down one oh, all right, we got Ottinger. We we have a team that can do this. I think it's going to be a battle, but I think Dallas gets it done, and we look back, and Ottinger's the reason. This might be the toughest uh, series to pick so far. These they're teams, so even. These two so, teams so even, and you know, I I always defer the goaltender, and you know, Ottinger as great as his bounce backs are, with it also means he had a shit game before that. We've seen a couple times, and Aiden Hill, I don't think he's had like a. Uh, I mean, he's only I think started the last three or four games. He hasn't had a, a, any really bad games at all. Um, but I don't know. I, I keep going. Like you just said, I think Hes- Heiskin is a huge. I think he's the X factor here. I mean, Petrangelo is good. I got Heskin above him. I'm going to go Dallas in seven. And to copy you, like it wouldn't surprise me if it goes the other way. But I'm going Dallas in seven. What is, what's our producer Mikey Grinelli have for us? You have an X factor? Can I sway you with anything, G? Can I sway you with anything? Sway me, baby. I'm very they, easily swayed. They just shut down Leon and Connor the last few games to minimally to nothing. Um... They yes, they gave up and bled power play goals to the Edmonton Oilers, the two best players in the league that handily could dominate anybody and put them and put them to sleep. So it's like, you know, they're not gonna have to deal with the roadrunner ripping around the ice, dangling through everybody, and like big, massive, like Yager Jr. just posting up <laughs> seeming passes everywhere. Like this is a different thing. And then they they can handle that. They handled it. They got through them. They they neutralized it a bit. But they, they have shut a lot it down. more coming with the other lines. Didn't Just even need to true. sway me, Army. Didn't even need to sway me. I got Vegas in seven. Jack Eichel is on an absolute mission. I said it before the playoffs, and I'll say it again. Eichel is on a mission. He's on that Conn Smythe journey. I got Vegas in seven. And I also have a pre-recorded pick from Merle's, so I'll play that right now. I'm on Vegas. Of course I'm on Vegas. I want to go to Vegas to see the finals. I want to experience that crowd. Their team, the Team D, if you have uh, Carlson as your third-line center, he was a first-line center when they went to the finals. He's been unreal. Eichel has just raised his game. I love what he's doing. I'm actually going to put a little sprinkle on Eichel to win the Conn Smythe, plus 700. So I got them winning the series. I'm going to have Eichel on there. I'm taking Vegas in six. All right. The Murr on Vegas as well. Um, so me and RA are the Dallas guys. But another thing that I don't know if this is good or bad for us, RA, but I don't think Robertson will stay snake bitten like this. I have to believe he's going to get going. You can't be that good in the regular season. And all of a sudden like this comes unless he's injured and we don't know. 
I, I would like to think if he really gets it going. I just wrote down in my notes. I mean, he, you know, he hasn't been bad. He's got 12 points. He had five points all assist that last series. But I just wrote new matchups. And how many times do we see in the playoffs that a guy just gets totally shut down, does nothing in one series, and then he blows up the next series? And I, I think we might see that with Robo next series. Like, obviously, we don't know who, you know, the boy's going to put on him. But I, I don't know. I, I, he, if he, even if he is, even if he is dinged up, he's, you know, he's still producing out there. I think he's going to have a nice series. I think because of the matchups, it, things that might open up for him a little bit. So. Yeah, new series, new matchups, and more points for Robo. That's the thinking anyway. So, uh, all right, let's go over to the Eastern Conference Final, the preview there. Let's see. Uh, I have Florida, no clue. Uh, Carolina, a, a small favorite, my 6-7, which is uh, minus 140 or 100 to make 120 um, on Florida. Head-to-head -head during the year, Carolina was 2-1. and one, Florida was 1-2. and two. Carolina seeking their first Stanley Cup Final since 06. Uh, Florida seeking their first since 96. This will be the first playoff series to feature all three stalls. Uh, of course, Eric is going against the team he won the cup with 17 years ago, and the, the coach of Carolina was his captain on that team as well. Uh, so a lot of, uh, you know, uh, like mingled storylines here. I'm um, Doug. Who do you like here and why? I, I don't know which way to go on this. I've, I've been, I've, I've honestly been, um, I don't want to say hypnotized, maybe a little bit hypnotized, boys. Those oh, mushrooms that, uh, RA mailed down to me. Hey, at the five pit. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> How are you? I, I I love the way and the I love the way Carolina plays. I do. And as good it and as much as the story that you know the Panthers have been, um, I just think they're they're so good at counteracting any kind of team just because of the way they play and they play so different. The man on man stuff all over the ice. They smother you. They they're Got a few more extra days to get a little healthy here. Um, on uh, Game Notes Daily, Merle said he saw something. Or Tara Vinen was now in like a regular color practice uh, he's jersey playing, as I guess. well. <clears throat> so he's he's going to be there, right? They're getting a few more days here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I I just think I think they're I think they're a team that obviously won't go away, but they're a team that will make it really really difficult and frustrating for Florida to play, and it's. It's not like it hasn't been like they haven't grind ground and fought their way anywhere in Florida, but I, I just think Carolina's made for that kind of game. And I think it's still going to be one of the first times, that, you know, they're going to play a team in the playoffs. that's going to match them like really good with that ground grind ground pound kind of style of game. And, and I mean, they pushed around New Jersey. They, they physically put bullied them um, and, and they can play a physical game. They got big D that can skate, move pucks and pound pucks at the net. I think it's going to be, they're going to be a, a, a lot to handle with the way they can skate, the way they work, and the way they check. How many games? I will say I will take Carolina in seven. All right. So I, I, I really, Even though I really like Florida. I really back everything you said. <laughs> My main reason I'm taking Carolina, I'm taking Carolina in seven as well. I do. I, re, I really honestly think both these series go seven games. If I were to lean towards one go, being a little shorter, I think Carolina maybe. And my main reason is that as good as Florida's been, they played against Boston, who in the regular season didn't do it, but all they did was turn the puck over. That's all they did. The Bruins nonstop were trying to make cute plays, turn it over. And then they played the kings of the turnovers, the Leafs. Carolina doesn't do that. Every single little thing that Florida was able to pounce on against the Bruins and the Maple Leafs, Carolina won't give you. They, ref they refuse to. It's, it's part of their DNA as a team. It's part of how Rod Brindamore played. Everyone says this team just plays exactly how he played the game. It's chip it in. It's chase it. It's no high danger passes to the neutral zone. It's no high danger passes in your own end. It's make the other team make mistakes. And all Florida has done is feed off mistakes by Toronto and Boston. I think it's going to mm -hmm. be an amazing series. Jordan Stahl will be playing against Kachuk's line, I'm guessing. You saw what he did against Jack Hughes when they had the matchups. Um, Bobrovsky's kind of a, a difference maker. He's like, why I took Dallas, that's kind of why I should take Florida in terms of the better goalie. But I think Carolina overall as a team and getting Tara Vinen back, I, I think they take it in seven. Let's go. Busy boy, what do you have for us? I was going to take Carolina in seven too. I, it's a coin toss for me. I think it's going to come down to defense and uh, the production from the back end with the Canes. We didn't see it in the first round, but then you saw it turn around in, in the round two. 
and it's a lot to handle. They, they're all over you. They smother you defensively, and yet they join in as far as their top four for Carolina, uh, maybe based on based on like names, if you look down at, at paper, one of the most impressive uh, no-name or D squads throughout the last 20 years of yeah, the who's NHL. Who's this Chatfield maniac out there? So he's Chatfield, great. Like, I thought, that guy's I thought, awesome. He's physical. I thought mean. Between he like, can Pesci, fly. Pesci has been incredible. So has Shea. I, I mean, we know what Slavin could do defensively, but I think he's also underrated the way with the plays he makes inside the offensive zone. And then Burns has a cannon. They got to get the puck upstairs, which Toronto had a hard time doing, like top half of the net. And one other thing where I think that it, it's just the constant forecheck from Carolina. You know, I, I compliment the hyenas constantly, but nobody forechecks quite like Carolina as a five-man unit, and I think that'll eventually give the back end for Florida some problems. And yeah, I've been, like they I, haven't I've, felt the pressure yet of 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 a, like just a nonstop forecheck. Yeah, and I and I've been underestimating their D come playoff time, and they've slapped me in the face with it every time. But I think that I agree with you guys. The only the only concern being top end goal scoring, and that and I think that that's where Florida has it. But I just think that Carolina is such a well oiled machine. And I know we joke about statues all the time, Wit, and we say, oh, there should be 10 guys who have statues. If Carolina can somehow win the Stanley Cup with this lineup, I feel like with Brindamore doing it as a captain and doing it as a coach, I don't care if he gets inside the Hall of Fame. He should have a statue outside that arena one day. Because yeah. that is just overachieving. He's just, he's just doing curls with his shirt off, the statue. Yeah. He's like a yeah. Mr. Olympia. So I'm going to go, I, I know I've been disrespecting Carolina all these years and I say, oh, is, is Aho a superstar? I'm on your side finally. I don't think you, you probably like that because I'm the biggest mush going, but Carolina in seven and I think it's going to be an awesome conference final. I think they're like throat, their throat stepper honors, you know, like Carolina, when they get on you, <laughs> like the, their throat stepper honors, like they don't let you breathe. And, and I saw that, right. We, we, uh, besides a few games where it was like, okay, you know, we'll get them next time for the most part, like they're, they're so detailed to wits point, so structured, so aggressive. They can all skate. Like they are just a lot to handle, and when they when they start getting momentum on you, like they just start to like p- apply the pressure, and you know I give them a ton of credit. I think that's a, uh, the way they play is really hard. I would I couldn't last playing their style of hockey. It's so hard, like the way they skate and work. But they're that's why they're so good. That's why they're such a different animal and different beast. And to Biz's point, they got you know their top four D are all six five and can skate like. And you, you know, know like, RA's picking Florida, and I guess the yeah. only thing that would be on his side, well, not the only thing, but maybe what you just said is something that's legit in terms of can they handle playing at this pace another round, right? Like, they do play so hard. It takes so much energy. It's been the complaint as to why they haven't been able to go further in prior playoffs. Maybe that helps. Maybe that helps Florida's chances. Yeah, we're definitely looking at another coin flip here. And yeah, wait, of course, I'm going to stick with my future, but I... You know, Freddie Anderson's been great. His numbers are great, but he's also got pulled from a game. Uh, the New Jersey, he got lit up that game. He just look, looked tired a little little out of it. But Borowski hasn't been pulled by in any games yet. I don't think he's even been contemplated to, to get pulled at all. He's been uh, just outstanding since they put him in after they pulled Lyon that game. I think Bob probably has an advantage. Just, you know, overall, maybe career-wise over Freddie. I'm a Freddie guy, but I, I think there's a slight nod there to Bob. And I don't know, Florida just reminds me of one of these teams that they just kind of, I've seen this movie before, they just kind of come in and just steamroll everybody. Uh, like we talked about the Kings a few years back, but after what they've done to Boston, what they've done to Toronto, I, I don't see them, not saying not having a problem with Carolina, but I think they keep on rolling, man. I think Bobrovsky keeps it rolling. Uh, Kachuk, I, he got shut out you know, the last few games in Toronto, but I don't know, I, I think this Team's a well-built machine. They're humming along, and yeah, man, I got to roof my fucking forty to one shot. So and, 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 and seven. Um, All right. Seven. When LA did the when LA did it in two thousand twelve, they beat the one, two, and three seed in the Western Conference, and that's what that's what Florida would do here to get to the final. They'd be knocking off Boston, Carolina two, and Toronto three. Another wild one I meant to mention, uh, 2006, Rod Brindamore scores after a delay game penalty, and the Canes eliminate the Lindy Ruff coach Sabres. 2023, the Rod Brindamore coached Canes score after delay game penalty. We said that penalty. last week. I'm, so, that last yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I, that was a, no, that was no, a little no, late. I, late I think night. I might have said it on game notes. I think I might have told my mom that stat. 
I've been, I've been, I've been using and abusing you probably got it too. Already. Tattooed too, knowing you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I dodged that bullet. Yeah, I dodged that bullet this year. I'll say this about Bobrovsky: he got the kitchen sink thrown at him in the last game there against the Leaf, fifty-two Wait. shots. They're gonna get like these guys are gonna be. He's gonna be. Yeah. But are you going to get 36 shots on you a game from everywhere on the ice, like in the mixer with guys Red getting birds, that rockets, brim, like just this off the yellow the boards, like as a rim around, he's just whacking them off the yellow, just right towards the net. Like they're coming from everywhere. And so it's going to be a different beast that way for Bobrovsky as well. I like how both series had the exact same amount of rest. I like yep. how Carolina, Carolina, a lot of rest, too. Kind of a lot of rest, well, from well second round to third round. Uh, Paul Maurice, out coach Monty. He outcoached Sheldon Keefe, but outcoaching Rod the Bod is no easy task. So I got Carolina in seven, and I believe Merle says Carolina too, so let's send it over to him real quick. As you can see by my hat, I'm on Carolina. You know, I was down there for that tailgate. I was down there for that outdoor game. I love the fans. I love the city. I got news from a, a little birdie in Finland that Tara Vinen is, playing, is, is back. He's going to be 100% to play in the series. Um, that's a huge addition. Florida's been great, but now they're going to match up with a team similar to them. But it's going to be a crazy series. I got them Canes and seven. The home ice advantage will will get them over the top. So I'm on Canes and seven. The Mer wow. he's he's an alumni, wow. so we knew he I was have, taking uh, the Canes. Alumni, yeah. <laughs> he's the alumni hat. Has he ever help. told the story when he got sent down after two games when he had a goal and an assist? No shit. Yeah. Did he really? Yeah, he did. Yeah, on the plane. He he it every week, down. at least once Here, a week on Game Notes Daily right now. <laughs> here's my prediction for the conference finals with Carolina. Rod Brindamore has one meltdown on the bench. On the refs he's or always, on a player? Oh, yeah. No, no, refs. Yeah, he's he good for it. not only an in-game snap show, but it will also translate to the table post-game presser. Guaranteed one wire crossing of the, the mind here. Guaranteed. Biz, who are your X-Factors? Yeah, especially with Bennett and Bennett and Kachuk. Yeah, he's going to lose his fight. <laughs> so my X-Factor for Vegas is going to be Petro. I think that Petro is going to be more of a factor than Haskinen as far as defenders in that series. Uh, just ex I, I feel the nastiness plays into Petro's hand, and I feel like he's very, very fired up. Uh, after that incident in the last round. And he got that extra couple days of rest too, which is huge for a guy who plays the type of minutes he plays. Um, maybe not quite around Haskinen's minutes, but just as much of a difference, if not more. So he will be my one in that series. And in the Carolina, Florida series, I would pick Ajo. I'll go back to Ajo. They don't, that's the one thing that Florida has on them is high-end goal scoring. Think of how many, they got Verhage. I mean, Bar I know Barkov has maybe been quieter than we've we we normally see him in regular season, but they ha he's still how many p points did he finish with? He had to have been over eighty, right? Am I crazy here? Uh, Reinhardt's got to be a thirty goal scorer. Duclair was a thirty Barkov goal had scorer last points, year. Seventy eight, sixty eight games. How many? How many? How many thirty goal scorers do they have currently in their lineup? Or let's even say twenty five goal scorers in Florida active compared to Carolina's. And I would say they probably double them up. This year, Florida had a guy. Chuck had 40. Verhege had 42. Reiner had 31. And then Barkov had 23. He was in. And I'll the, say this. Duclair. About, did you say Duclair? Did, did he had Bennett 31 Bennett last had, year, obviously. That, that Duclair had 31 last year. And he had the. Uh, they got to have a couple other back. guys who are who are in their 20s. They no, had a did, lot in the. No. No. Actually, they had no other 20 goal scorers. They had. Um, did Montour not get 20? They had tons in the teens, though. Oh. They had like a bunch, like Ek, I mean, uh, Bennett had sixteen. I think Ekblad had fourteen. Tons Montour of guys. Montour had teens. sixteen. Lusterinen had seventeen. Forsling had thirteen. So, yeah, I mean, Lundell had twelve. Stahl had fourteen. So yeah, they they do have probably more goal scoring ability than Carolina. I agree with you. There, there's more star power up front for for Florida. I just think Carolina's system just suffocates everything. Yeah, they are like a boa constrictor out there. I'll give you an X factor for that series, Biz. Uh, the Duke, Anthony Duclair, he, you know, he hasn't been lighting it up, but I, I, like I was saying about matchups earlier, like, you know, if other guys are getting like covered a little bit more, that could open uh, open the door for him. I wouldn't be surprised if he has a pretty big series. Ever since he came back from being a healthy scratch, scratch in the yeah. Boston series, he's been good. He's been noticeable. Yeah, yeah and I know one other note, too, in the, in the other series, Aiden Hill last faced Dallas on October 19th, 2017. 
uh, when he was a Coyote. So is that more advantageous to the, the, the goalie or the opposition? Because they don't really have much of a book on him, having never played him. One thing I will say about Aiden Hill, watching him in those few games that he played with uh, with Vegas against the Oilers, he would be making saves, and after saves, he'd be like joking around with the officials and stuff. You could see his body language where he didn't seem nervous at all, like more like he was just enjoying the moment. So that's one thing where I'm like, oh, okay, well, he seems confident in that. Well, he is because he's fucking just fucking around out there enjoying it. Like you don't see a lot of young goalies like joshing with officials after they make a save and kind of, you know, live in the Vida Loca. So that's a, that's a good little pick there, all right? All right. Thanks, Nor- guys, normally uh, the arse holes are puckered up. <laughs> little Ricky uh, Martin in there too, busy. Yeah. <laughs> You guys, uh, any f- final bags, thoughts, predictions, X factors that you, you left out so far or what? No, I picked one a series. I'm not going to overdo it and chew up yeah. all the clock this time. I'll it, say this. It, I will look back through the games too. Robertson to a guy that you said a snake bit in that series. He didn't score during the regular season either against Vegas in any of those games. He scored in a shootout though. So no shootouts in the playoffs. All right, gang. Well, listen, do not forget Wednesday, 6 o'clock on our YouTube, the next Sandbagger versus Dave Pordnoy and Josh Josh Richards, I struggle with that. Uh, and also, Game Notes Daily is only on game day, so the boys are going to get a couple days off. And, uh, you know, boys, we got no hockey the next couple nights. Uh, quick recommendation. I know none of you have watched it yet. Uh, Air on uh, you know Amazon Prime, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon. It's a story about making a sneaker. It sounds boring, but between the script, the acting, uh, the directing, it plays like a nail-biter almost. Highly recommended. Great flick. Give it a whirl, and we'll check back on that next week. Any final thoughts? I'm no? pissed that there's no hockey. I the know next this couple is days. weird. Uh, I'm going you know? on a date. My wife, what's a date? <laughs> what no are you shit. Do? Yeah, I was like, like, there's no hockey tomorrow, right? I'm like, no. Let's go out. I'm like, whoa, yeah, I'll leave the house. <laughs> oh my knee. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I won't. I I have this position on the couch. It's just you get the pillow under the knees. I'm laying back, TV up to the right. I haven't moved there for for what feels like a month. You're going to have to get on that world championship kick in the morning and then crank it over to like some AHL playoffs on uh, on some kind of feed and oh, just yeah, say I'll hockey's still on. Board. I'll be yeah. betting like Arabian <laughs> shuffleboard by the end of the afternoon. Dickie Bones <laughs> lighting it up over there. I actually bet on the spelling bee D- one. Yeah, I think disc I told golf. you that before. What? Hey, disc golf? <laughs> Did you bet disc on disc golf? ridiculous. You ever seen like what they shoot into? They're able like to, to get a the bunch baskets? of points. It's crazy. They have different. They have different ones. They have like drivers. They have putters. Like one of their discs is a putter. I don't know. They're like different weights and stuff. It's crazy. Hey, uh, quickly off top before we end, is there a dumber, legit dumber human being in the world than John Morant? Uh, wow. Oh, because he was back on camera with the gun, flashing the gun around. He was back on Instagram Live in front of a hundred <laughs> people, waving his gun around. Are you kidding me, buddy? You have so what the happened world. He, he get- has the world by the balls. He's got his own shoe on Nike. He's the one of the most predominantly well-known players in the world in the NBA. He's got all the things in the world he could ever ask for. And he's possibly throwing it all away because he wants to be holding a gun like a tough guy in an Instagram live video. Like, you can't teach stupid like that, fellas. That's fucking unbelievable. He gave a speech like oh two weeks ago. I got to after they lost. I got I got to you know behave off the court. I got to watch what I'm doing. You know I'm a I'm a big part of this franchise, this team. And and nope. A week later, he's waving a gun around. With the funniest part of that video too is like his it's his friend's Instagram live, and he's kind of videoing and this and you can see Jaw reach into his pants and pull it out. And the second he pulls it out his gun. Off. Hit the, the camera just drops where you like <laughs> even his friends are like dude like what the fuck are you doing here well that guy, that guy that was instagram living he was already earlier this season banned from all gr- memphis games <laughs> because he he was one of the guys involved with like the point the red laser at the red laser at the pacers team bus so it's like oh, it's like you are who you hang league. out with you I are don't who you hang out with this. and this guy is just unbelievably stupid i saw stephen a smith talking about it on espn it was actually an unreal like little rant he went on and 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 he said there's all these people going out like well well, well, he's not doing anything wrong if you're legally allowed to have the gun if he's got a gun license he's like the nba is a private business they fucking decide what 
you can and cannot do. Yeah, if, and if they, they don't want, want guys in their league waving yeah. around guns. I don't care how legal the weapon is in the state you're sitting. I don't care how good yeah. your crossover is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the First Amendment, too. Doesn't mean your fucking boss won't fight if you say some stupid shit, it's you know? It's just like, guys, oh, use your brain. I don't know this. I didn't even knew any. I think he got suspended, right? It was a big deal. I remember hearing about it a while ago, and then I saw the news today. I didn't know about the la- What's this laser pointer on a guy? I, I don't so know I, if it was the Pacers boss or something like, else. Like, th- there was reports that, like, people like a red, the red dot. dot. Like a, yeah, the red yeah, dot. Yeah, like a red dot. dot. Like, like, it's like, like the Terminator. It, like, it's Mark oh Wahlberg and, and Shooter at the top of the mountain, like, getting ready to blow you away. Because <laughs> oh oh you blocked a couple of his shots against the Pacers. Yeah, it was like some post game argument. I mean, like, a, like his, like, out of vehicle, he was, was drive by and a couple. Uh, the guys on the other side noticed like that, you know, that red dot on him or whatever. And I don't know if it was a fucking point or a laser tag. Or I whatever, wish we but- got to ask Chuck about that. because oh. He would have probably just had an amazing <laughs> oh, town. He, he couldn't have handled it after the RA shooting incident too, the three point oh. shooting thing. Yeah. He just yeah. walked yeah. out. Yeah. Of yeah. Of red dots. Uh, the no shooting zone. <laughs> and, oh, I, and hopefully everybody enjoyed Charles. Cause he, like, again, he was so yeah. fucking good and hopefully you all enjoyed him. And we'll go back to that one again and again, cause it was so good. But uh, boys, uh, great first couple of rounds. Great episode. Yep. I, I think that about wraps it up. So uh, we'll see you uh, next week and uh, enjoy the uh, week. Enjoy the playoffs. And I'll catch you later. Can't wait. <laughs> you guys. Great send off. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, catch you on the flip side, man. <laughs> <laughs> toodaloo. <laughs> hey, toodaloo, guys.